Disclaimer. This story, as well as all my other stories, is first and foremost for entertainment. After all, this is a fan fiction channel. So you cannot possibly entertain the thought, idea, or notion of a liberalized, westernized Iraq. Then, this video is not for you. Uh, otherwise, don't take this too seriously. It's an alternate history at the end of the day. Now, let's get into it. Saddam Hussein was a cold-blooded, iron-fisted ruler of a Middle Eastern nation, Iraq. After watching HBO's House of Saddam, I was inspired to write a transmigration story where the narrator becomes Saddam. But instead of vain, glorious, and destructive wars and policies, instead of sadistic children, new Saddam tries to build a new Iraq that is liberal and developed. Warnings. Saddam Hussein and his family weren't nice people. This isn't an attempt to rewrite them as sympathetic characters. The narrator references the crap people of that era pulled regularly. The MC is focused on kingdom building, so any good things come out of his intentions, not from Saddam. Treat this story as trashy, no brain fiction, and just enjoy it. There's no intellectual purpose behind it. I won't beat around the bush. I woke up as Saddam Hussein just after he had become president of Iraq and before he launched his disastrous war against Iran. I died and transmigrated. There was no ROB that I could see. One minute I was in my original world, then there was darkness, and I woke up in the body of a sociopathic, middle-aged Arab ruler. I am completely in control of Saddam's conscious mind, but I only share his subconscious or rather the hard-coded data of his subconscious mind still remains. And to be honest, I have no intention of wiping that part out. I only know a little about Saddam's history through an HBO show I watched in my original world, House of Saddam. If you haven't seen it or don't know Saddam's history, then let me just tell you that Saddam is one cold-blooded guy. He was an army officer that took part in the coup against the democratic government of Iraq and became a key member of the ruling Baidh party. In fact, he was vice president of Iraq just before I transmigrated. Saddam is a killer. He's killed dozens of people, both in his capacity as an army man, but also outside it. He shot his best friend in the head after that loyal best friend helped him become president. He falsely accused and tortured fellow Baidh party members and then purged them and their families. There's not much I can do about inhabiting this vile man. There's no way out. I have to make the best of a situation. If you don't already know, Saddam's story ends with being deposed by the Americans and hanged to death. If this is my new host body, my new life, then I have to avoid that death. I want to live. I want to prosper. You might think, well, this is a great situation. I am the absolute ruler of a country. I can just do what I want. No, that's not freaking true. Saddam is a Sunni Muslim ruler of a majority Shia country. The two sects of Islam detest each other. And boy does Saddam's subconscious hate the Shias. But there is also a minority of other sects in the country. The people in the north are a Persian ethnic group called the Kurds. Yup, the same guys who fought bravely against ISIS and then were messed over by the West. Personally, I had a great deal of respect for the Kurds. I mean, they had women fighting on the front line. Even the West doesn't really have that. But as Saddam, they're definitely a problem. They want independence bad. There are also others, like the Yazidis and Christians who are mostly on Saddam's, my side, because I'm the only one able to keep the extremist Sunni elements at bay. But to top it all, Saddam rose to power by killing and intimidation. When you rise to power by fear, you need to keep that fear in place because you've created so many enemies that if they sense even the slightest weakness, they will pounce. Saddam has allies, mostly form his tribe based in the city of Tikrit. These people occupy places of power in Saddam's government. They're extremely corrupt. And that's another issue. I know that their loyalty exists only so long as they fear Saddam and get paid. So my dream of a developed, peaceful non-religious Iraq that is a shining beacon in the troubled Islamic world is just that a dream. 
I do have one additional gift in my arsenal. Whichever being dropped me into this world has given me the skill of a highly sensitive danger sense. I mean really, really sensitive. So sensitive that I am constantly sensing Donger from all around me. I first thought that it was just Saddam's paranoia, but L found out that it was a real power just a week earlier. I was visiting some local dignitaries in eastern Iraq, a Shia stronghold, when my danger sense became overwhelming. It was so acute that I just couldn't get out of bed. I made my assistant attend the meeting in my stead and told him to plead sudden work, for which I had to return to Baghdad. As soon as we left the city, my danger sense started easing. Later that day, I found out that a massive explosion had happened at the hotel where my meeting had been arranged. My assistant perished along with hundreds of others. So there's that. Sometimes it's easier to allow Saddam's lack of empathy take over than allow myself to examine my feelings about my actions and then repercussions. Not everything about my current situation is bad, and not everything is good. I decided to make a list pros and cons of being Saddam. On the pros side, he spent a lot on healthcare and education, so Iraq is fairly advanced as compared to neighboring Arab states. The Sunni minority generally liken me. The Shias are resentful but not outrightly rebellious. The country has a crap ton of oil, and the price of oil has been booming especially since the Ayatollah came to power in neighboring Iran. The secret police the Mukbarat is squarely under Saddam's control and is frighteningly effective. Frighteningly. Saddam has managed not to make an enemy out of either the Soviets or the USA. Both resent him, but neither hate him. For a small nation in the Cold War, that's a damn good achievement. Now the cons. A lot of people hate Saddam me and want to see him dead the families of those he purged. Shia Iran, the Kurds in the North, the Communists, the Islamists, Israel and probably many, many more. While he's held off the Soviets and the US, neither are his friend either, and that's a danger in this era. He's holding on to his power out of fear and terror. A single sign of weakness and the jackals will pounce. His family is vile. Well, mostly his elder son Ude is the real deal. Psychopathic rapist, murder, and sadist. I plan to kill him myself. YOLO. Well, except for me. His wife is a shrewish harpy. She schemes and manipulates and loves the trappings of luxury more than anything. She's put her own family in positions of power. Her brother is my army chief for hell's sake. Pros and cons are fine, but I've decided to take an active role in preserving his and therefore my life, so here are the opportunities that I think are there. And I know the future until 2021. I mean, for example, in less than a decade, the Soviet Union will collapse, so it makes a lot of sense to become America's ally right now. China would have just begun liberalizing its economy under Deng Xiaoping which means I still have time to steal their thunder. Set up special economic zones and outcompete China to become the world's manufacturing hub. Wahhabism is still endemic to Saudi Arabia. I can pull the rug out from under them by setting up some sweet deals and financing a sect of Islam of my choice, a more modern, liberal sect. I know the future of Apple, Samsung, and Microsoft. These companies arrive on the global stage only decades from now leaving me enough time to set up a sovereign wealth fund and fill it up with oil cash. But my immediate problem is my next-door neighbor, Iran. Ever since the Islamic Revolution, the chances of a war with them has increased manifold. Khomeini, I, the leader of Iran, isn't innocent in this feud with Saddam. During his exile in Iraq, Khomeini I tried his best to rile up the Iraqi Shias into overthrowing Saddam. But the truth is that Iraq cannot beat Iran in outright war. They have a population that's almost three times ours. They have armed forces that are fanatical. I mean, historically, Iran pushed back the more advanced Iraqi army by resorting to suicidal bonsai attacks. Waves of them. Even if Saddam hadn't started a war, Khomeini I would have at some point. So what can I do? Well, worry not, reader, for I have a most devious plan to kill two birds with one stone. So my plan failed before takeoff. It failed because my understanding of the Middle Eastern history of this era is poor. My plan was simple. Iraq's oil wealth lies in the north, with the Kurds, and in the south, with the Shias. Iraq's only access to the sea is at its southernmost tip, where it touches the Gulf of Hormuz. So, the majority of oil wealth of Iraq and its trade route by sea are in regions antagonistic to, and not only that, the southern region directly borders belligerent, Shia Iran. 
So my amazing plan was to entice the Americans into a long-term deal for Rocky Oil at a fixed price, with Iraq getting the money up front and the Americans committing a military base near the southern border with Iran to protect the oil and also to get them to upgrade Iraq's main port at Basra slash Umkazar. I was all set to deploy my master plan which would include upfront cash, an American buffer against Iran, and put me in the American sphere of influence ahead of the fall of the Soviet Union. That was until I discovered that Iraq doesn't have official state relations with America. Yup, thumbs out that Iraq, along with other Arab states, attacked Israel in 1967 in the sixth day after which America cut off relations with Iraq. But it was only a hitch in the road. I was completely sold on my master plan. With American troops in the south, I could send my own troops to stabilize the rest of North, the other great source of Iraqi oil. You might wonder why I would want to agree to a fixed price for Iraqi oil when in the late 70s the price of oil was shooting up after the revolution in Iran. Well, it's quite simple really. It's because I already have some idea about the history of oil. In the early 80s the price of oil rose from around $15 a barrel to about $30 a barrel before settling down. But America doesn't know that the price of oil will settle. America has only just begun to recover from the oil shock lead stagflation of the mid-70s. They would bite my hand off to secure a long-term deal. Catching baby. The only downside to the plan is that it's not just Khomeini who thinks of America as the great Satan, but the average Arab as well. And as the Shah of Iran found out, it doesn't pay to be in bed with the West if you're a Middle Eastern ruler. But I have a plan for that as well. Employment. Most youths with jobs would not take up arms in revolution. No matter what your religion might say, all humans like the good life. Anyway, back to my plan to hook America. The closest American embassy is in Kuwait, the small emirate to Iraq's southwest. Yes, it's the very same country that Saddam invaded on flimsy pretexts in 1991. But that's in the alternate future, which will never happen. Through some back channels, globe-trotting businessmen, we were able to arrange a meeting with the brand spanking new American ambassador to Kuwait, Francois Dickman. To my irritation, Dickman refused to travel to Iraq for a meeting, citing America's lack of relations with Iraq. Now OG Saddam would have blown a gasket at this perceived insult, but I've got my eyes on the prize, so I agreed to travel to Kuwait City and be the guest of the Emir, as he wanted to host the meeting between his neighbor and a friendly superpower. I met Francois Dickman in a luxurious hotel, in a suite reserved for the Emir's use. The Emir had put my people and me up in the best rooms of the hotel with extravagant service and security. Saddam's subconscious bristled at the attempt to show us down. I didn't particularly give a crap. It was super comfortable, and I was here on business. Francois Dickman was not a dick by any stretch of the imagination. Ahmed, my main man in the Mukbarat, had arranged for a profile on the ambassador, and it made for interesting reading. Dickman was a World War II vet from small-town America. He had risen to his first ambassadorial role in the U.S. through sheer hard work and a shuck's sincerity. He was a giant of a man, and he dwarfed me as we shook hands and sat facing each other. The Kuwaiti Emir had provided us with translators, but I waved mine off. Iraqi dates, I told Dickman, gesturing to the bowl of reddish-brown treats laid out in front of us. Dickman locked, surprised. Please, I continued, attempting to smile warmly with Saddam's face. Have a few. It is our specialty. I would have presented them as gifts for your family, but I believe your State Department would confiscate. So I thought we can enjoy them together. Dickman thanked me in his gruff voice, and to his credit, took a couple of dates, seeming to enjoy them. Then his hands became sticky, and as he fruitlessly looked around for a napkin, I continued. Thank for you me meeting Ambassador Dickman, and congratulations on your new posting. Dickman flushed and stuttered. You're too kind, Your Excellency. The combination of sticky hands and a warm and polite dictator had him off guard. Perfect. Your Excellency, I must admit I was a bit surprised by your request for a meeting. We were not quite sure to make of it, Dickman said, seemingly resigned to sticky fingers. I laughed in good humor. Do not worry, good ambassador. It is nothing untoward. I am here to propose business between Iraq and America. Now Dickman looked thoroughly confused. Business. Yes, ambassador, I replied nodding. For the other gray Iraqi export besides these delicious dates, Dickman stayed silent. 
I speak of oil, of course. Dickman's eyebrows shot up this man is a gem. It's for too easy to read him. He's gotten used the obsequious emirs of the pipsqueak UN. Saddam is the big boy of the Arab world, and I'm the Nostradamus driving him. Your Excellency, with respect, America has all the oil it needs from its partners in the Middle East, including from Kuwait. I nodded. Yes, but you buy your oil through the aegis of the OPEC. Although you may be a preferred buyer, you pay the OPEC market price. He nodded, almost grudgingly. Do you know how much the price of oil has risen by this year, Ambassador? He thought about it for a few minutes. One couldn't be an ambassador to a Gulf nation without understanding oil. About 30%, he said placidly. 30%. I replied dramatically. In less than half a year, the price is reaching $30. Who knows where it will go from there? Fifty dollars. Surely not, he whispered. Sir, a decade ago, one would not have imagined fifteen dollars a barrel. He nodded. It was true, of course. U.S. adventurism in the Middle East was driven, in a large part, by the shocking realization that energy security was something to be worried about. In the late 90s, the same realization would lead to the development of fracking technology in the U.S. to exploit its shale deposits. Your friends in the Gulf treat you like a preferred customer, but you still pay OPEC prices, do you not? Dickman nodded. I was stating facts after all. The U.S. consumes almost 20 million barrels of oil a day. You are about to come out of a long recession caused, ironically, by oil price shock. What will happen to that recovery if you begin paying $50 a barrel for a decade? Dickman, to his credit, marshaled his features and didn't show an outward reaction to my grim, prognosis. Your Excellency, he began politely, what you have said is absolutely true, but I still don't understand what business you wish to do with America. You are, after all, a founding member of OPEC. I waved off his concerns. OPEC is a cartel. If it were not an interstate effort, it would be illegal for an anti-competitive nature. I could care a fig for OPEC. Dickman seemed surprised by candor. Ambassador, can I speak frank military man to another? Dickman leaned in. I don't like how you say pussyfooting around. I am willing to offer America 4 million barrels a day of oil at $10 a barrel. My pronouncement was met with silence. It was like the room froze in time. You what? spluttered Dickman. What's the catch? I smiled. Well, I will have some non-monetary conditions as well. All logical, mind you. But from the money side, I want the full amount of the deal up front. Dickman sat back in his sofa with a thump, staring at me. I leaned back more leisurely and smiled at him. Why? he asked finally. Why what ambassador? Why are you looking to make this deal? What is the benefit to you? I smiled more widely. Firstly, ambassador, I am glad that you have not attempted to hem and haw about whether this deal suits America or not. We both know that this is an extremely favorable deal for your country. Well... Dickman began, but I put a hand up to shush him. I don't care about his nationality. There's only one ruler in the room, and it's not him. It's really simple. I have plans to develop my country, for which I need money. I don't like loans, and the World Bank is hardly likely to give me the loan I require, so money up front is the only viable option. And lastly, as the saying goes, a bird in hand is worth two in the bush. There was silence again for some time. Your Excellency, said Dickman, I will need some time to discuss this deal with Washington before any formal negotiations can begin. Of course, I said magnanimously. If it's a no, a phone call will suffice. If it's a yes, then the American delegation will my guests in Baghdad. We got up and shook hands. Dickman seemed excited and overwhelmed. Being a Gulf ambassador is a relatively backwater posting. Now, all of a sudden, he was potentially in charge of America's economic growth for the 1980s. As we were about to part, one mentioned to him, Ambassador, enjoy the dates, but remember time is of the essence. Nobody laughed at my wordplay. Ever had that feeling after taking an exam when you're waiting for the results? You're confident that you've nailed the exam, but during the waiting period, your confidence starts to erode a little bit every day. Well, that was what happened to me after I returned to Baghdad from meeting with Ambassador Dickman. I'm sure they'll call. It's a great for deal. They'll call. What if someone else offered them a better deal? Damn. Kuwait could love offered a better deal. 
or the Saudis. Damn, they love those barbaric bastards anyway. Crap, what do I do if they don't call? I don't have a plan B. Call the Soviets? Do they even have money? The Americans called on day three and informed my people that a three-member delegation would be headed over to Baghdad to meet me. Phew. I met the delegation in my office in the presidential palace. The three were arrayed in front of me in increasing order of deviousness. Firstly, Dickman who loomed over me, but shook my hand firmly and gave me a bright smile. I must have left an impression. Your Excellency, may I introduce Deputy Secretary Hayes and Mr. Shaw both from the State Department. Dickman said indicating the woman next to him and the man next to her. The lady, Hayes, was a short auburn, haired woman with a pinched face displaying a thin, curt smile. Ms. Hayes. I greeted her, shaking her cold bony hand. I then shook hands with Shaw, who was giving me a toothy grin. His whole demeanor screamed Mookbret to the Saddam inside me. He tried to end our handshake, but I pulled him closer much to everyone's shock. Mr. Hayes or Bond or whatever your real name is, please don't take this deal as an invitation for the CIA to meddle in the internal affairs of Iraq. You would be putting America's energy security for the next decade in jeopardy. There was shock silence following my statement, except for Dickman spluttering nonsensically. Shaw continued to look shocked, but gave me a discreet nod. Nailed it. We sat down, and I waited for America's opening salvo. It was Hayes who began, as I had expected. When you need real work done, send in a woman. They don't bullcrap. Your Excellency, the offer you tabled to Ambassador Dickman was very interesting to us. I think with a bit of work on the price, we could have a very favorable deal for both parties. I didn't say a word. I just stared coldly at her. The minutes ticked by, and the American delegation began looking at each other in consternation. Air. You. Dickman began, but I interrupted him. You know what they call a person who rejects a fabulous gift and asks for a bigger gift in Iraq? I ask Hayes. It was clearly a rhetorical question, so no one moved or spoke. The village idiot. I finished viciously. I got up from my seat, and the Americans also rose in confusion. The purpose of this meeting is not to annoy me into retracting this incredible deal for America. It is for me to tell you my other demands, and for us to work out the practicalities of the deal. The Americans looked downcast. Well, at least Dickman did, so I softened my tone. My agenda is not for you to lose your careers over this. So how about this? You spend the rest of the day reframing your approach to this meeting. My suggestion would be to imagine you are dealing with a well-informed white, western ruler. And then we can try again tomorrow. I grinned inwardly as the shocked Americans left my office. The next day, the Americans were again sat in front of me. Hayes had undergone a sea change in her attitude. Gone was the prim, uptight middle manager, and in her place was a smiling, informal charmer. Your Excellency, I want to start by apologizing for yesterday. My intention was not to insult you or jeopardize this deal. We are most grateful for the opportunity. I smiled magnanimously and waved off her apology. No apologies needed, ma'am. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, and all that. I had hoped that this new understanding between the Americans and myself would make the whole process much smoother, but we hid an obstacle almost immediately in the day's discussions. It was over the issue of my demand for an upfront payment. Your Excellency, on the issue of the upfront payment, I want you to understand that we wish to work with you on this, but as you no doubt know, we simply do not have a way to pay this Iraq upfront. The rough estimate for this deal is $140 billion. That cash just isn't available to us, said Hayes, taking care to sound as polite and equanimous as possible. $146 billion, I replied to her. She cocked an eyebrow but accepted my correction. I wasn't going to let them jip me out of $6 billion. Ms. Hayes, I of course am aware that transactions of this nature are not done by simply wiring money into a bank account. I will need a small fraction of that amount to sit in various Iraqi bank accounts across the world so that I had ready funds to invest in my plans. I will need an even smaller amount in paper currency. But for the vast majority of it, I am willing to accept U.S. Treasury bonds of equivalent nominal value. Except for Shaw, who remained placid, the Americans looked even more troubled. Your Excellency, I don't follow, began Hayes. 
Don't think there are enough T-bonds floating around the secondary market for us to sweep them into your account. I smiled at Hayes. Of course not, madam. The U.S. government will issue fresh 10-year T-bonds to Iraq. Hayes looked rebellious, and her face morphed into the angry one of the previous day. I could see her visibly controlling her outrage. Your Excellency, the gross national debt of America is around $900 billion. Fresh issuance of $140 billion of debt would be a sudden increase of over 10% of our national debt. The impact on inflation and the financial markets would be tremendous. I wagged a finger at her. Madam, please don't forget that is over $146 billion that will be owed to Iraq. You keep forgetting the $6 billion and it makes me very jittery. I waited for her to grudgingly concede the point with a nod. I was being petty on purpose. I didn't want her to forget that I was doing America a favor. And I believe you are mistaken about the market volatility and inflation. At $10 a barrel of oil, which is $5 less than the prevailing market price, and taking into account the 4 million barrels per day that Iraq will supply, America will immediately reduce its annual expenditure by over $7 billion. The additional interest you will pay on the new bonds will be $13 billion. Hayes nodded at my calculations and splayed her hands and widened her eyes as if to indicate that I had proved her point. Dixon looked lost. Shaw looked unmoved. Allow me to finish. This calculation is based on current oil prices. As you know, the price of oil has already risen 30% this year, and from your own analysts' expectations, the price could go anywhere from $30 to $50 a barrel. And there's no telling how long the elevated prices would last. So you could potentially end up saving significantly. I paused for effect. This is also not to mention the intangible benefits. By having almost a fifth of your oil supplied at a stable, low price, you would be in a much better position to stand your ground against OPEC. In fact, you might even see a bidding war between OPEC countries to not lose your business. Hayes looked thoughtful now. And lastly, as you well know, I continued using her phrasing. It's much easier to control inflation caused by your domestic money supply than it is to control imported inflation. The American delegation processed my words as I watched them like a hawk. Surprisingly, it was Dickman who spoke next. Your Excellency, you mentioned that you will need some of the amount in paper currency. I wonder why that would be the case. I smiled pedantically at him. Ambassador, let's just say that I want the rocky engine of commerce to start moving at a faster pace than before. To make that happen, I'll have to grease certain cogs in the engine lest they overheat and create problems for me in the future. Dickman looked perplexed and looked from me to his comrades. Bless this sincere, honest man's heart. Mr. Shaw, might I prevail on you to explain what I mean to the ambassador at a later time? It would be vulgar of me to lay out during this meeting. I smiled and said to the CIA man. He grinned at me and nodded mouthing sure. Your Excellency, I take your point on the benefits of the deal with regard to T-bond issuances said Hayes, coming out of her reverie. But may I suggest that we reimburse you also partially in the form of perhaps goods or services? Such as what, madam? I was honestly curious. She shrugged. Well, I'm not privy to your long-term plans, but for example, we can provide construction and infrastructure aid, or perhaps meet some requirements for Iraq's security needs. Ah, uh, the Americans were offering me the goodies from a military-industrial complex. I shook my head. Madam... I have no need of military hardware, as we'll soon discuss. War is a fool's errand. It's bad for business and bad for development. As for construction services, I am a big believer in the free market as America itself has promoted. I would rather hire the best firm in the market than avail of a prepaid service, which will undoubtedly be of worse quality since the money has already been paid. She looked affronted. I assure you that American services are top-notch and world-beating. I did not mean to insult madam, and I agree that America is great. But it is human nature not to put in as much effort when the money has already been received. It is much better to dangle the carrot, as you might say. There was a lull in conversation again, and I went in for the kill. I am afraid I will have to put my foot down on this matter. I believe I have explained all sides rationally, and upfront money is the biggest benefit for Iraq from this deal. What else could they do but agree? We moved on, and I felt relieved. There was only one big obstacle remaining. 
it was truly the big one, and I would have to approach it tactfully. We sorted out the small details and niggles. In the middle I indulged them with dates and luxurious food and coffee. It was night time, when the Americans sat back in their chairs looking exhausted, but triumphant. They thought they'd achieved a groundbreaking deal, and the whole work was done. I am very pleased with the way these negotiations have proceeded. Kudos to you, I said with fake warmth. They offered me one, but please smiles in return. By the way, a small curiosity if you'll indulge me. How do you plan to secure and transport the oil that we will pump for you? Hayes and Dickman looked at each other in confusion. Well, I assumed that you would be arranging transport by sea, of course, said Hayes carefully. Her brain was waking back up as she recognized that we were not yet done. I scoffed. Madam, at the price I'm selling you oil, I am not also going to take the headache of transporting the oil. The price I'm selling my oil to you is X-Works, only the price for the extraction and product. Nothing else. Dickman looked mystified, and surprisingly Shaw did as well. I like to think that at this point Shaw sensed that his role in the negotiations was coming into play. Hayes looked disgruntled but nodded. We can work with that. Excellent. I said jovially. But my question still stands. How do you plan to secure and transport the oil? Well, we'll contract some shipping company to transport the oil, I suppose, said Hayes carefully. I scoffed again. Madam, as you are all aware, I'm sure. There has been a change in the regime of my neighbors to the east. They looked alert now, especially Shaw. Most of the oil I will be supplying you is from the Ramela oil field near the Kuwaiti border and near Basra in the south. As Mr. Shaw would certainly know, that is not only close to Iran, but also a Shia majority area. I had their undivided attention. Moreover, the Islamic Republic of Iran, whose supreme leader has termed your country, the Great Satan, control entirely one side of the Gulf of Hormuz, the only sea route available from Iraq. So, again, how do you plan to secure the oil? They were silent, just watching me dumbfounded. Am I a good order? I don't know. I waited patiently for them to speak. Minutes ticked by. I, of course, shouldn't care beyond pumping the oil. But I want good business ties with America, so I think it's important we eat up the eyes as you say. Do you have any recommendations on this issue, Your Excellency? Dickman said carefully. Yay. The war vet was finally standing up. A few. I said humbly nodding. The Gulf of Hormuz will be easy to control. America already has aircraft carrier groups in the Indian Ocean. You simply move that group to the opening of the Gulf. Your allies amongst the Gulf nations would thank you, and Iran will curse you, but they're already doing that so it doesn't matter. They all nodded at that. Now the hard part. The problem is securing the oil on the ground. Hayes laughed incredulously. Surely that is your job, Your Excellency. How do you expect America to secure Iraqi oil in Iraqi territory? I gave her a cold, hard stare. Madam, as Mr. Shaw will be able to educate you, the Iraqi army is a small one, comprised mainly of my own community, the Sunni Arabs. We are a minority in this country. I also cannot have Kurds and Shias in my army, lest they turn on us during a critical operation. They looked cowed. So, I am stuck between two hard choices. I either send this small army of mine north to secure the oil fields in the Kurdish area or the south in the Shia area. Both of those communities, by the way, have been given subtle support by the CIA in the hopes that they will overthrow me. I said the last bit while giving Shaw an angry glare. He had the decency to look ashamed, slightly. I don't need to tell you that should any other party come to power in Iraq, your incredible oil deal will be immediately cancelled as the benefit for Iraq is only evident to me. I paused for them to process my words. But sir, what is the solution then? asked Dickman. There are no good solutions, Ambassador, I said as kindly as I could. But I have what I believe is the best of many bad options. Please go on, he replied politely. I am willing to take the risk of having a small American military base in southern Iraq for the duration of this deal and any subsequent deals we may enact. This was it. The big one. My heart was thudding as I watched my announcement sink into their minds. Shaw looked thoughtful, Hayes incredulous, and Dickman confused. You realize what that would mean? Asked Shaw. He had a surprisingly deep voice for someone who looked like an overgrown child. I nodded. The risk to me personally would be great, 
but I believe if we proceed according to my plans then we will emerge safely. I don't follow, said Dickman. What risks? American troops on the ground in the Middle East, said Shaw. His Excellency will be resented by everyone, even the Sunni Arabs. Nobody wants us here. How you plan to alleviate the risk, asked Hayes. The base will be a small one in southern Iraq, I began to explain. It needs to be on the Iraqi side, not the Kuwaiti side, so it's evident that America is there to secure its oil. The base will be small, but can be restocked and supplied from the nearby aircraft carrier group. The base can't be anywhere near an existing settlement or will arouse the ire of the locals. American troops will not be allowed jaunts into Iraqi cities as they are in Korea or Japan. A drunk American soldier would inflame tensions like nothing else. Shaw and Hayes nodded. I will hopefully be able to provide financial support and employment countrywide quickly to forestall large protests. American presence in sea and on land will also quell any troublemaking that the Ayatollah is planning. I can then send Iraqi army north to secure the Kurdish area and especially the Kirkuk oil fields. And there it was. My plan laid out for them as tactfully as possible. We'll need to run this by Washington, said Shaw seriously. This was his baby now. Hayes and Dickman were out of their depths. I gave my assent and reclined on my chair. I was exhausted. It was out of my hands now. After the American delegation returned to their respective home locations, I finally began to have decent nights of sleep. The tension and stress of the past weeks had given way to excitement. In my past life, my plans rarely worked out the way I hoped. But this plan could turn out to be a masterstroke. My days were filled with dreams about a citadel of progress in the ancient land of Mesopotamia. I haven't talked much about my new family yet. Saddam's wife, or well his first wife Sajda, was actually his cousin. Her father was Saddam's mother's brother. I'll refrain from commenting as marriage between cousins was a fairly common occurrence in that part of the world, but I admit that in my prejudiced eyes it was off-putting. I may have been a bit harsh towards her in the beginning of this story. She came from a poor background just like Saddam, and I suppose coming from nothing and believing that the world is a harsh place where only the powerful prosper inform her life view. Having given her that benefit, however, I admit that my interactions with her left a bad taste in my mouth, and I don't mean literally. She was openly power and wealth hungry. She was also uncaring of anyone who is not a part of her family, an Iraqi Mary Antoinette, if you will. I also came to believe that she didn't really love Saddam at all but saw him as a means to get what she wanted and I suppose was also a bit scared of him. I tried to key my interactions with her to a minimum. She was barely educated and rambled on about inconsequential things while my head was filled with thoughts about judicial and police reforms. Luckily, Sajda and Saddam had a strange conjugal arrangement in that they stayed in separate wings of the presidential palace since before my transmigration. It would be vulgar to talk too much about my physical needs, but I'll just say that it's better to be lonely than share a bed with someone you actively can't tolerate. Saddam's three daughters were all right. They were kind of sweet and obedient. They had been trained since birth to become good wives to their husbands, and by the time I transmigrated, that's exactly what they were. They were definitely not underfoot all the time like their mother, and I appreciated that immensely. Their husbands were a bit idiotic, especially Saddam Kamel, Rana's husband. SK would roll his tongue, out ready to slather my feet every time he saw me. In the original Saddam timeline, SK was made the head of the Republic Guard, but then he cocked up during the first Gulf War, and then fled to Jordan where he tried to stage a coup which failed, and then for some bizarre reason decided to return to Iraq where he was promptly murdered by Saddam son Uday. Of course. In my timeline, I want the moron out of Iraq in a way, so that at least Saddam's daughters can have a normal life and the fool doesn't get himself killed or mess around with my plans. My younger son Kusai was the reserved one. Saddam did not have many interactions with Kusai and the boy was too scared of his father to demand his time. Kusai spent a lot of his time with Uday and his mother, which made me quite suspicious of his intentions and character. Although after I transmigrated, he hadn't done anything untoward apart from showing eagerness for self-elevation. I had plans for him as well, but they weren't a priority right now. And now to Uday Freakin, Hussein. A few days after the American delegation had left, my special man in the Mukbarat and personal bodyguard Ahmed woke me up gingerly in the mid-day of the night. 
What is it? I asked a little harshly, because of my grogginess. I apologize, Your Excellency. But there has been an incident which requires your attention, he replied softly and politely. I shot up in bed. The Americans? No, Your Excellency. It's Uday. Hearing those words, I felt like a bucket of cold water had been poured over my head. What has that squid done? I asked through gritted teeth. Uh, sir, it's er, difficult to explain. Forgive me, Your Excellency, but I think it would be best for you to see it and decide for yourself. I grumbled only a little bit at Saddam's psychotic crapbag of a son making me get up from my beauty sleep, but I dressed quickly. If Ahmed was waking me up and refusing to elaborate, that means the crap has not just hit the fan, but exploded like a fecal nuclear bomb. We made our way through the corridors of the presidential palace towards the wing, which Uday had made his own. It was all quiet except for our hurried footsteps. As we approached his bedroom suite, I could sense that something was terribly wrong. The maids were gathered outside the door whispering to each other and trying to peek inside the barely open suite door. Two household guards who were stationed by the door saw me approaching and started shouting at the gathered maids to move aside. The frightened women parted like the Red Sea as I strode forwards without pausing. The guards remembered to salute me and stand to attention. Inside the suite, there were a few people I recognized who were all standing facing the bedroom and looking horrified to various degrees. These were more men of my household guard, and while they weren't special forces, they were army trained. Yet, they looked shaken and pale. Some of them forgot to salute as I walked by them. As I neared Uday's bedroom, I could hear panting and giggling. It sounded like a hyena or a rabid dog. When I crossed the threshold into his bedroom, I first noticed my valet camel Hannah and the head of my household guard, for he's standing a few feet away from Uday staring at him. Uday had no clothes on and bloody. His bald, ugly face was bloated with alcohol and probably drugs. His eyes were wide and red and couldn't seem to focus on anything. His mouth was wide open and I realized that he had been the one giggling and panting. His relatively small meat was standing to attention, and he made no attempts to cover it up. In his right hand was a long, cruel knife, lathered in blood. Blood which was sprayed over his body and across the room, but mostly on the bed. On the bed lay a human figure, a woman. She had no clothes as well, but curled up into a ball. Her erstwhile clothes lay near the bed, clearly ripped apart. The woman was static and not making a sound, but I could see the shallow rise and fall of her back, indicating that she was breathing. She was covered in cuts, on her back and sides, on her neck, legs and her private orifices were bleeding as well. The white sheets of the bed she lay on were now a deep red. Baba, said Uday, noticing me. He giggled at me, but then looked terrified as I turned to gaze on his face. To say I was angry, enraged, apoplectic, would be an understatement. The harsh fire of rage had evolved into something cold and ruthless. In my mind and heart, I knew that Uday would regret having been born today. Baba, he said again, I'm sorry. I didn't reply to him. Instead, I gathered a clean bed cover from a cupboard and covered the nude girl. She didn't react when the cloth touched her. Get a few of the maids from outside to assist her. They will take her to the hospital and stay with her until she is allowed to be taken home. I instructed Kamal softly. He nodded, and with one last look at Uday, he went to bring a few maids. To their credit, the maids who entered were workmanlike in avoiding the rabid animal and softly but firmly gathering up the victim and leading her out. Baba, the beast said again, I'm sorry. My son, I said softly to him, and hearing those words, he relaxed a bit thinking that he was out of the woods. I came closer to him, and held out my hand, demanding the knife from him. I gave him a small fake smile to encourage him. He smiled back, an innocent, mad, cruel smile, and handed me the bloody knife. His meat was still at attention. I kept looking at him but spoke to Ahmed. Ahmed, get your men in here. He didn't need to reply. I heard him instantly turn around and shout at his men to come inside. Six burly men waiting for my command were behind me, and a demon, curiously observing me, was in front of me. Hold down his arms and legs. I ordered the men. They hesitated only for a second before complying. 
Baba? asked Ude with a hint of panic as the men took hold of his extremities with force. Lay him on the ground. Meet up. Baba, Baba, wailed Ude, finally realizing that something was wrong. He squirmed ineffectually. He was a lazy, spoiled brat while my men were hard. Army trained men. He was also massively drugged out. He had no chance. All he could do was scream. Baba, Baba. I'm not your Baba, I said, grabbing a hold of his meat. And the shaitan doesn't get to have his meat. In a court of law, I'll always say that I tried to cut off the offending member in one slash, but I don't actually know if it was true, nor it was even possible. What happened next was a grisly dismemberment of the brat's loins. One of the household guards puked violently to the side. The rest looked sick. Even Ahmed looked terrified. A part of me was pleased. The legend of brutal and ruthless Saddam would live on. A man capable of eradicating his own eldest son in most bloody of ways. Once my grisly task was complete, I threw the offending body parts on the floor and began to wipe my hands on a towel, take him to a surgeon, and sew him up. If he lives, then he'll go on trial and hang. If he dies, then feed his body to the pigs. I ordered Ahmed before walking out and not looking back. The bastard survived bobadization and castration. Sometimes people just don't know when to quit, but he wasn't going to get a reward for living. The next day Kamal and Ahmed came to me bearing news of Uday's survival. Okay, he's under arrest I hope. I asked them matter of factly. They looked at each other, which instantly irritated me. What is it? I spat out venomously. Sir, he hasn't been arrested yet. Kamal replied in a diplomatic tone of voice. Why the hell not? The police chief wasn't sure what to do as Uday is your excellency's son, replied Ahmed. I hissed. Don't you dare call that beast my son again. Ahmed bowed his head. Forgive me, your excellency. Bring that bastard police chief to meet me. Ahmed nodded and made to get to work. Wait, I said, raising my hand to halt him. While you're at it, bring the chief prosecutor as well. I want to meet them together. Yes, your excellency, said Ahmed nodding and departed with Kamal just behind him. The police chief of Baghdad was a portly, short man, while the chief prosecutor was a tall, gaunt man. They both sat in front of me sweating bullets, and it wasn't because of the Iraqi summer. Why haven't you arrested the beast? I asked perfunctorily. Why, your excellency, stuttered the police chief. Uday, man Uday. Why has he not been arrested? He graped and brutalized a woman. There were a dozen witnesses, including myself. The police chief looked helplessly at the prosecutor and then back at me. Your Excellency, but he is your son. I hissed in anger. Say that again, and I'll cut your tongue out. He's no son of mine. He's a demon made flesh. Both the men looked petrified at my sudden anger and threat. Sometimes it feels good to see the fear that people have for my bodysuit. Sick, I know. Why, Your Excellency, I... I held up a hand to silence the gormless policeman. If he was heading the police for my capital city, then I was in deeper crap than I realized. I would have to shake up the police force throughout the country. I mentally sighed. So many things to do, so little time. And what little time I had was being taken up by rapist sadists. You will arrest the demon, charge him for his crimes. You will conduct the investigation thoroughly and professionally. The police chief nodded hurriedly, eyed him evilly. I hope you are up to the task, because I won't be pleased by apathy or incompetence. I could have sworn the man gulped visibly. He kept nodding, and I thought maybe his head would fall off. I moved my attention to the prosecutor who shifted uncomfortably under my gaze. Mr. Prosecutor, once your comrade here has leveled the charges, I expect you and your subordinates to assist the police in making the case watertight. He nodded in a more measured manner. Of course, Your Excellency. I continued to stare him down. You will press for capital punishment. Now they both looked shocked all over again. Why, Your Excellency? Asked the stunned prosecutor. The Iraqi people need to know that the state will not tolerate violence and sadism, no matter the origins of the perpetrator. I replied firmly. To his credit, the prosecutor overcame his shock quite rapidly and showed his assent to my demand. I now considered both of them, and wagging my finger I said, This case will attract a lot of media attention, 
especially from abroad. There can be no mess-ups. You understand me. They both looked terrified. Sir, said the prosecutor hesitatingly, we will of course strive to fulfill your excellency's expectations of us. But for the sake of my family, I would be brave enough to ask that there will be no blowback from your excellency's family over our actions. He looked petrified as he waited for the expected backlash. I sighed mentally. This was of course the downside of being Saddam. People would doubt my intentions for the rest of my life. It was something that bothered me in the quiet of the night. Even I achieved my dream of a wealthy, welfare state. Would I be welcome in such a nation? But for now it was time to act the part. So I quirked my eyebrows dangerously and asked the prosecutor in a low voice. I cut off the demon's balls myself. Do you really think I would let any other family member stop this from happening? He shook his head in a manner that suggested that his bowels were about to be vacated. I mentally sighed again. I'd have to reform the judiciary as well. Imagine a police chief and prosecutor who were so terrified of the head of state that they just went along with whatever he wanted. I shooed them away to go do their job and settled into the mounds of paperwork that had piled up. Sajda Talfa, wife of Saddam, still black-haired and caked in makeup. I could hear the harpy screeching outside my office, demanding to be let in. A massive headache, but one that I should have expected. Interestingly, my danger sense had increased marginally. She must have been livid and I could guess about what. The grapist brat, her son, Uday. Ahmed opened my office door a crack and slipped in. He looked flustered, something I had never thought I would see in my usually unflappable head of secret police. I quirked an eyebrow, inviting him to speak. Excuse me, sir. It's your wife. Madam Talfa is demanding to see you. Yes, I can hear that, I replied drearily. He waited for my response, probably on Tenterox. I sighed and sat back in my chair. Okay, send her an Ahmed, but stay right outside the door. I might need you to help restrain the lady. She's clearly overwrought. Of course, sir, Ahmed said, sounding inordinately relieved, and then opened the door and invited the harpy in. She didn't spare him a second glance as she rushed past him. Her usually coiffed hair was askew, and the makeup was runny. I've never liked makeup. There's something off-putting about the smell. How could you? To our own son. You monster, she screamed when she had finished storming up to my large desk. I stayed silent and kept my face calm, staring her down. She continued to rant. You've unmanned him. He's your son. Just a child. Over what? Some spoiled Baghdad hussy. Our son, she continued, half screaming, half sobbing. I have only one son. His name is Kusai, and as far as I know he's all right. I replied in as infuriating a tone as I could muster. That damn shrew. Birthed a freaking monster, skimmed past his atrocities, babied and coddled him, and she had the temerity to yell at me. She screamed something inarticulate. I heard snatches of words, son. Brutalized. Devil. I can't wait to see him hang after his trial is done. I want to hear that demon's next snap, I said viciously, cutting her off mid-rant. And then all of a sudden, she went deathly quiet and still. My danger sense spiked, and I watched in slow motion as she reached inside her bizarre business coat and withdrew a tiny pistol. My eyes must have been in the process of widening when the little gun went off with a loud pop and I fell off my chair. Being shot absolutely sucks. My left shoulder felt like it was being gouged out with a red-hot iron. It was the worst pain I had felt in either life. There was no retreat offered by Saddam's subconscious as I still owned the body's pain receptors. I writhed and groaned. I could vaguely hear a commotion in the background, but my ears were buzzing with a tinny noise and I could hear my pain. I was aware of being lifted bodily by several arms and carried through the presidential palace before being deposited into a van. People milled around in the van, hovering in and out of my line of sight, while my entire focus was on the pain in the shoulder. The van bounced now and again, and the pain lanced through my body afresh. I vaguely made a note to fix the damn roads of Baghdad. Then we were entering a solid-looking building. There was a lot of yelling as people were cleared out of the way. 
I was taken to what I assumed was the emergency surgery room and plied with a gas mask through which I felt my breathing ease. Needles were stuck into my arm, and before I knew it, there was blackness. I woke up groggy, and in an unfamiliar room. It was vaguely white, though the walls were shabby. There was also green paint in places. I was lying on a hard bed, although everything smelled clean, and there was fading sunlight entering through a large window, out of which I could see downtown Baghdad and the Tigris. As I got my bearings and realized that I was in the hospital, I looked down at my left shoulder and saw that it was heavily bandaged. My chest was bare, and I was wearing just my boxers underneath the sheets covering me. There were two people by my bedside, Ahmed and Kamal. Kamal was looking at me with concern while Ahmed was standing near the window, his eyes flicking between me and the room's door. His right hand was on the grip of his pistol. Your Excellency, thank God, said Kamal with visible relief as I came around. I was touched that both of them were there to guard over me. I didn't have any attachment to Saddam's family, but I spent most of my waking moments with these two, and it was heartening that even when I was incapacitated I was covered. It was something that had always bothered me. If I ever found myself in a weak position, would someone see the opportunity to wipe me out? Clearly at least two people would make some effort to prevent that. My wife. I asked in a raspy voice. Kamal immediately poured me a glass of water and helped me sip it gingerly. In the palace's dungeon, replied Ahmed. I nodded. Was the operation a success? I asked Kamal. He nodded. Yes, Your Excellency. The doctor is actually a distant cousin of mine. He says it was a flesh wound. The bullet did not disintegrate, and he was able to extract it with minimum damage to the muscles or flesh. I lay back, trying to reboot my mind. This was me at my weakest and most vulnerable. If anything was going to happen, now is when my enemies would seize the chance. Ahmed, I said softly. Yes, Your Excellency, came his pat reply as he stepped closer. All the Taufas in the armed forces and police. I want them and their families rounded up and held. Only take your trusted team. Yes, Your Excellency. What about the other Talfas? No, leave the civilian Talfas be. Focus on the ones who have access to weapons and their families. What about Adnan Kerala? Ahmed asked, referring to Saj's brother, who was my defense minister. Yes, I replied. He's the most important target, but hold him in an isolated cell. Yes, Your Excellency. He made to move, but I grabbed his hand. Ahmed, this must be done rapidly and with force if needed. Don't dally at all. Curfew is imposed throughout Iraq. Make sure the army takes control of our streets. Your Excellency, you have my word, said my head of secret police, and then he departed. I know I messed up quite badly. There were a lot of lessons learned from being shot by my wife. First and foremost, Danger sense isn't a superpower. It's just an early warning system. If you live in Tornado Alley and the weather forecast warns of tornadoes in your area, it doesn't mean that a funnel won't suddenly form around you. It just means that you'd be a fool to be surprised when it does. And that's what I was, a fool. Saj just shot me when I provoked her. I could have just been diplomatic at the moment and kept away from her as I usually did. I guess I also didn't need to mutilate Uday. I could have just had him disappeared. It was the mutilation that drove the mother off the edge. And now I'm in a quandary. The Saddam part of me feels that I would need to off my wife to show the world that you don't shoot Saddam and live. But on the other hand, wife killing after son mutilation would make me seem more like a tyrant to the ordinary man than economic mismanagement. Bizarre as that is. Moreover, Saj's family are embedded into important roles in the Iraqi state. I would need to uproot and perhaps disappear them as well to avoid a coup. I returned to the presidential palace post-haste. My shoulder ached like a mother schmucker, and all I wanted was to load up on opiates and lie in bed all day crying for mummy. But as Saddam, ostensibly a military man, that wouldn't look good. So I manned up and made my way through Baghdad in an open-top jeep waving at confused crowds with my good arm. I wanted the news to spread around that Saddam was all good, not that the public knew yet that my wife had shot me. The curfew that I had asked Ahmed to impose was well-timed. The army made a show of controlling the streets of the major urban centers and the Mukbarat Gareoed, the houses of the biggest troublemakers in the country, to let them know 
that Saddam was watching their every move. It meant that for the 1.5 days that I was out of action, there was no uprising in Iraq. Ahmed and Kamal were hovering around me once I returned to the presidential palace. I knew they wanted my attention on something, but a petty part of me didn't want to work until I was feeling better. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore and asked Kamal what was urgent. Your Excellency, the erstwhile defense minister has sought to speak with you at your convenience. Kamal was much more diplomatic about things than Ahmed was. I looked at my man in the Mukbarat. I think he should stew in the cells for a bit more, don't you? Ahmed nodded in assent. Let him know that his sister shot me, and I survived. Let him sit in jail for a week. Rough him up and interrogate him whether it was a Kerala coup conspiracy. Ahmed was surprised. Do you think that's what was your excellency? I shook my head. No, it was an enraged mother acting without thought. But let him dread what Saddam Hussein might be thinking about his kith and kin. Break. Not one, but two weeks later, I had a shackled odd non Kerala seated before me. He was in formless prisoner clothes which were bloody. He had a black eye and cuts on his face. His hair was straggly, and he looked ten years older than his actual age. And exhausted. So exhausted. I kept quiet, just observing him. He couldn't meet my eyes. Ahmed and another Mukbarat officer were standing on hand, but I had taken to keeping a pistol in my desk drawer remembering the sudden danger spike before my wife had shot me. I had gotten into the habit of having my right hand wrapped around the weapon during any meeting with anyone. Never again would I go down without a fight. Gods! Saddam's paranoia was getting to me. Finally, Adnan spoke in a raspy voice. My wife, children. Shouldn't your first thoughts be for your injured president? I asked sharply. He bowed his head. Your family's safe, for now. I replied ominously. Until I figure out how deep this Talfa Kerala treachery runs. He looked up sharply. My president, there was no conspiracy. I hissed in response, as if insulted by his words. All play acting. Please, brother, believe me. You lost the right to call me brother when your schmuck of a sister shot me. I roared, rising from my seat. He whimpered and subsided. I sat down after glaring at him for a minute. Adnan tell me why I shouldn't wipe out the Talfas and Kerala's? I asked calmly after a while. He looked at me horrified and then suddenly spilled out of his chair and prostrated himself, face down. My guards had reacted and were almost done drawing their weapons before I halted them. My danger sense had spiked. Mercy, Excellency, mercy, said Adnan, although his voice was muffled by the carpet. I sent him away. The stew was close, but not completely ready yet. I graciously called Adnan back to my office a few days later. I had arranged for him to see his family briefly and for all of them to be cleaned up and dressed properly. Adnan looked better this time around, but still subdued and refusing to meet my eyes. I've thought a lot about this treachery over the last few days. I began. His breath hitched as if he wanted to protest but held back. You all have hurt my heart but I realized that I couldn't bring myself to wipe out my family no matter how unfaithful they have been. This was ironic given how badly I had mutilated Uday. But hey, who's going to gainsay me? Adnan looked up, hope shining in his eyes. Your sister is no longer my wife, I said in a businesslike tone. I have arranged the divorce papers. I hope for all of your sakes that you can convince her to sign. One way or the other, I'll be free of that treacherous bitch. It's up to you to decide how. He nodded. Either his sister signed the papers of died, your sister, you and your family, and some of the other Kerala's and their families will be exiled abroad. His breath hitched again. My eyes narrowed dangerously. I hope that isn't an issue. If it is, do let me know, and we can arrange a resting place domestically. He shook his head violently. Most gracious, Your Excellency. Your sister and you will go to London along with your immediate family. The rest will be spread over the world. Your sister is your responsibility. What she says, what she does I hold you responsible. He nodded. Be very diligent in this task lest you get a nighttime visitor. He nodded with a fearful look on his face. He was well aware that I had had political exiles murdered in London before. There was no escaping the Mukbarat. 
your sister and you will present yourself in person at the London Embassy every two weeks without fail. Should you not turn up even once, I will assume the worst. Some of the Keralas and Taufas, who were not involved in this conspiracy, will be moved to Baghdad near the palace. I will take care of them as long as the exiled Keralas follow my dicta. He looked terrified now. He knew what I was saying. Any rebellious activity abroad would mean death for his family that remained behind in Iraq. Plata o plomo. He got up suddenly, and my guards reacted, but again, I held them off. He bent over my desk, softly grabbed my left hand, and placed obsequious kisses on it. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your mercy. Pacifying Saddam's children was easier and harder than expected. The girls were dismayed and angry that I had divorced their mother and exiled her. But upon realizing that she had shot me, they looked thankful that I hadn't simply had her killed. This is the 70s in Iraq after all. No matter how liberal Saddam was, women were still consigned to a lower stratum in society. It wasn't uncommon for wives to be killed by their husbands over forgetting salt in the food, let alone shooting them in the shoulder. Kusai didn't display any emotions towards his mother's fate and was at pains to express his agreement with my actions. I have to say I am incredibly wary of Kusai. He isn't a psychopath like Uday and my danger sense doesn't rise around him, but he's too eager and too quiet. It was easier to know what to expect with Uday. I'll have to send him out of Iraq at some point anyway. There's no way to create a meritocratic society when your own son expects to succeed you as absolute ruler. When it dawned on him that his father intended to leave a democratic society as his legacy, would he not attempt a coup? You may think that dislodging the Ray Fallas and Taufas was an unexpected boon, but it really wasn't. They were amongst my stalwart supporters and kept the armed forces and ministries in line for me albeit at the cost of massive apathy and corruption. I admit I had always planned to remove them to enforce meritocratic reforms, but the timing was really poor. I had power vacuums in various key positions in my armed forces, and I expected a hairy few years once my deal with America became operation in the coming months. I needed quick replacements in the armed forces that wouldn't weaken me. The problem with delegating that task was that in Iraq, the delegate would usually gleefully fill up the designated institution with their own cherry-picked candidates. I mean, that's exactly how Saddam became president in the first place. So I couldn't even leave the task to someone like Ahmed, because despite his apparent loyalty, he could do the very same thing as well. And moreover, being in a senior position in the Mukbarat, he would then effectively own the army and secret police. Leaving me messed. No plan seemed to be a good plan, but I finally devised one, which should be a decent stopgap. I asked Kamal to give me an organization chart of the armed forces. That exercise took a couple of weeks in itself. But once I had the reams of papers with the structure, I meticulously began marking two things. The vacancies created by ejecting powerful Rafalas and soldiers who I had chosen at random to interview. Private Abbas squirmed in the fancy chair in front of the large wooden desk. Somehow he had found himself in the presidential palace and in the office of the president himself. He didn't know whether to be terrified or excited. He had heard stories of the president's extraordinary generosity and extraordinary brutality. His mind was like a movie reel going over his past experiences again and again wondering whether he did something to warrant punishment by the president himself. Despite the fans and cool garden breeze wafting through the large windows, Abbas found himself sweating. The doors to the office opened, and Abbas nearly jumped. He scrambled to his feet and threw a quick, robotic salute to his commander-in-chief, standing at attention while he did do. Sit, sit private and relax. I said as warmly as I could manage. I walked up to the shaking private and shook his hand. He looked terrified and relieved at the same time. Kamal bring some dates and chill beer for us. I said to my aide who acquiesced and left to make arrangements. I do hope you'll join me for a drink private. Why? Yes, of course, your mage. I mean, your excellency. I almost laughed at his faux pas. Almost. Excellent. I replied sitting in my seat. I chatted with him about his family and barracks, sharing some of Saddam's stories from his army days and embellishing a few things. Slowly Abbas started to relax, and even more so after he had begun sipping his ice-cold Heathweizen. So to business private, I said clapping my hands together. He immediately stopped smiling and straightened up in his chair, 
sloshing some beer onto his clothes. I watched him as he hurriedly tried to clean the stain. I pretended I hadn't seen. Private, as you know, there had been a sudden vacancy in your unit. He nodded. Yes, sir. I am aware. Unfortunately, we found traitors and imbeciles embedded in our glorious army and have had to initiate a program of reform. He looked awed. One such program is to take the views of loyal and brave foot soldiers such as yourself as to the individuals who would make the best commanders for their units. After all, the soldier on the front is the one who knows who is best to lead him. A boss looked immediately taken with the idea, but embarrassed as well. Sir, with all due respect, I'm not very educated. I fear I would be a bad person to ask about it. I waved off his worry magnanimously and chuckled. Don't worry, Private. I'm not putting the entire headache of selection on your shoulders. I will talk to others in your unit as well. I am just seeking your opinion. Relax, relax. Have some beer and just share your thoughts openly. And he did. He shared the names of five senior soldiers in his unit who he thought would be good officers. I noted all of them down, and then I repeated the process another 500 times. I started with the base units, and then after identifying the people who were commonly considered good leaders, I brought them in to congratulate them on their promotion, and then seek their own opinions on who were the best people to be their immediate bosses, and so on and so forth. There were complications, of course. The ordinarily soldiers were much more honest in their evaluations, but I couldn't expect the same from senior officers who might seek to game the system. So I ignored the top two recommendations that each senior officer gave and focused on the lower priority ones. Again, it was that issue of not letting family networks form in chains of command. The process took me a month, and we came dangerously close to the time, beginning of the American deal. But eventually, with Kamal's help, we got it done in time. I now had an army that was at least partly led by competent officers. But the whole thing was new, not tried, and tested. And I would be soon sending them into the crucible of Iraqi Kurdistan and its fierce warriors. Sajda and the Ray Fallas and the Taufas are in the rearview mirror now. I exiled most of them to Paris. They've been presenting themselves weekly at the Iraqi embassy, as I demanded. They know what will happen if they don't. It may have seemed like the Americans didn't find out about Uday and my being shot, but they did of course. The CIA is the most well-funded intelligence agency in the world. After all, they've probably destroyed more nations than the average American can name. But the American concern was clearly about the forthcoming deal and whether it was still on the table. When they found out I had just received shoulder wound, they were quick to move on to business. Remember Mr. Shaw? the CIA man in the three-person negotiating team. He became my primary point of contact in mid-1979 as we approached the beginning of the actual deal. He brought me several diplomatic pouches full of the American greenback, almost $5 million, which would be about $20 million in 2021 in my original timeline. Who knows how my transmigration would mess up future inflation. The money was to grease palms. Now five million dollars even in those days was a heck of a lot of money in Iraq. It's not just about inflation. It's also about the cost of living in Iraq, which is much lower than in America, of course. So five million dollars was a significant amount of capital to work with. A chunk of it would goad my lackeys in the state and armed forces. People such as Ahmed, for example, who would help keep the Mukbarat in line. It was a reminder to these people that supporting Saddam was the better option than contemplating a coup. Plata Oplomo worked for Pablo Escobar and for gang lords world over because it's such a simple equation even for illiterate people to follow. On the one hand, you offer to enrich the person and on the other to bodily harm them and or their families. The risk-return profile of the deal is incredibly skewed. That's exactly why it was so hard to disentrench the mafia in Italy and the cartels in Colombia. That's also why in poorer nations, corruption is rampant. People fall on a spectrum of corruption acceptability. Some people will watch the world burn for a penny, while others will risk their families' lives, but not budge on corruption. Most people, however, fall in the middle, and if a gangster implements Plata o Plomo, then a low-level government employee is going to rubber stamp that fake license for sand mining in a heartbeat. Another chunk of this cash would go to the CEO of the construction company. I would hire near Basra in the south to construct the bare bones of the U.S. Army base, and the road to connect it to the Basra oil field, and then to the docks. 
the Americans would add the finishing touches to their base and would do their own thing to upgrade the Basra port, as I had agreed with them. I planned to subtly hint that the oil would move faster from the field to port by way of railways. Hopefully that would spur them on to building commercial rail lines in the south. I planned to lay commercial railroads from Kirkuk in the north through the Sunni north-central area, around Baghdad, and then down south to Basra. That would eventually become the backbone of my envisioned country. But I digress. Another chunk of the cash I hope to use to assuage the Shia and Kurdish leadership. In the long run, the funds from the U.S. deal will benefit all Iraqis, regardless of sect. But the long run could be anywhere from three to ten years, and in my experience humans are extremely short-sighted. I can't afford for outright rebellion in the intervening period. While the Americans will be focused on the southern part of the country, I will try and develop Kirkuk in the north, including that oil field. The Kurds would be a difficult group to tackle. Firstly, because I actually admire them for my previous life. Secondly, because they're much more united than the Iraqi Shias. And lastly, because they're spread out over the mountainous regions of northern Iraq, northern Syria, and southern Turkey. That area has never really been patrolled by any of the aforementioned nations, so there's extremely porous borders, so you can never really know when the reinforcements will stop. I actually didn't really want to fight the Kurds. I wanted to bring them over to my side. But the problem is even if they accept some sort of solution, how would I control them from launching attacks into Turkey and Syria in their hunt for Greater Kurdistan? If I have a deal with the Iraqi Kurds who then continue to launch attacks into my neighbors, I will look like I'm harboring terrorists. Such a headache. Morals sold to Middle Eastern dictator for 30 barrels of oil. On Tuesday, the Senate approved the controversial U.S.-Iraq Petroleum Act colloquially known as Saddam Cash. Supporters of the act have lauded the Carter administration for striking the deal, which they consider an economic miracle. The deal involves Iraq charging America just $10 a barrel for 4 million barrels a day over the next 10 years. In the current climate of sharply rising oil prices and geopolitical uncertainty, supporters claim that the deal ensures America's economic success for the entire decade. Opponents of the deal have decried the moral and financial aspect of putting $140 billion into the hands of a Middle Eastern dictator going against America's democratic principles. They also argue that the new T-bonds that the federal government will issue Iraq as compensation will erase all the disinflationary benefits of the oil deal. Markets responded ecstatically to the deal, with the Dow Jones up 5% in the morning session alone. Further bullish movement is expected before profit-taking. Wall Street Journal The End for Iraq Shias and Kurds? America's brand spanking new trade deal with Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein is being seen as a cold-hearted betrayal of America's traditional Kurdish allies in the region. Some left-leaning commentators have termed the deal akin to America's actions in the fall of Saigon. Brookings Institute believes that there is a high chance that Saddam Hussein will use the money to brutally suppress the Kurdish and Shia populations of the country. Saddam Hussein is of course a part of the minority Sunni community of Iraq. He came to power after usurping the position of his mentor and purging his Baid E.H. part of alleged detractors. Read more on page 9 inch, New York Times, The End of Rule Britannia Reader. The new trade deal that America has signed with Iraq under everyone's noses has immediately deflated the grandiose promises of our new prime minister who so eloquently promised the return of Britain to the center stage. Not too many decades ago, Britain had dual control over Iran's oil industry, and now we are relegated to also rands who will need to accept OPEC's set price like every other punter. One wonders whether all the posh and highly educated new ministers even had an inkling that our cousins across the pond were lining up such a tasty deal that all but guarantees America's return to economic craphousery. The bugle has truly sounded on the British Empire. The Times op-ed OPEC accuses Saddam of treachery today Saudi Minister of Petroleum and senior figure in OPEC, Mr. Ahmed Yamani, accused Iraqi President Saddam Hussein of betraying the very organization that Iraq helped set up. He denounced Iraq's action of negotiating a separate deal with America as an action that would bring his fellow Arab countries to their knees as he forecast an oil price war as OPEC members would seek panic deals of their own. The minister stopped short of denouncing longtime Saudi ally America, but sources have suggested that the American ambassador to the Arabian Kingdom was summoned by Jeddah for an explanation.
Reuters one mad dictator calls another dictator Satanist after Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein's megabucks deal with America for its oil. His neighboring crazy Ayatollah Khomeini I newly installed in Iran denounced Hussein as a she-Satan for getting into bed with the great Satan America. We doubt Saddam cares very much as he rolls around in his castle full of greenbacks. The Iraqi dictator is notoriously fond of fine scotch whiskey and cigars. Maybe it's time to invest that money in Glenfiddich stock. The Sun, I'm Rich Biatch. The deal had been operational for a few months. In fact, the Americans had already started setting up the above-ground facilities in their new small military base near Basra. I had been told that there were already two squads of American troops living out of tents on the base overseeing the work done by the U.S. Army construction team, as well as the Shia construction company that was connecting the base to the Basra oil field via a paved and metalled road. The domestic reaction to the oil deal was better than I had expected. Most people feared Saddam, so I heard murmurs of resentment, but nothing substantial. The cash payouts had worked like a charm in the South. The Shia leaders were well incentivized their cadres from reacting to the news of the deal. The Americans also helped the process by beginning the work to upgrade Basra port concurrently with their port. That meant suddenly hundreds of new jobs opened up for local Iraqi Shia young men. I mean in direct terms that's a few hundred less potential militants slash rebels. In indirect terms it created hope that there would be more jobs and more American money flowing into the common man's pockets. The thing is everyone hates America, but everyone secretly loves the American dream. The bigger problem was in the Kirkuk governorate, specifically with the Kurds. I had hoped to engage in some hardcore corruption-based diplomacy with the Iraqi Kurdish leader Mustafa Barzani, who is known to be as tribal and cash-hungry as any Sunni or Shia. But the old man died of cancer in exile in Tehran just earlier that year. His successor was his 30-something son, Masood. When I found out that the new leader of the Kurds was a young guy, I instantly knew there would be trouble. After all, as a new young leader, you have to earn your stripes. And what's the best way to show how big your balls are in Iraq? Go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Saddam. Your Excellency, it was a no, reported Kamal over the phone. He was in Erbil, the unofficial capital of Iraqi Kurdistan. I had sent him there a week earlier as my personal emissary to feed young Barzani some cash and get his tacit support for my future actions in his region. The facilities of the Kirkuk oil fields would have to be upgraded, but more importantly the commercial rail link I had planned as the spine of the country would effectively begin in Kurdistan. A rail line is an easy target for a militant to blow up to disrupt the economy. I needed the Kurds on board. Damn it, I said in frustration over the phone. What exactly did the schmucks say to you? Erm. He refused to meet me, Your Excellency. He sent his reply through an aide. Kamal replied sounding embarrassed. I cursed loudly. The constant machismo everyone felt like showing in this part of the world was beginning to grate on me. I was genuinely trying to help, but young Barzani wanted a meat swinging contest. So it was a complete waste, I muttered. Well, one of the older Barzani's former aides asked to meet me later in the day, said Kamal. Oh. Yes, he suggested that he could counsel Masood and convince him to at least meet yourself face to face, said Kamal. He wants that the leader of the nation should pay a visit to a jumped up peacock. I asked coldly. That's exactly what I conveyed to. I think his name was Pasha. I thought about this Pasha's suggestion. The thing was that I always try to keep my objectives in mind rather than my ego. It was difficult and needed constant effort, but I had found in both lives that it made me much more effective than everyone around me. So as such I had no problem paying a visit to anyone no matter if I thought that they were beneath me. But the issue here was more tactical. Like I said, this was a meat-swinging contest for Masood Barzani. I wouldn't mind giving him a political win if something productive came out of the eventual meeting. But I had my doubts. For one thing he could call me there and simply be in punk in the meeting refusing to negotiate. That would be a double win for him. And secondly, if he did that I would appear very weak. And like I've mentioned many times, I can't appear weak. It's a matter of life and death. Your Excellency, should I return to Baghdad? Asked Kamal. I realized I had been thinking quietly for a number of minutes. Let me think, sometimes when the deck seems stuck and there's no way forward, it helps to shuffle things around and rotate the board so that you and your opponent see the situation from a different lens. Kamal, I want you to go to Kirkuk, I said suddenly. Okay, I shall. Your Excellency. 
good go there, and meet with the Assyrian and Turkmen leaders. I want you to splash the cash around, and get them on my side. Tell them that their youths will get first right on any new construction or oil jobs that come up in the Kirkuk area. I can do that, Your Excellency, my aide replied, sounding chipper. He was an Assyrian Christian, after all, so the new task would be considerably easier than the old one. I'm sure he would also be happy to send some of the oil money his community's way. The Turkmens are a Turkic ethnic group. They came to this country a long time ago during the peak of Turkic power and flourished under the Ottomans. They actually have a slim majority in Kirkuk, although overall they are a small minority in the country. The Assyrians are supposedly the descendants of the ancient Assyrian Empire. Like really ancient. I mean, genetically, they're probably not very different from anyone else in the region, but these supposed differences are for some reason really important to everyone. The Assyrians, though tiny, are majorly Christian. The thing about these micro-minorities is that they take actions very differently from the Sunnis or the Kurds who have sizable enough numbers to pursue independent policy. The micro-minorities essentially try to gather in the shadow of the least intrusive big player. So in modern times, when ISIL was busy brutalizing everyone who didn't follow their most terrible barbaric version of Islam, the micro-minorities mainly fled to the shadow of the Kurds, who were the best at fighting back against ISIL, and least likely to in turn persecute them in turn. In 1979, the Assyrians are already kind of on my side. The Ba'idh party had been somewhat supportive of them in the early 70s. The Turkmen are wary of me, but they've been persecuted by Kurds in distant history as well, so they stay away from them as well. Kamal called back a few days later. The Assyrians were on board with my plan almost instantly, but the Turkmens were more wary. They wanted more promises that carved out a space for them and assurances that they would be protected. What assurances? I asked Kamal. Tell them that their cultural heritage will be protected and schools with majority Turkmen students will have compulsory Turkmen language lessons alongside Arabic. He called again a day later. Your Excellency, they are happy with the new suggestions, but they still want an assurance that the Turkmen identity will be protected by law, Kamal said in an apologetic tone. What assurance? I yelled, in frustration. Their identity is already recognized in the Constitution. What the hell else do they want? Your Excellency, they suggested that they want a notice signed personally by you stating that they are to be protected. I try to tell them that there is no such instrument that exists, but they were adamant. I don't think they have much faith in the Constitution. Argurg, I obsessed over the Turkmen idiocy when I finally remembered that the American president is allowed to wield executive power through special ordinances. The ones in America can have considerable power, but in this case, I just needed something that looked convincing for a bunch of old men. So that's how the Special Ordinance of 1979 was issued, advising all government officials that the Turkmen identity was protected by law and discrimination against a Turkmen based on language or ethnicity was a crime. I didn't know it at the time, but this ordinance would be the first step in creating a truly united Iraq. Saddam, despite being a military man, was not the healthiest specimen around. He was always a little chunky. You can check out even photos of his youth. But by the time I transmigrated into him, he was a pudgy boy indeed. A big part of the problem is his fondness for cigars and whiskey. I didn't like either of those things in my past life, but his brain's biochemistry is hard to combat with willpower alone. Cigars were easier for me to give up. I mean, they're just too much smoke. I had smoked cigars in my last life a few times, and the smoke just made me nauseous. Plus, if you wake up in the morning, after a night of indulging in cigars, and your pillow has a patina of gray ash that's emerged from your nose while you slept that's enough to give the Marlboro Man nightmares. Whiskey was harder to give up. Saddam wasn't a raging alcoholic, but he had a glass or two every night. And he liked the good stuff too. Pure scotch on the rocks. I disliked whiskey in my past life. I was a beer man myself, but there was no beer to be had in Iraq. I mean alcohol is generally haram in Arab countries, right? The closest brewery was in Turkey, and I had yet to figure out how to get a reliable supply from there. Maybe I could ask the Americans to supply me with some Olsen. The other issue was his diet and exercise. Of the former, Saddam liked the more fanciful Arab cuisine, which has a lot of oil and frying. He came from a poor Bedouin background, and a part of his subconscious reveled whenever he had rich man's food, as a sign that he had made it. It's that whole new money 
versus old money concept. In terms of exercise, there was none. I mean this was the late 70s, so there wasn't as much scope for being a couch potato as in my past life. But even then Saddam did the bare minimum. The food was hard to let go of. In my past life, I wasn't a huge fan of Arabic cuisine. It was too strange for my taste buds. But in this life, just like with the cigars, Saddam's biochemistry has adapted to a certain type of food. I mean the endorphin payout when there's a lavishly oiled and roasted lamb shank in front of him is immense. Very, very painfully, I switched over to a more Mediterranean diet with fresh veggies and fruits and goat's cheese. Yuck. Well, at least I allowed myself pita and hummus. For desserts, I replaced Saddam's favorite baklava and kanafe with dates. The dates here are absolutely mind-shattering. I love dates. They're truly nature's dessert. Fruits are sweet, but they don't have the same mouth or stomach feel as dessert. But dates are different. The mouth feel is chewy like toffee, and the taste is deeper and more caramel-like than that of fruits. Exercising. The bane of both my existences. I truly understand the importance of it, but I can't stand gym work. I would have loved to play football, as this is a football-loving part of the world, but no one will play with me properly because I'm Saddam, and they love their families. Jogging doesn't do it for me either. Saddam's. My knees ache from impact. I really, really hope I don't have arthritis. That would suck balls. I finally decided that swimming was the best for me. A full-body workout with no impact. I eschewed the swimming pools that were there in the palace compound, and instead opted to swim in the natural ponds surrounding the al Fa Palace. Saddam had memories of swimming in ponds in Tigrid, and it came naturally to his body. An hour swim in the morning, every day, followed by natural dry sun drying. Perfect. After a few weeks, Kamal and Ahmed started joining me for my morning swims as well. For about an hour and a half, every day, I had no concerns. Just the good life. Why wouldn't give to have some chilled beer as well? My physique started improving. The paunch went inwards even though there weren't abs or anything like that. My face stopped resembling a baboon's backside. And then one day while I was staring at Saddam's face in the mirror, I took a shaving razor and scraped off that stupid mustache of his. My family, employees, everyone was taken aback by the new look. I didn't care. I felt a little bit more comfortable in this new body of mine. For a moment, I sympathized with transgender people. What must it be like to constantly feel like a stranger in your own body? At least in my case, I genuinely knew I was a stranger in a new body. To complete the new look, I also got rid of Saddam's olive green army uniform. It was a stupid look that was intended to showcase his authority over the armed forces and military background, but like with Gaddafi, it screamed provincial dictator. I replaced that offending costume with simple cotton and linen suits. Nothing to showcase wealth, but something a decent middle-class Iraqi businessman might wear. After all, my whole plan was to move the country from tribalism to economic welfare and middle-classery. I had to look the part. November 1979. I watched with the rest of the world as students in Tehran protested outside the U.S. Embassy and then worked themselves up into a frenzy before finally scaling the embassy walls. This was a big event in modern history, of course, and I knew it happened in 1979, but not the exact date, which meant that I had no way of knowing how my transmigration had affected things. I watched the happenings on the small TV in my office with a cold glass of imported Molson in my hands and chuckled. I felt bad for the 40-odd embassy staffers who would face at least a couple of years in Iranian custody and for the six staff members who would eventually escape to the Canadian ambassador's house only to be saved during Argo caper. But to be honest, the timing of this event played into my hands perfectly. Apart from the oil deal, it was now America's MVP in the region. I had gifted them a military base right next to the Iranian border. Good luck with your hostilities against me now, Ayatollah. The hostage crisis would also provide perfect cover for the U.S. to permanently move a carrier group into the Gulf of Hormuz. Do I plan to help out more actively in the crisis? Not particularly. I mean, what could I conceivably do besides ticking off my own Shias and the Iranians? Unexpectedly, I got a call from Ambassador Dickman and Mr. Shaw, the CIA man. We exchanged pleasantries and congratulated each other on the successful first step of our oil deal. Your Excellency, as I'm sure you've realized, we called for an important reason and not simply to take up your time. 
said Dickman in his usual somber tone. Yes, Ambassador. I guessed as much. Well, you are aware of what is happening in your neighboring country, vis-a-vis -vis American citizens, he continued. Of course. It's an outrage. Goes against the Geneva Convention and basic norms of diplomatic decency. I replied with feeling. My thoughts are with your illegally captured embassy personnel. Thank you, Your Excellency, said Dickman gravely. Would we able to count on your help in this matter? I didn't reply instantly. This was a potential diplomatic quagmire. Shaw was a CIA man and would be more canny about the situation for me and Iraq, but Dickman was a straight shooter whose stock had risen immeasurably because of the oil deal. I had heard that he was being considered for a gubernatorial race for a middling state. I didn't want him to go back and tell the American State Department and media that Saddam turned his back on his new friends. I will speak out against this diplomatic travesty in every world forum that Iraq is a party to. I replied carefully. That's, that's very thoughtful of you, Your Excellency. But I'm afraid I was referring to rather more direct aid. Mr. Dickman, let's speak candidly, huh? I said, changing my tone. We are friends now, at least in the geopolitical diplomacy sense of the word. Shaw chuckled at my definition of friends. I could only image Dickman's look of confusion. I appreciate that Your Excellency, Dickman replied, sounding genuinely grateful. Your Excellency, we would like to have the option of expanding both the physical asset that is forward base Basra, as well as the option of expanding manpower and introducing artillery there. We feel that this along with the carrier group led by USS Nimitz would adequately convey to the Iranian polity the gravity of the situation that they have created. Absolutely not, Pat when my reply, but Your Excellency. No, Mr. Ambassador. We have an ironclad agreement about the purpose of the forward base Basra, as you called it. I replied firmly. Your Excellency, we are not talking about a permanent presence. This would be simple saber-rattling, Dickman countered. Mr. Dickman, when you are done saber-rattling and the hostages are returned one way or the other, you will leave without a second glance. And then what about Iraq? For you, the Iranians are some backwards tribals in a hellhole part of the world. But for us, they are our neighbors. They outnumber us almost three to one. And not to mention, almost 60% of my own people would side with the Ayatollah over me. No, sir. You ask too much. Your Excellency, America does not abandon its friends, said Dickman, sounding offended at my insinuation. I couldn't help but scoff. Ambassador, I think you're mistaking current America for your golden generation. We're much closer to the fall of Saigon than to D-Day. He was silent. What could he say, after all? In my timeline, the Americans had a much longer history of abandoning allies, including the Kurds and Afghans. It was Shaw's turn to sally forth. Your Excellency, I take your point on enhanced military presence, but there are also non-military options that you could help us with. Such as? I asked testily. We no longer have much of an intelligence presence in Iran, and it's too dangerous to try and cultivate local assets. But Iraq has a long and porous border with Iran. We could cultivate assets in Iraq and then move them into Iran and give the CIA effective control of my country. Make me a puppet president. You will entrench yourself, I'm sure, Mr. Shaw, but how will I ensure that you disentrench? And please don't spin me that old yarn about taking care of America's friends. I don't want to insult your intelligence, Your Excellency. You are right to be concerned, but I assure you that what I am suggesting has no ulterior motives. I am solely focused on ensuring American citizens aren't harmed. Mr. Shaw, I have no doubt about your sincerity of this matter. Unlike the last time we met, you sound serious not like everything is a joke to you. I replied with no humor. I am. But what you failed to assure me, I continued is whether others in your organization will look at your work in Iraq ten years from now and think, well, I would be ashamed to fold up this nice hole we have over this country that has strategic oil reserves. They were both quiet. And tell me, Mr. Shaw, why should I help the CIA when it is the CIA itself that had brought this new crazy Iran upon all our heads? I ranted. What do you mean, sir? Asked poor old Dickman. Ambassador Dickman in the 50s, Iran deposed the dissolute Shah and elected an honorable nationalist by the name of Mossadegh. His only crime was trying to remove British control of Iran's oil assets. 
and for that the CIA engineered his downfall and allowed the theocrats to gain power. That was another era, Your Excellency, protested Shaw. We've learned from that mistake. Oh, I replied incredulously. And what about the Kurds? What about them? Your CIA has supported them with arms and training and funds, and now Bloody Barzani wants to show his people that he has bigger balls than me. All I'm trying to do is spur economic growth. Shaw replied after some time with a sneaky tone. What if we could bring Barzani to the table? No deal. I said firmly, I don't care about the Kurds. I'll fight them if I have to. If I help you like you want, I might end up in a war with Iran, and they outnumber me three to one. We could arrange for the latest American hardware to upgrade the Iraqi armed forces, suggested Dickman. I was surprised by his pragmatism. I thought he would be offended by haggling for my help in rescuing citizens. Ambassador, I don't want va. I want peace. I would love to be in a position where I can go Japan's way and dismantle my armed forces and only have a defense force. Then I'm at a loss, Your Excellency. Sighed Dickman. He sounded frustrated. Maybe by me, or more likely by the situation. Will the American Congress sign a friendship treaty with me guaranteeing Iraq's sovereignty and territorial integrity? I asked after a while. It was a long shot, something similar to what Japan had. It would put me firmly in the camp of what would soon become the sole superpower of the world. But it would be totally worth it. I could basically dismantle half my army. Air. That would be highly, highly unlikely, Your Excellency. I think Iraq is seen as friendlier because of the recent deal, but not nearly close enough for something like that, Dickman replied. There was silence on the phone for five minutes as we all pondered different things. Gentlemen, if I am to understand it, America will no doubt announce economic sanctions against Iran? Oh, without a doubt, said Shaw. Okay, and if a somewhat friendlier nation to America were to resolve this situation diplomatically, that nation would get a lot of consideration from your Congress? Yes. What are you getting at, sir? Asked Dickman. I want to try resolving this issue without arms or threats or whatever. But if I'm successful, I want America to look the other way in terms of Iraq's trade dealings with Iran. Your Excellency, I'm not sure what you have in mind, but we would certainly need to consult Washington before committing to anything like that, Dickman replied carefully. Please do, Ambassador. But remember, time is of the essence. While I waited for the Americans to get back to me, I had Kamal work on arranging a diplomatic meeting with the Ayatollah. The Iranians acted pricey for over a week, sometimes not taking our calls, sometimes taking us on an office merry-go-round sometimes snubbing our request for a meeting. It was really petty stuff. In the meantime, global condemnation of the hostage-taking was gaining traction. Mid-November, the Americans let me know that Iraq's trade with Iran would be overlooked in the case of economic sanctions should I successfully retrieve their citizens from Iran. This was win-win for me. Even now, I was seen as trying to help by the Americans, and by attempting to engage with the Iranians diplomatically, it would at least soothe the minds of the most hawkish of the Ayatollah's advisors who might have been fear-mongering about my plans for attacking Iran. Towards the end of November, Kamal finally got the go-ahead for a diplomatic meeting between myself and the Ayatollah, but with the caveat that it would take place in Tehran. I still don't know how Kamal managed it. Going from low-level snubs to arranging a meeting with Iran's leader himself was a masterstroke. I resolved to give him a big bonus on Christmas. I had always wanted to visit Iran in my previous life. Mysterious Persia. The land is chock full of history. Once upon a time, the Persian Empire was the foremost civilization in the Old World. It's a strange geography, too. Very mountainous and yet arid. It can be searing hot during the day and freezing cold at night. Tehran, for example, isn't the desert capital of Western imagination, but a place which often sees bitterly cold, snowy winters. The signs of the Islamic Republic were superficial, but ever-present, as my convoy made its way from the airport to the Ayatollah's residence in Qam. The streets had been cleared of people. I wasn't sure if it was for my benefit or theirs. Large hoardings carried Khomeini's grim visage and proclaimed the Islamic Republic. Oh, so scary. Not. Iyam Sadham. Qam is close to Tehran, but to the south. The roads south were of decent quality, not very well maintained, but well built in the first place. I fully intended Iraq to
to have the best roads in the region in short order. My convoy soon has cars with black tinted windows following along. I suspected these were part of the Revolutionary Guard. Did I feel threatened? I'll admit I did a little bit. It would not be the first time a world leader had been assassinated on a foreign visit. Except that I don't think my death would attract as much outrage as Archduke Franz Ferdinand's. Yet my danger sense hadn't increased more than normal. So maybe that was a good sign. Calm is a flat desert city, a center of Shia religious fervor. I had no doubt that my visit would be portrayed as some sort of power coup of the Shias over a Sunni belligerent. Whatever. I was there for my objectives. I eventually found myself seated in front of the Ayatollah on a low mattress. He had a few of his advisors with him, and I had Kamal with me. I had left Ahmed behind in Baghdad to hold the fort for me. The Ayatollah was really old. In my timeline, he would only live to the end of the 80s and would be plagued by health issues throughout. He was clearly in some discomfort already, but was trying not to show it. Khomeini I had a notoriously grim look on his face, and I was faced with the full blast of it. Greetings, Mu'alim, I said politely calling him teacher in Arabic. It certainly wasn't accepted of me to treat him like a religious leader, as he was from a sect considered heretical by Sunnis. But I could respect his PhD, like focus on Islamic learning, misguided as I thought it was. For a moment, I saw his face lighten as he caught the unexpected respect. He didn't say anything as we were plied with coffee, tea and sohan, a brittle toffee made in calm. I munched away happily at the sohan, enjoying it very much. So, the Ayatollah said in gruff accented Arabic after the food and drink had been cleared away, why have you sought to meet me? The provocation was clear, and I really bristled at the arrogant tone of the man. It wasn't the brash arrogance of youth, but the arrogance of a man who believes he has a special purpose and nothing will shake that belief. In other words, the worst arrogance. I shrugged, mainly to irritate him. Despite my wishes, it became clear that my neighbor had a permanent regime change. The rules of Syosset demanded that I come to try and establish diplomatic relations. He nodded. At least you've left the double speak for the great Satan. I felt Kamal shift uncomfortably to my right at the Ayatollah's brusque words. One of the Ayatollah's advisors looked troubled as well. I didn't say anything. In my previous life, I had learned that not every bully resorts to bluster, some use silence as a tool. Well, two could play at that game. The silence prolonged as the Ayatollah glared at me, and I stared back placidly. Our advisors looked increasingly troubled. Finally, it was the Ayatollah who broke the impasse. And why should we want to establish relations with one such as you? Despite his haughtiness, I was jubilant at having won the War of Quiet. I splayed my hands. Do civilized nations not seek friendly relations with their neighbors? The only friends a good Muslim can have is other good Muslims. Tell me, are you a good Muslim? What does it mean to be a good Muslim? Came my instant reply. Submitting to Allah, replied the Ayatollah with assuredness. I paused before retorting. Would a man who submits to Allah but does not live a life of moderation, is not peaceful, is not committed to his family, who hurts others be more worthy of being your friend or a non-believer who does all those things. Do you talk such semantics with your Amriki friends as well? It is nonsense hypotheticals. There is no such unbeliever. I quirked an eyebrow at that. Really, how are you so sure? On what evidence are you saying that? The people of the West you hate so much lead much better lives than both our peoples. They have less poverty. They are more peaceful. They don't starve. They live fearlessly. He scoffed and spoke even more harshly. Have you come here to proselytize about the West? If so, we should end this meeting. It was a wasted trip. I sighed in my mind. The man was as intransigent as I had expected. I truly detested people who become rigid in their blind beliefs and ignore all evidence to the contrary. I would make Iraq a bastion of critical thinking and empiricism. I sipped a new cup of tea as I let the silence build again. I came here so that there is no misunderstanding between us. You do not have to like me or agree with me, but my aim is to make the lives of my people, all my people better. I don't want hostilities with my neighbors. He scoffed. Of course you don't. Your country is rife with internal dissension. Can you rely on your mercenary army against the might of true Mujahids? 
Well, I've heard that you have internal dissension of your own, dear Mulem. I've heard that your revolutionary guard fights against the Kurds even as we speak. He pursed his lips. Once a teacher, always a teacher. They don't like backtalk. Why should you be in a hurry to be aggressive to me? It would make more sense for you to wait until you've consolidated your power and then make an attempt at me. That's all I'm suggesting. That we formally agree to a non-aggression treaty for a decade. Then, if you wish to try your hand at unseating me, well, that would be fair. Kamal audibly gasped next to me, and Khamenei's advisors looked shocked as well. But the imam held up a hand to quiet. I noticed that there was a rosary of beads entangled in his fingers. You think that we are dissolute and scheming like you? If it is Allah's will, then we will defeat a hundred enemies at the same time. Was this guy for real? Even his advisors looked a bit put out. I was offering their nascent Islamic Republic a lifelines amidst a whirlwind of crap. Both his advisors hurriedly whispered into his ears. He held up a hand again and silenced them. My advisors suggest that I listen to this talk of a pact. But I ask you, how does one trust a man such as you? My dear Mulem, I could pose the same question to you. After all, it is your Islamic Republic that has captured 40 civilians working in a diplomatic capacity against all norms of decency and international convention. They are nothing but spies for the great Satan, he roared before falling into a fit of coughing. I quickly rose and brought a cup of water to him, even as his advisors were trying to help him. He accepted the cup with a gruff nod. They were spies, he rasped again. I said nothing immediately, but waited for his hacking cough to die down. You know the Americans will impose economic sanctions against Iran, I said. He scoffed. Let them. That's all these dissolute unbelievers can do. We live in a realm of Allah. Let them try and do Iblis work. We have Allah behind us. This guy, with respect Mulem, spiritual power can't substitute for good old-fashioned food. No true Muslim would crib about such a small hardship, he insisted resolutely. From the faces of his advisors, it was clear that they didn't agree. We are neighbors. In light of that, I would be willing to supply food and buy oil in the event of sanctions. Oh, out of the goodness of your heart, is it? He asked sarcastically. I shook my head. Not all. I want something small in return. He waited for me to speak my demands. Let the American hostages return to Baghdad with me today. He laughed scornfully. You want to show your new American friends what a good little boy you are? I shrugged again. His blatant disrespect was really starting to piss me off. But I tried to remember that I had objectives. Everything else was noise. His advisors had piled in again, whispering furiously into his ears. I almost grinned. I had them now. Surviving the sanctions was a much better offer than 40 civilians. Plus this gave them a somewhat graceful exit from an embarrassing faux pas. They could spin it like a gift in light of setting up diplomatic relations with a neighbor. The imam held up his hand again and then closed his eyes and started counting the rosary beads. After a wait that felt like an hour, he opened his eyes and glared at me anew. There will be no deal with unbelievers and their lackeys. And now it is time for you to leave. You have reached the limit of our hospitality. What the hell? Back in Baghdad, I called up Dickman. Ambassador, you can double the station troops and introduce one armored battalion at forward base Basra. If Iran takes an aggressive action toward the hostages, I will permit further enhancements. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, came Dickman's grim reply. This event made my determination to incapacitate religion from daily life even stronger. I would unleash the most potent weapon of all upon religion, unyielding and unrelenting, bureaucracy and paperwork. My anger against Iran calmed down in the days following my return to Baghdad. The Americans tried to convince me repeatedly that I should start a war against Iran to regain the Shat al-Arab and Khazestan territories that we had ceded to Iran in 1975, that America would provide arms and logistical support. I told them in polite terms to F off. What did it matter to America if hundreds of thousands of brown bastards died over a piece of land thousands of miles away from the U.S.? I wasn't happy with the Ayatollah, but I certainly did not want a pointless war. In early 1980, 
I had some time to finally work on some of my aspirational long-term projects for the country. Uday's trial was going ahead, and the prosecutor nervously informed me that we would have to amend the existing laws to allow for a minor to be charged as an adult. It was far too easy to get that law passed. I mean that was one of the issues. The complete lack of a rule of law in the country. Mainly Saddam's fault in fact. If a country's leaders are not accountable to the written laws and repeatedly flout it and encourage their lackeys to flout it, then the efficacy of the law diminishes rapidly. For that reason, and to improve my administration, I took a trip to Singapore to meet with Lee Kuan Yew, the leader of the tiny nation, and his team. LKW was someone I admired greatly in my earlier life, and I had to stop myself from fanboying when I got to meet him in his prime. The reason I met him and his team was because they implemented certain administrative reforms that allowed Singapore to go from being a poor backwater that Malaysia wanted to get rid of into a global powerhouse punching far above its weight. The main reform I wanted to implement in Iraq was to introduce the up or out policy in the bureaucracy. Basically, the idea was to set the compensation levels of government workers almost on par with what they could expect to earn in the private sector. But at the same time, their jobs were no longer untouchable. In most countries around the world, it's damned hard to get a government worker fired, no matter how incompetent or corrupt. But think about it this way. Without incentives to perform, why would a human go out of his or her way to achieve the best that they could? Hence, the competitive salary was not only to attract the best talent, but also incentivize them to perform to their maximum capacity. On the downside, the fact that the person could be fired for incompetence or corruption would add jeopardy preventing them from misusing their position. The three weeks we spent in Singapore were incredibly productive. For me, it was like a holiday from the constant machinations of the Middle East. For my team, including Kamal and Ahmed, it was an eye-opener about how competent people thought about and perceived performance and development. I like to think that they came back with a little bit more motivation to see their own land transformed the way that Singapore was being. Back in Iraq, we began to plan a step-by-step -step way in which we would gradually introduce up or out into the Iraqi administration. It would mean smaller government presence, but hopefully more effective governance per capita. On the infrastructure side, we had put out a global tender for construction of the commercial railway line that would become the economic backbone of the country. We had money to splurge, but some of the non-monetary, non-technical outcomes would be challenging for the biggest construction services companies of the world. For example, we wanted 95% of the unskilled and semi-skilled labor used to be local. We wanted at least 50% of contractor level and project manager level personnel to be Iraqi. And we wanted at least 10% representation of Iraqis in top management. But the real kickers were that we wanted tech and knowledge transfer, and we wanted a firm project completion within two years. I was pessimistic about the tender's prospects, and in fact most of the bids were exceedingly underwhelming. But Siemens of West Germany came through in a big way. In their bid, they promised 100% of unskilled and semi-skilled labor to be local, 75% of contractor level as Iraqis and 25% of top-level executives to be Iraqi. They also agreed to knowledge transfer and the deadline, but their cost estimate for the project was 10 billion US dollars, which was by far the largest contract for a railways project at that point in history. We went for it. It was fudging Siemens. German engineering. I admit that I forgot about Saddam's remaining children completely. I never felt any affection towards any of them. Easy to judge reading these words, but I assure you transmigration is a strange phenomenon. I only remember the remaining kids when I one day saw Kusai skulking around the presidential palace aimlessly. He looked dour and scheming something that set me on edge. Nothing happened per se, but I kept mulling over their futures in my head for the rest of the day. In the evening, I asked Kamal, Kamal, I want you to figure out boarding schools in North America, Europe, Australia for the kids. The best boarding schools, but with a focus on outdoor type stuff. Of course, your excellency. But what do you mean by outdoor stuff? He replied. You know, sports and learning how to milk cows. Outdoors of things. Which peasants would learn? Milking cows. Forgive me, your excellency. But why do you want the children to learn that? He asked nonplussed. Because I believe that being outside and doing physical labor makes you mentally stronger and happier. I replied. God knows I was happier when I was just an urchin in Tigrid. He chuckled nervously, not knowing whether I was joking or not. I wasn't. Have it for me by the end of this week.
I said firmly. He nodded and left to make me happy. For days later, I found a neat pile of plasticky brochures on my desk, and I sat down with an ice-cold Haram Brewski to peruse all the educational options for Saddam's kids. Goddamn, some of the options were beautiful. Chalet-type accommodations in a Swiss boarding school with kayaking trips on Lake Lucerne, skiing lessons in Grendel, a school in a glen in the Highlands that gave its students a personal assistant each. They were crazy and ostentatious. Like that 90s movie Richie Rich, I had fun going through all the brochures while sipping multiple alcoholic beverages. Finally, by early morning, I had decided on one school for Kusai. It was near Christchurch in New Zealand. The school shared the land of a large farm slash sheep ranch. Students spent a lot of the time outside in pursuits like rugby, fishing, hiking. They also had to spend a minimum number of hours a week helping out at the farm learning all activities of farm life. It looked like a hard knock school, but the students photographed all had ruddy please looking faces as compared the fake delight of the advertised students of other schools. I had avoided picking any North American schools which tended to be incredibly preppy and focused on maintaining upper crust exclusivity. There was an interesting school near Adelaide, Australia, which had regular trip to the outback as part of its curriculum, but I was sure that Kusai would get killed by a snake there, which would be a whole headache of its own. For the girls, I picked two options, one in Bordeaux, France, and one in Austria. They were young, and I wanted to give them the chance to meet with their mother from time to time. God knows it wasn't good for them to wander around the empty palace like ghouls. Plus, I was terrified of the eventual expectation that I would have to arrange marriages for them. F that. I called for Saddam's four remaining children to be brought before me then next day. The girls hugged me when they saw me, probably more as a sign of filial piety than actual affection. Kusai stayed at a respectful attention. Kids, I've realized that in focusing my attention on the country, I've missed out on the welfare of my own children, I announced. The girls made perfunctory attempts to deny the statement. I waved their protests off. No, no, it's true. You are all in your teens now. You should be around children your own age, building your skills and experiencing life, not haunting a palace. They waited for me to continue. So I have decided to enroll all of you in boarding schools. No, Baba, cried Ragda, and the other girls also began to cry following her example. Please, Baba, don't send us away. I honestly couldn't tell if they were following the Asian norm of polite protest to indicate that you weren't happy to get away, or if they were genuinely upset. Baba, I shall follow your wishes and strive to be the best student, Kusai said solemnly. I thought about asking him if he could apply some moisturizer, since he was anyway busy licking my behind. Enough! I said firmly, bringing the loud protests of the girls to a halt. Kusai, I said handing him the brochure for the Christchurch school. I have picked this school in New Zealand for you. You will be with children your age. You will get to spend time outdoors exploring that beautiful country. He simply nodded as he accepted the brochure, but I think I saw the twinkle of genuine interest in his eyes. You three, I said looking at my sobbing daughters, hoping they would knock it off soon. I will give you two options, one in France and one in Austria. You don't have to all attend the same school. Choose the one that is best for you. I handed Ragda both brochures, and her sisters crowded next to her to take a look. Interestingly, their tears dried up as soon as they heard France. Let the shrew have them. Good riddance. The options for schools for girls were surprisingly regressive for the 80s. Most of them seemed to believe that their purpose was to prepare the young women for the freaking, intellectually bankrupt debutante's ball. But the Bordeaux and Salzburg schools focused on giving the girls the same opportunities as boys in sports, science, and arts. I let them have a few minutes to browse through the brochures in front of me. Kids, I said, and they looked up at the softer tone of my voice. I want you to take this chance to be free to live your own lives. At these places you will not be Saddam's children. You can discover what you like and dislike, what you're good at, what you can achieve. I'm giving you this freedom, but it's up to you to make use of it. There will be no restrictions from my side, no arranged marriages, no demands that you return to Iraq. You can all marry who you want, work as a movie maker or footballer, whatever you can work hard towards. The only thing that I warn you is learn from what happened to Uday. If you turn cruel like him, the world will punish you 
and I will not save you. I will be waiting for my turn to punish you. Do you understand? The girls nodded rapidly. I think they look very excited, but I couldn't really be sure. Will we be allowed to meet mother? Ragda asked, sounding frightened. I sighed. Yes, of course. She shot me, not you. But remember that your mother is set in her ways. If you give her the chance, then she will try to control your lives. My suggestion is that you keep a distance so that you have lives of your own. But ultimately, I will leave that decision to you. However, you should know that if she tries to turn you to her political needs, then I will bring my wrath upon her and her family's head. Ragda nodded rapidly. The girls hugged me and dashed off talking excitedly, all memories of crying for their Baba forgotten. What if I wish to return after school to become a part of the government? Kusai asked in a curious tone of voice. I think for the first time in years, he spoke to me from the heart. I went close to him and put my hand on his shoulder. Son, I mean to change Iraq forever. No more will powerful men nominate their sons to take their places. From now on, only people who prove their worth and continue to prove their worth will be in charge. So if you decide to come back, then make sure you come back ready to show that you are more skilled than any of Iraq's other sons or daughters. He seemed to mull over my words before nodding and departing. Thank heavens that was over. No more worrying about a family. I don't give two craps about. Despite the new respite in familial obligations, I was roughly awoken in the middle of the night by Kamal. He sounded grave. What is it? I hissed. I hated being awoken like that. Pardon me, Your Excellency, but there's been a serious incident. I waited for him to continue. The Kirkuk oil field has just been attacked by some terrorists. Several workers have been reported killed. There was some sort of explosive used which has lit up two oil wells. I'm up. I'm up. I wheezed as I dragged Saddam's middle-aged body out of bed. My brain fog had disappeared and my heart was racing. Kamal helped me into my shirt as I zipped up my pants. What's the current situation? Have the attackers been neutralized? The news is very patchy and delayed. Your Excellency, I believe some of the attackers have been killed, but a firefight was still ongoing. Kamal replied, Who is the main commander of our forces near the oil field? I asked Kamal as we rushed towards the new war center that I had had purpose built as an annex to the presidential palace. I believe there is a captain in charge of the squadron directly dealing with the terrorists. Captain Curter. The overall in charge of the Kirkuk area is Lieutenant Colonel Sala. You promised him for Major after the recent purge. Along the way, Ahmed joined our contingent without a word or a pause. Ahmed, I want you to get in touch with this Captain Curter. If we can capture even one attacker alive, he should try it, albeit without risking our troops overtly. Also speak with Lieutenant Colonel Sulla. He is to enforce a strict curfew around Kirkuk and the oil field. Our army should control the region with an iron fist. Yes, sir, right away, affirmed Ahmed as he peeled off to find military foam. Kamal, and I almost barged into the war room. The table in the center wasn't circular. That would have been too strange love, but it was long and oval. My senior most military commanders were already arrayed around it, engaged in a furious discussion, which halted as I rushed in. They leapt to their feet and saluted. At ease, I said distractedly as I dumped myself into the seat at the head of the table. Status update. Your Excellency, the latest report is that our forces around the oil field have neutralized all but three of the terrorists who are holed up near an equipment storage go down. Three of the oil wells are on fire. We believe that 22 of the workers lost their lives because of the initial explosion and three soldiers were killed in the ensuing gun battle, said a man closest to my right. This was Lieutenant General Foud, formerly a Brigadier General. He was young to be a Lieutenant General essentially the second highest army rank. Your Excellency, I suggest we ask the commander in charge of Kirkuk to enforce martial law of the region, said the oldest of the group, LT, General Saad al-Hashimi. He was the only one at the rank of Lieutenant General whose career survived the purge of 1979. My interviews with army officers who served under him suggested that while not strategically minded at all, al-Hashimi did not have a political bone in his body and was a competent, if dull, commander. Already taken care of, I replied. We stayed in the war room for another half hour 
discussing and implementing tactical points about strengthening the supply line to the Kirkuk Regiment from the south. I think by that point, we all suspected that the attack had been launched by the Kurds. I was still hoping that wasn't the case because it would mean war, and I desperately wanted to avoid getting mired in a conflict. But half an hour later, Ahmed handed me the receiver of a red telephone telling me, Captain Kurder from Kirkuk, with an update, sir. Hello, Captain. This is Saddam. I hope you have good news for me. Sir, came a sharp but young voice across the phone. The gun battle is over. We lost four soldiers, but all eight of the attackers have been neutralized. We managed to capture on alive. He has been wounded, shot in the stomach. When we found him, he was moaning in Kurdish. We will interrogate him once the doctors have him stabilized. Excellent work under pressure, Captain. I am truly sorry for the loss of our soldiers. But you have done well in taking control of the situation quickly. I said, give your squadron a well-deserved rest. Lieutenant Colonel Sulla will relieve you and take command of Kirkuk. Sir, he replied sharply before signing off. Gentlemen, I said, turning to my waiting senior most officers, the situation is now under control. There was real life cheering in the war room. I realized then how battered the military must have felt by the constant purging and corruption of old Saddam. This must have felt like the first true victory in ages, although in reality we had our asses handed to us in a surprise attack. I allowed them their moments of jubilation. It is almost certain that the Kurds are behind this. I am disappointed that they have responded in this manner to my overtures, but this is now an armed rebellion, and we will take back control. I saw a lot of firm nodding. My men wanted revenge. This will not be about revenge, I said firmly. We will keep our objectives in mind. The Kurds are also Iraqis. Our actions will be to defong the rebels and take back control. We will not punish innocent civilians. I looked around the room with a glare. What I want by 1700 hours, gentlemen, is at least three different strategies that we can pursue to win. I don't want pies in the sky. I want real implementable strategies. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Sir, what about the oil well fires? Foud asked. I'm afraid we will need external help to put those out quickly. The Army's task should be to evacuate the population to a safe distance. I want all potential flammable material to be removed from around the area ASAP. Very well, sir. Kamal, get me Ambassador Dickman on the phone. Gentlemen, Quick thoughts and quick action. What we do in the coming months will define the Rocky military for generations. I sighed as I left the war room. I had strong hope for my military. It was the first institution in which I had begun the process of introducing a strong meritocracy, but the issue was the purge of 1979 had removed the general of the army as well as most of the lieutenant generals and even some of the air force lieutenant generals. What I needed now was one of the new lieutenant generals to step up and show strategy and steel. Saad al-Hashmi was an option, but the old-timer wouldn't be a strong general, I could already tell. Back in my office, Kamal had roused Dickman who by this point had been made ambassador of Iraq and Kuwait and was now based in Baghdad much to Kuwaiti displeasure. Your Excellency, I've heard the news, how can I help? Asked Dickman sounding tired but alert. I had no time for niceties. Are you aware that three oil wells have caught fire? Yes. I want Red Adair. I asked for three plans for my top officers, but they came up with only two. I was happy about that. I saw it as a sign of growing competence and confidence. They were buying into my new meritocratic system. Don't churn out bullcrap, just because the boss said so. The first plan was spearheaded by Saad al-Hashmi. It was an old timely plan, if there ever was one. So, essentially, you're suggesting a blitzkrieg into Herbal before the Kurds know what's happening, and then hold tight. I ask him trying to summarize the various nitty-gritties of the surprisingly detailed plan he and his team had put together in one day. Yes, sir, he replied confidently. Details breed confidence. Half-assed plans don't. I didn't like the plan honestly, but I didn't want him to lose heart. It's sound plan sod, but I see a few issues, I said diplomatically. The plan assumes that the Kurds aren't expecting an escalation in hostilities. Whereas I would say that the brazen attack indicates that they feel they're ready for war. Hmm. The big question we should ask ourselves is why now? I said, continuing my thought process. 
Saad looked thoughtful. Because of Iran, perhaps? I could have sworn my eyes sparkled. I was so proud of the old chap. Yes, most likely the Kurds have a below-the-table deal with the Iranians for logistical support for a rebellion. I said nodding. The Iranians know they can't start an outright war with the Americans near the border. So they're trying a proxy war. The other plan was spearheaded by Lieutenant General Abbas Al-Shams, another younger officer promoted during the purge. He seemed to have come up with this plan together with Foud, who I had my eye on as a rising star. Commander, our two main advantages over the Kurds are air and armored superiority, Abbas began. Unfortunately, as you've pointed out, the hilly terrain of the Kurdish region nullifies our armored divisions and makes infantry invasion difficult. But our air superiority remains intact. I nodded. It made sense so far. What we propose is to cut off any external support for the Kurds by having our air force bomb the major roads to Iran, Turkey, and Syria. That will constrain the Kurds logistically. Next, we suggest in lieu of infantry movement, we rely on our paratrooper divisions to drop into Erbil and hold that as a central nexus for our control over the region. I found the plan very compelling, but as I was examining it, Saad made a good point. These Kurds are very well versed with the terrain. Even if we bomb the roads, they'll just use narrow passes and gullies to move in and out of Iraqi territory. Yes, but they can't exactly transport heavy weaponry quickly through the gullies, countered Foud. Only small to mid-range arms, and that too very slowly and randomly. If they start like a silk road for arms, our patrolling aircraft will notice it and can bomb them. Agreed, said Saad. But there's also the possibility that they have already, or decide to construct tunnels. I mean, if you think about what the Viet Cong did to the Americans, they would have tunnels hundreds of feet long right into South Vietnamese territory. They were both making excellent points and Saad didn't know how right he was. This was a couple of decades before El Chapas Pomp, but the notorious cartel Kingpin used tunnel to transport drugs, humans, and weapons. Okay, great ideas and valid points. I interjected to take control of the discussion. I like a boss plan, but it needs some modifications. They leaned in, and someone grabbed pen and paper to take notes. The paratrooper idea is out. We have very few trained paratroopers, and I think you are discounting how tough urban warfare can be for the invading army. The Battle of Stalingrad almost wrecked the Nazi war machine single-handedly. The thing is we don't need to have a constant presence in the rest of Kurdistan. We just need to hold Kirkuk at all costs and to deny external support to the Kurds. So yes, we bomb all avenues that they could exploit to move to any of our neighbors. There was no dispute from any of my officers. What I want data on is the geography and geology of the border regions. Saad is right that tunnels are a possible threat to our plan. But tunnels can't be built through bedrock, only through relatively soft material. So if we know the regions where tunnels would be possible, we can focus our air patrols there. But sir, even if we know that, how do we prevent the tunnels from being built? Saad asked. Saad, you gave the example of the Viet Cong tunnels. Apart from being extensive and effective, they were also notoriously unstable. Many collapsed due to nearby bombardment. So if we know where tunnels are likely to be, we don't need to bother whether they've been built or not. We just need to bombard the general area, and they'll likely collapse in on themselves, said Saad slowly catoning on. I couldn't help flash a smile. Exactly. Foud asked, Sir, if we're not parachuting into Erbil, how will we occupy it? I'm not too fussed about occupying it quickly, to be honest. I replied to the apparent shock of everyone else. I held up a hand to forestall any protest. We're casting the net and then dragging it in. The fish won't know that they're slowing being reeled in. Stop focusing on herbal. Step number one is to isolate the Kurds. Step two is to take strategic high points in the region. For that, again take a look at the terrain map and figure out hilltops and ravine overlooks that we should target and hold. We'll progress gradually towards the center, but the connection to the supply line must never be cut off. The Kurds have better terrain experience, and our troops would be sitting ducks without the advantage of high points and support lines. Sir, what time frame do we have to prepare the final plan and implementation? Abbas asked after the discussions had wound down. I looked at him dead-eyed. I see, Lieutenant General, a slash N. 
a side story and change in POV to showcase how our Saddam's policies have begun affecting the populace. August 1979, Basra. Hassan, are you not coming to watch a match? No, brother. I have to go mine the shop. My dad and uncle have some suppliers to meet. Relied the youth called Hassan with a sour expression on his face. A3. You'll miss us thrash those bloody Baghdadis. But I guess you don't want to see them thrashed, you college boy. Replied the other youth, Ahmed laughing raucously. Shut up. Snapped Hassan, but the grin on his face belied his words. He was very sour about missing the match, though. The editor of a newspaper had somehow procured ten tickets and had offered to take all the office's men to the game. Hassan had been looking forward to the game for months, until his father had shattered his dream last minute by announcing that he would have to look after their family's grocery shop that evening. I'm here, he announced dully, pushing aside the partition that separated the front of the shop from the punters. His uncle said a hasty, hello as he stocked the shelves while his father simply grunted as he continued working with the calculator. Later that evening as the sun began to set, and he was propped up against the storefront people watching idly, his thoughts became more and more negative exacerbated by the lack of customers. Could have just shut shop for one night, he thought angrily. Hassan was frustrated and depressed although he didn't know that he suffered from the latter. A 24-year-old civil engineering graduate from the University of Baghdad, Minding a grocery store would have been inconceivable to him just five years previously. He had left for Baghdad with his and his family's hopes lying on his shoulders. He had always been a bright student. He even picked up decent English by attending after-school tuition. The world beckoned, and yet after struggling through four years of stresses, strains, and shears, he had nothing to show for it. There just weren't any jobs, especially not for a Shia from a nondescript background. He struggled for months to land an engineering job anywhere in the country with no luck. And so he returned, cynical and ashamed. In Basra, there was no time to wallow. His father, gruff and business like that he was, didn't castigate his son, nor did he comfort him. He simply demanded that the boy either get a job or help out with a family shop. Hassan had no intention of being a shopkeeper, engineer or not. He was an intellectual and he would do an intellectual job or not at all. He eventually landed an underpaying job as a journalist with a new newspaper in the city, the Basra Post. It was a team of relatively young men and a few women who were passionate about their country and wanted change. He had never been particularly political earlier, but was hard not to be infected with the aura of his new colleagues. And so he threw himself into his work. They wrote about the garbage in the streets, the corrupt police and officials, the midnight disappearances, the subjugation of the Shias and communists. Hassan felt useful for the first time in a long time. He started participating in protests and marches to the dismay of his family who wanted him to focus on earning a livelihood and not risk the wrath of the Baathists. But he didn't listen. He thought he'd found a purpose and a woman. Aisha, an open-haired, jeans-wearing, cigarette-smoking wild child who worked with him and with whom he was smitten. September 1979, Basra. He's finally done it. He's finally gone too far, crowed the editor victoriously in the Monday morning meeting. Who's done what a saying? Asked Ahmed yawning. Saddam. Saddam went and signed an oil deal with the Americans. He's allowing them to set up a military base right here, outside Basra. They were all instantly awake then. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. Despite the revolutionary nature of their newspaper, they had a little bit of journalistic integrity. What's your source? Aisha asked suspiciously. It was earth-shattering news. Unbelievable news. The Americans, they're bloody announcing it on all their news channels. About how it's such a great deal. The editor said loudly with a twisted grin. They couldn't doubt it after that. He was the only one in that group with a TV and probably one of the few in the city with global channel access. They made a hundred plans that day. They were certain there would be mass unrest, not just in Basra, but in Baghdad and Tikrit and Kirkuk and Erbil. A chance for all communities to rid themselves of the disease called Saddam. They waited and waited for the protests to start. But day after day, the wait was futile. What the hell is happening? Why aren't the leaders giving us the go-ahead? Aisha asked frustrated one day. Hassan Laharpasan. I spoke to Masood Pasha. I told him we were ready to take to the streets said the editor, sounding tired. 
he told me that under no circumstances were we to protest, as it wasn't the right time. Well, F him then. I'll speak to Secretary Bassam, replied Aisha, referring to the leader of the communists in southern Iraq. The communists will lead this revolution like always. But that never happened, and Hassan kept being pulled into shopkeeper duty feeling more and more frustrated each day. One evening, his father asked him to join him for a coffee after dinner. They had halted that particular tradition a long time ago as the distance between father and son grew day by day. Hassan sipped his coffee awkwardly as he sat beside his father on the terrace of their house. His father placed a loose sheet of paper on the small table between them. What's this? Hassan asked, picking up the paper. Have a look. Hassan read the leaflet, which was written in Arabic. In it, the Basra Port Development Authority invited English-speaking individuals above the age of 18 to interview for a position of official translator at the port, which would soon begin redevelopment and expansion. The port was less than an hour by road south of the city. You want me to apply? Hassan asked incredulously. You want me to work for Americans? His father looked him in the eyes then. Hassan didn't remember making eye contact with his father in years. Americanness, Shia, that communist, these identities that you prattle on about are for useless people, son, his father said firmly but softly. The only thing that matters is ensuring your survival and the survival of the people who depend on you. Baba, the Ayatollah himself, calls America the great Satan. His father shook his head. Son, the Ayatollah, and his ilk don't need to work to ensure their family survival. They have the gift of charisma. So foolish men, with stars in their eyes, pay just to hear them speak. The rest of us don't have that luxury. Bub, son, the only enemy is deprivation. Hassan grew desperate. Baba, think about what people will say if your son works for Americans. Again his father shook his head. Son, I have lived longer than you. I'm telling you that people are selfish and hypocritical. They will criticize you and then the next day go and do the exact thing they criticized you for. Never give credence to what people say. Always look out for yourself and your dependents. Hassan was tongue-tied. He felt like revolting, but this quiet, gruff man had financed his studies and not criticized him once when he returned home empty-handed, nor when he started working a newspaper. But, so, I have never asked you to do what I say, but please this one time, for me, just go and interview. And that was that. The Basra port was large and messy, with rusty steel containers strewn about the place. Hassan had never been inside the premises. It was dirty, noisy, and he had been warned that a lot of smugglers and drug dealers plied their trade there. But as he entered, he could already see signs of change. There were whites everywhere, speaking loudly and authoritatively in English. There was a hustle and bustle which he had never noticed from the outside, as if some great work was being done. There were long queues of locals winding into rudimentary looking contraptions that had doors and windows. These were probably the temporary offices that the new American overlords had set up. As per the ad that he still had clutched in his hand, he was supposed to report to the strategic planning office, but all the boxy temporary offices looked the same to him. So he stopped and tapped on the shoulder of one of the men lined up in a queue and asked him in Arabic, Brother, do you know where this strategic planning office is? The man had a languid expression on his face as he chewed something. Probably caught. He looked at Hassan and then shrugged. Hassan sighed in frustration and looked around to see if he could accost one of the whites for help. But they were all rushing around looking interminably busy. Finally, he decided to seek the help of the only whites who looked unoccupied, the scary-looking American soldiers. Despite his revolutionary ideals, Hassan was terrified of these foreign soldiers. They had all kinds of expensive-looking gear and had large black rifles angled in front of them with one hand near the trigger at all times. They wore dark sunglasses and chewed gum as they observed the goings-on continuously. But he had come here for a reason, and he would not leave before that. So he walked up to one of the soldiers and said in his heavily accented English, Excuse me. The soldier didn't seem to hear him, so Hassan cleared his throat and said loudly, Excuse me. The American looked at him and said, Ya Bob. He sounded like one of the cowboys in the western movies his Baba had taken him to see as a child. Um, I am looking for the strategic planning office. 
the soldier looked him up and down before replying. And why you need to find a strategic planning office, bub? Hassan was indignant that this soldier was treating him like some kind of hostile. He held out the crumpled leaflet, but didn't say anything. The soldier took the leaflet and scanned it before nodding. Take a right, and just keep heading straight. It's the blue-colored cabin next to the water. Can't miss it, bub. Thank you, said Hassan relieved and surprised that the soldier had ultimately been helpful. No problem, buddy. Break a leg. The soldier said, drawing the word problem into prayablem. There was no queue outside the large blue cabin. Hassan tepidly knocked on the door once, and then harder again a few minutes later. Come in already, sheesh, came a muffled voice. Hassan stepped out of baking heat and into a cool, dimly lit, air-conditioned room with a few whites and very few Arabs stationed around desks. There was a huge white man seated behind a desk close to the door who was staring at Hassan expectantly. I am here about the translator job, sir, said Hassan hesitantly holding out the leaflet. The man's eyes lit up, and he grinned broadly, finally. Another one. Sit down. Sit down, buddy. Take a load off. Hassan sat down in front of the man. He struggled with the chair awkwardly and winced as it screeched across the metal floor of the cabin. He was feeling inordinately anxious around all these whites. He had only seen people of other races on TV and newspapers before. He hadn't realized they would be so big or loud. His English tutor had been an old Indian man called Vaswani. When Hassan had asked him why he was in Iraq, Vaswani had laughed and said it was because he loved dates. Only later did Hassan realize that the old man was joking. Old Vaswani had been born in Iraq when it was a British protectorate, part of an Indian trading community that had dwindled once the Arabs had taken the country back. Name's Hewitt, said the white man, extending a large paw across the table. Hassan took the hand, surprised at the man's lack of calluses. Hassan Majid, sir. I'm not British Hassan, I'm American. You don't need to be so formal, Hewitt replied, grinning. Hassan no did seriously. So, you got a resume or CV? Hassan clumsily drew out an envelope from his back pocket, in which had folded a typewritten CV. There wasn't much on it. It had his education details and his newspaper experience. He was embarrassed by it. It was also a little damp from his sweat. Hewitt took it and grimaced a bit. Air hot day outside, is it? Hassan chuckled self-consciously and nodded. Hewitt spent the next few minutes poring over Hassan's CV as Hassan sat there feeling self-conscious. Your civil engineer and excellent grades by the look of it, Hassan, began Hewitt in a serious tone. How come you ended up in journalism? Sir, I spent six months after graduating looking for an engineering job, but I had no luck. It is tough, especially for a Shia, Hassan said firmly. He had had this conversation many times before, and he stopped caring much. Hewitt nodded. Yeah, we were given a heads up about the situation before we came here. I get it. It's damn unfortunate, though. You have been perfect for the project officer role. Hassan nodded bitterly. Hewitt put Hassan's CV down and looked him in the eyes. Look, Hassan, I mean you're probably overqualified for the translator role. But without experience in engineering, I can't put you in a project role. So I'm thinking we start you out in translation. If you impress, I'll push management to give you a chance in projects. Does that work? Hassan was stunned. I've got a job? Hewitt nodded. Yeah, of course. Hassan controlled his giddiness and asked, But how much does it pay? Hewitt located a loose sheet of paper from his desk and presented him with a typewritten table with Hassan's starting salary written out on it. Hassan's eyes bulged when he saw the figure. It was almost ten times what he earned at the newspaper. It was almost as much as he would have earned as an entry-level engineer. Hassan held out his hand. When can I start? November 1979. Basra the previous few months had been the most hectic of Hassan's life. He quickly became the most in-demand translator in all of Basra port. What the Americans hadn't realized was that it wasn't enough for the translator to speak English and Arabic if they had no concept of engineering or logistics. It was an exercise in frustration to first explain things to the translator properly and then have them explain it to the workers in turn, all the while hoping that it didn't turn into Chinese whispers. With Hassan, it was different. He had the theoretical knowledge, but also had a knack of getting exactly what the project officers were trying to convey. 
In some cases, he also made suggestions to the project men, which improved their ideas. He was in demand and constantly shuttling from one end of the port to the other. He then discovered a wondrous concept called overtime, in which if he worked beyond his contracted hours in a day, he would be paid at double the usual hourly rate. Overtime swept him off his feet into a world of exponentially increasing bank balance. Within a matter of weeks, he began dreaming of purchasing a small car in which to traverse the new four-lane highway that went from the port to the city of Basra. Hassan was so enthralled by his work that he didn't notice that he hadn't seen any of his old colleagues or friends in months, nor that the Ayatollah had taken over in neighboring Iran. He was least bothered when the hostage crisis broke out, even though his new American colleagues became very grim-faced. All over Basra Hassan spied a new energy and enthusiasm. It felt like all of the men either worked for Bechtel at the port or Siemens on the new commercial railway line that Saddam had grandiosity called the Spine of Mesopotamia. Unlike what Hassan had expected, no one cursed the Americans, and surprisingly people stopped cursing Saddam too. Nobody praised him, but the evening abusive sessions at the cafes, led by the rickety old shisha smoking men, stopped. Those sessions stopped because there was no one left to attend those evening sessions. Even the older men found work. No one had time for the old-timers to bitch. But Hassan continued to hear the Americans complain about being unable to fill the vacancies. Hassan, please put the word out. We need forklift operators. Hassan, ask your friends or cousins if anyone would be willing to learn how to operate a JCB. Hassan, dude, we need more translators. Hassan once asked Hewitt what the big rush was for. Hewitt slammed his hand on his table in frustration and said, If we finish erecting the crane, number three by Christmas we get a 30% bonus. 30% Hassan. I can buy my kid that goddamn Millennium Falcon he wants and have enough left over to put a down payment on that new Chevy I've had my eye on. Later that evening, Hassan replayed that humorous exchange for his family. They all chuckled except for his sister, Nor, who said seriously, I want to be a translator too. Hassan looked to his father, who simply nodded and said, Okay, Hassan, take her along tomorrow. All hell broke loose, as his mother and father rode all night. Nor has learned English with Hassan from old Vaswani, but opportunities for women had been non-existent until now. So Hassan took his little sister to work the next day and introduced her to Hewitt, who looked like he might cry in joy. Hassan was worried about his sister's safety, but the Americans seemed to have made her well-being their priority and made it clear to the local workers that any disrespect of her because of her gender would be a violation of Bechtel policy and would result in immediate termination of their employment. No one wanted to lose their fat pay packet because they couldn't keep their sexist crap off the tips of their tongues. So the worst nor faced was glares and resentful looks, which she ignored with aplomb. Hassan felt immense pride. For the first time in his life, Saddam POV, red Adair, a hell of a man, tall, broad-shouldered, nonchalant air. He walked off the twin propeller plane at Kirkuk Airport. I met him directly on the tarmac itself. There was no time to waste. The city was covered in thick smoke, and moreover my precious oil was being burned up. I wanted the fires capped yesterday. He didn't acknowledge anyone else. Just looked at the smoke for a moment grunted and headed directly for me. He grabbed my outstretched hand in his meaty paw and said a gruff hello. No, your excellency, no pandering, just hello. And he had me at hello. I'd like to say that this was the beginning of a torrid gay love affair, but unfortunately, I was straight in my last life. And in this one, Saddam was violently straight as well. No, not a love affair, but it was impossible for any self-respecting red-blooded male in the 80s not to see Red Adair and recognize a super alpha. Mr. Adair, I'm glad you were able to come so quickly. We really need your help, I said in greeting. He just nodded, loosened his tie and said, I want to see the fires. And before I knew it, we were sitting in the back of an army jeep and racing off to the Kirkuk oil field. I had based myself in the city since the initial attack by the Kurds. Two weeks now, the city was heavily fortified and curfew was in place. My lieutenant generals had followed through on their initial plans, and we had bombed the border roads around Kurdistan to nothingness, 
and our air force did daily sorties at random times in hopes of catching Kurdish supply mules unawares. On the Western Front, we had quickly moved to capture key peaks, roads, and power stations near Kirkuk so that any counteroffensive by the Kurds would be a foolish endeavor. From the war perspective, it was now a simple case of attrition doing our job for us. Adair and I reached the outskirts of the oil field. The air above us was dark from the thick hydrocarbon smoke. We both wore gas masks by then. Hmm. My gruff companion said, this ain't close enough. And without another word, that big beautiful man strode into the oil field alone. I exchanged an incredulous look with Kamal. What the actual hell was going through his mind as well I imagined. I sent a few of the oil well workers scurrying after the American in case he needed help. And then we simply waited by the jeep. No one who say me playing with a pebble would have imagined I was the ruler of a nation. Adair returned half an hour later, taking off his mask. Except for his eyes and mouth, the rest of his head was black from soot, as were his previously impeccable clothes. We'll need a helicopter, some welding tools, an electrical cutter, cement, and a big disc of metal, Red Adair told me without preamble. I was in love with the man, but I was hardly about to be his errand boy. Come on. I barked. Make it so. And then I hopped into the jeep and went back to the provisional army headquarters. I had so many other projects to keep track of, I couldn't afford to be too arsed about just one. My stay in Kirkuk came to an end within the month. Nothing much was happening really. The intelligence we had from in and around Herbal suggested that the Kurds had not been expecting such a placid response from the Iraqi army and were essentially waiting on tenderhooks for what would come next. I mean, what would come next would be a slow squeezing of the Kurdish economy. I had no plans to starve the Kurdish population. I would make foodstuffs available near the border posts that my army held with no preconditions. This would be the first step towards sowing resentment towards whoever authorized the terrorist attack. But yes, the Kurds would have no avenue to sell their own goods. There were only a few half-hearted attempts by Kurdish guerrilla warriors to bring the fight to us. But as I said, we had already hemmed them in by capturing strategic heights all along the Kurdish border and by placing artillery on those heights. So it became quite boring, actually. Red Adair had corralled quite a number of people who became his unofficial team and seemed to be in his thrall. Based on my historical knowledge, I trusted him to close the fires within a matter of weeks. And close them in style, might I add. But things were happening in the rest of the world and in the rest of Iraq that demanded my attention, for which I returned to Baghdad. Because of my failed diplomacy in Iran, the Argo Caper went ahead per the original timeline and the Canadians were able to aid in the rescue of the six Americans who had evaded capture by the Iranians. After that, the U.S. became more and more bellicose towards Iran. I knew sanctions were around the corner. Anwar Sadat of Egypt broke ranks from the Arab nations and signed a peace treaty with Israel. I admired Sadat, an empiricist if there ever was one. He knew his prime role was as the leader of Egyptians and he was accountable to them for their betterment. I didn't agree with what had happened to Palestine, but the continued Arab belligerence and the inevitable Islamization of the struggle would be a pain for decades. Dickman called upon me many times at the Baghdad Palace to strongly urge me to consider my own peace treaty with the Israelis. I politely told him to F off. Sadat would soon be assassinated over the issue, and I didn't want to follow him into an early grave. Status quo was perfectly fine by me. No, what concerned me the most was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. This would be the beginning of the end of the Cold War. This is the period in which in the original timeline the Reagan administration happily funded the resistance in Afghanistan, otherwise called the Mujahideen. Remember those guys? Remember Osama? Damn those guys and their crazy disgusting beliefs. I warned Dickman and I warned whichever American official I could not to support the Mujahideen, that there were worse enemies than the Soviets. But this was 1980. American triumphalism was rife. It put me under a whole lot of pressure to modernize educate and insulate my own country as soon as I could so that when the Saudis eventually began exporting Salafist, Wahhabi ideology worldwide it wouldn't take root in Iraq. And to that end I passed, i.e. steamrolled the parliament, 
a bill that limited foreign funding into non-government and non-government approved organizations by magnitude of frequency of transactions. The problem is essentially one of the framing of the statement of the policy. If I outright identified religious organizations as beneficiaries to whom this limitation would apply, people would either be up in arms or would find ways to circumvent the rule. But as it was a positive limitation, that is to say, there was a transparent process for applying to be an approved beneficiary, my guess was that organizations and their people would spend their time trying to become approved. My ultimate plan was to remove the ability of religious organizations and their proponents from achieving any economies of scale, which throughout history has always been the point at which religions become political. Baby steps Saddam, baby steps. And so, as of today, memo number 66 comes into effect. All employees will receive a blanket four times increase in their base wages with further incentives dependent on performance versus an anticipatory yearly career plan. Haddad Aboud, the head of the Sadr City, West Branch of Rafidane Bank, read out from a sheet of paper he was holding. The whole office cheered, including 50-year-old Walid bin Raymond. He couldn't believe his ears, and even though his boss Haddad looked tense and sweaty, Walid began imagining how he would spend or invest the extra income. As he daydreamed, he only partially heard what Adad said next. There will also be a biannual performance review. Walid zoned out for the next part. If he hadn't, perhaps, he would not have been as cavalier with his day-to-day -day work. Those not meeting their target without reasonable explanation are liable to be terminated and barred from further government employment. Those found to have engaged in unethical practices will be summarily terminated and prosecuted. Walid returned that night and took his disbelieving family out for ice creams. Neither his wife nor his nearly adult children could believe that their stern, joyless father knew what ice cream was. The next morning, Walid felt hungover and groggy from the ice cream, so he decided to take it easy. Unfortunately, one of the bank's customers, a young man looking to take a personal loan, was out to make his life hard. You told me last week to come back this week for the final resolution of the loan, the young man in yellow overalls said with frustration writ on his face. Walid stifled a yawn and replied irritatedly, Yes, well, do you have any idea how many loan applications we process daily? I only give estimates of time. No, I don't know how many loan applications, replied the man, crossing his arms. Tell me. Lots. The customer scoffed. Walid lost it. Didn't this young gun know how to respect his elders? You young people. You get one job in construction and some money, and you think you can just throw your weight around, said Walid, leaning forward and wagging his finger in the man's face. Well, let me tell you, Sonny, work for decades, and then you'll realize you're just a cog in the machine. Then you'll learn some patience. I'm not moving until there's some progress on my loan application, replied the young man firmly, his lower jaw jutting out in stubbornness. TCH Walid reluctantly retrieved the man's loan application and slowly, ever so slowly, started perusing through the file. He was looking for any small error he could find to reject the application and show the young man his place. At last he found it. Walid turned the file around and placed it in front of the man and pointed to a part of the form that the man had crossed out with a pen. Here, there can't be any errors on the form. I'll be rejecting this application. What do you mean? said the man in a low, dangerous voice. No, mistakes, mom. Um, form. Walid replied stubbornly, You'll have to submit the application again. You bloody corrupt bastard, yelled the man as he exploded out of his seat. He looked like he was going to kill Walid, who shrank back terrified. You damn bug, yelled the man as he pointed at Walid threateningly. I'll have you. You watch. I'll freaking have you. As the man stormed out, there was pin drop silence in the bank as everyone stared at Walid, who trembled. Later at lunchtime, his colleague Nabil broached the topic. Uncle Walid, why did you antagonize that man? You know the error isn't a reason to reject the application. Walid liked being called uncle by the junior staffers. It showed him that the old etiquette, Adab, wasn't lost on the youth yet. Elders were to be respected. Son, sighed Walid. These new age youngsters aren't as enlightened as you. They work in these lowly construction jobs, get some quick cash, and think they know the world. It's the duty of us elders to educate the youth. Nabil was quiet for a while before he said, 
I've heard that the Siemens people pay their construction workers quite a hefty amount. Any they reward hard workers even more. Just like the new Memo 66. TCH. What has been happening will continue to happen, replied Walid tersely. Walid ate his lunch luxuriously while contemplating the morning's incident. His eldest son had shown interest in taking up a construction job on the new spine of a rock railway, but Walid had put his foot down firmly. Before he knew it, his younger colleagues were packing up their tiffins and making a move as if to return to work. Where are you guys going? Back to work, uncle, replied Nabil. Walid checked his watch. It was only 1 p.m. Typically, they kept a lunch break from 12.30 to 2, but it's only been half an hour. Nabil shrugged. It's the memo, uncle. We all want to meet our targets. Walid shook his head and watched the young lot walk back to their desks. Mad world. A few days later, Haddad summoned Walid to his office. How are you, uncle? How are the kids? Haddad asked kindly. Walid smiled at the man, who was his second cousin by marriage. All good, all good, inshallah, replied Walid smiling warmly, but wondering what Haddad wanted to speak about. Haddad sighed as he partially held up a paper. Uncle, this is difficult to talk about, but there's been a complaint about you. Oh, what sort of complaint? What Walid actually meant to ask was why Haddad was bothering him with a complaint. Every year, there were dozens of complaints against Walid. A customer of the bank requested a personal loan, but he says you delayed final resolution inordinately, and then, when pressed, rejected it on flimsy grounds. It's that damn construction worker, isn't it? Walid shouted, slamming the arm of his chair. Uncle, I had a look at the loan application. There was absolutely nothing wrong with it. Why didn't you approve it? Walid looked away. TCH, why does everyone keep asking me that? That boy was a brat. He was rude to me. I was teaching him a lesson. Haddad sighed and rubbed his eyes. Uncle, he said in a tired pain voice. Didn't you hear what I said about Memo 66? You can't do things like that anymore. You can't even afford mistakes. None of us can. Walid stared at him uncomprehendingly. You could be terminated, Uncle. Walid laughed and waved his hand. That is nothing. Never happens. Will they do transfer me to Sadr City, East Branch? Haddad stared at Walid in wide-eyed shock. You could be terminated, uncle. What is that? Terminated. My God, you could lose your job, uncle. Lose my job. They wouldn't dare. Uncle. Haddad near shouted at the older man's obtuseness. You don't seem to understand. These are the new orders from the president's office. It's not just the bank. It's all public offices in Baghdad, maybe all of Iraq. The pay rise comes with a cost. Walid sat there stunned and let the news percolate. Later that night, for the first time, he spoke to his wife about work things. Husband, maybe you should see it as a good change. I mean, if you beat your targets, they've promised more incentives. We could save up enough for a new car and even get the house repainted. Hanifa is getting close to marriageable age. It will leave such a good impression if the prospective groom's family sees our new house and car. I don't like this, though. This is not how things have been. Things change, husband. And things indeed changed. Slowly, even the old-timers started sticking to a half-an-hour lunch, and the afternoon hour-long tea break disappeared completely. Walid tried his best to adjust. When the young guns with their excessive oil-fueled incomes came to purchase securities or borrow money, he found it hard to keep his temper in check, but he reminded himself to work on his targets. One day, Walid arrived at the branch an hour, late due to some personal work only to walk in on a major scene. His old colleague Adnan was being dragged out by two stern police officers. Adnan was cuffed. What happened? Walid hissed to Nabil. Nabil shook his head and whispered back. Someone filed a complaint that Adnan asked for a bribe to process his loan prepayment. He's been let go, and a police complaint has been filed. Walid needed a chair. His legs were shaking too much. A little honey on the top for faster processing had always been a done thing. He had never imagined that one could end up in prison for something like that. Little by little, the Sadr City West branch of the Rafidain Bank, as well as the rest of the city of Baghdad, began to change. The branch opened on time. Business was conducted with a view to achieving results. 
A customer on average spent no more than 20 minutes at the branch when earlier 50 to 60 minutes was the average. Waleed underperformed massively in his first performance review. It was one of the worst experiences of his life. He couldn't help but stutter and shake. Over the past few months, he felt as if he had aged a decade. Several of his fellow old-timers were in a similarly bad state, unable to adjust to the changes. It wasn't just the branch. The streets were clean as the trash was picked up like clockwork. The police functioned like as if they were the ration themselves. Walid's elderly neighbor Bashir had told him over Shisha one evening that he had finally had enough of the upstairs residence dogs barking throughout the night and went to file a complaint. Not only did the police take down his complaint without a bribe, they also gave him a copy of the report which carried a guarantee of a follow-up. And lo, and behold, the very next day, two policemen visited the neighbor and forced the man to have muzzles for his dogs, who the police determined could indeed not keep from barking. Walid's eldest son had left home without so much as a see you soon, and called only when he had reached Tikrit, where he had been hired in the construction of the Tikrit Transport Terminus, intended to be the crown jewel of the spine of Iraq. Walid's wife had also grown bold as she saw that the other wives of the neighborhood were benefiting from the increased prosperity and sense of freedom. One fine day, she threw her burqas away, and without asking for Walid's permission, she took to wearing abayas. When he complained, she told him coldly, Why don't you first focus on your work and get more bonus money? All the other wives talk about is the new additions to the living room. Samara gets to wear jeans at home, and her husband has allowed her to enroll in evening classes. You don't let me have any freedom, nor any nice things. Chastened, Walid began to keep his head down, and his earlier confidence evaporated. He didn't know how long he could keep up with the new way of working. But then, like manna from heaven, Haddad announced that the bank was offering a VRS, Voluntary Retirement Package, to all employees with more than 20 years of experience. Walid could hear the angels sing when he heard the package. He had to run the details by his wife, but when she seemed recalcitrant, he cried and said he couldn't keep up with the work. She begrudgingly assented, and the very next day, he began the process for retirement. At the exit interview, feeling chipper after a long time, he told Haddad confidently, enjoy this new Iraq while it lasts, son. It won't last. When Walid departed, Haddad shook his head and muttered, damn idiot. Now, I've been seeing that the complaints about side chapters and posting schedule have been increasing. I don't generally mind it, I get it. Stories on web novel appeal to our wish fulfillment, and we feel frustrated when a particular story we like isn't going our way. But I want to offer you another perspective. You've read up to chapter 20, so you clearly like the story to some degree. I am doing this for free, and you're reading it for free. I can't give up on real life to devote myself to this full time. I try and post on all weekdays, which I've managed for the past three weeks. Also, I write the so-called side chapters to give myself a break from one strand of a story, which gets boring after a while. I also don't see them as side chapters. The attempt is to show that the MC's policies are having a real impact on everyday life in the country. But what I'm proposing is that you trust the chef. I absolutely may mess it up, or I may post something that gets you thinking and excites you. So just sit back and relax. I'm still very excited because there are so many historical events yet to come. I hope you'll continue to enjoy what I write. July 1980, Saddam POV. It had been about six months since the war with the Kurds began. It wasn't much of a war, to be honest. Our initial strategy was surprisingly effective. The Kurds were completely hemmed in, and we had continually tightened the circle very, very slowly, one hilltop at a time. Battles or skirmishes really happened at very low intensity. So low in fact that on any given day, no more than one squadron saw active combat. My top armed forces commanders had formalized their gathering into a war center and worked surprisingly well together. Foud was the undisputed tactician while Saad had, to my pleasant shock, suppressed his ego and turned into a very effective moderator for the planning. I think despite my blatant attempts at introducing meritocracy, the innate respect for Gray, hairs worked in his favor. I visited Kirkuk once a fortnight. My input was rarely needed. I was typically just given a summary of the plans that the lieutenant generals had already initiated. 
I loved the confidence, but in the middle of the night, I sometimes woke up in a cold sweat wondering whether that confidence could turn into a coup. I had made attempts to engage with the armed forces of India to induce some of the officers of that country's military to teach at Iraq's war college. I found India's military history in my timeline very interesting. Despite the poverty and corruption in that country and the track record of such nations, the Indian military never attempted a coup and stayed firmly within civilian control. I didn't have any data on the reason, but I suspected there was some indoctrination at the officer training level, and I wanted to introduce that at the earliest. But I was rebuffed time, and again, India was fairly cold to me. I suspect it was because Saddam had, before my transmigration, publicly supported Pakistan. But now it could have been because I was seen as cozying up to America, which during this time period was somewhat antagonistic towards India. My lieutenant generals had come with an ingenious plan. They rotated the squadron positions to blood the freshest recruits. There was a general feeling amongst my armed forces that this war against the Kurds was a lead up to a bigger fight with Iran. I was keen to dissuade that feeling, but the Ayatollah was making things hard by continuing to denounce me as the Satan's whore. For a learned man, he had quite a potty mouth. If I hadn't transmigrated, we would have been approaching the time when Saddam announced the war against Iran. But that wouldn't happen this time, and Iran didn't dare invade with America sitting at its border and saber rattling like a champ. Without the Iran-Iraq war there would have been no Iran-Contra scandal, and without that underhanded agreement there would have been no accord to liberate the 80-odd American embassy staffers who were still held hostage in Iran. America had already announced harsh sanctions against Iran, as I had predicted, and the whole world was abiding by them. I have no doubt there was major smuggling happening, but not through Iraq. The sanctions didn't help me now. Even if Iran reached out to seek our food supplies, I wouldn't anger America by accepting. If Iran offered to release the hostages to me in return for my intervention with America on the sanctions, then that would eventually lead to an American drawdown in the region, leaving me at Iran's mercy. No, the only option was to do nothing and hope that the hostage crisis and sanctions would extend for the better part of a decade. Khomeini I died of illness towards the end of a decade. His initial successor was a very liberal and judicious ayatollah called Montezeri. But in the wake of the Iran-Contra scandal, Khamenei's goons executed an Iranian cleric Hashemi for publicly opposing the Contra's deal with America. Hashemi and Montezeri were childhood friends, and the execution of Hashemi led to Montezeri piling into Khamenei's rule, which he compared unfavorably to that of the deposed Shah. So Khomeini essentially demoted Montezeri in favor of the much more hardcore comedy. It was an almighty mess, but see, without the Iran-Iraq war there would be no Contra's deal. So no execution of Hashemi, and with any luck Montezeri would become the absolute ruler of Iran by the 90s. Montezeri sounded like someone I could work with. And if I survived the 80s without war, I was confident that Iraq would become an economic miracle that my neighbors would aspire to emulate, not destroy. In this timeline, Jimmy Carter was flying high. He had successfully saved America's economy for the decade, achieved the unachievable by getting a major Arab nation to sign a peace treaty with Israel. He had even managed to spin the Argo caper as a personal success. Things were looking good for one-term Jimmy to become an above-average two-terms president. But that would possibly mean that Reagan might never happen. No war on drugs. No re -agonomics. I had no idea which butterfly's wings I had plucked and what size the resulting hurricane would be. Red Adair had managed to plug the oil fires in Kirkuk within two weeks, and I was proud that Iraq's oil output hadn't dipped at all during the period. My time was consumed by the spine of Iraq project and by the less heralded project of introducing the up or out policy in government offices. Kamal had taken to the latter project with gusto. He had formed tight bonds with some of the people we had met in our high-level visit to Singapore, and he had taken the initiative to initiate a sandbox project in Baghdad, which he was also overseeing. The past six months had transformed the capital city. Crime had significantly reduced as the police patrols were vigilant, on time, and by the books. There was no trash piling up on random street corners. The money from the Siemens project was being poured into the local economy, and several fancy restaurants had open doors. Kamal had mentioned that the queries from foreign investors and businesses had increased 66% on an annual basis. There was, of course, a cost to all of this. 
The initial estimate was that the wage bill for the Baghdad governorate had increased five-fold already. A big chunk of the oil money would be spent in the next few years as we introduced up or out to the rest of the Iraq, and the benefits would be delayed and intangible. How do you quantify the primary, secondary, and tertiary benefits of a more efficient and less corrupt state, especially without spreadsheet software? But that was the whole point. I had the money, the power, and the will to implement something I was convinced would be a game changer for the country. My hope was that the whole project would kickstart a virtuous cycle which wouldn't need Saddam eventually. But it wasn't up or out that caught the eye of the world. It was the spine of the Iraq project. There's one article I think in The Economist that concluded that the long-term economic benefits of the project would be enormous, and suddenly the world media was mad about Saddam. Siemens loved the publicity, and frankly, so did I. It was a big learning exercise for me. When the media decided it loves you, then it loves everything you do, even the failures. The global media began talking up my oil deal with the U.S., the spine of Iraq project, the failed goodwill mission to Iran, the drastic decrease in youth unemployment from 32% to 7%, and the generally cautious and nonviolent approach to the Kurdish rebellion. They even gave me credit for putting out the Kirkuk oil fires. My heart went out to Red Adair for the last one. Ambassador Dickman was a regular at the presidential palace now. He had become comfortable, almost too comfortable with me, and cracked wise and spoken formally, which I found weird, but didn't comment on. It was he who told me one evening when we're consuming copious amounts of delicious beer. You know Saddam. I heard an amazing rumor from a friend in New York. Oh. He nodded and grinned. It was about you. I quirked an eyebrow but didn't say anything. I was Saddam. I didn't gossip. Well, not anymore. Uh? It was about a certain Time magazine. Oh. Uh? -huh. Guess who's rumored to be the person of the year 1980? Anwar Sada. I asked immediately. He shook his, still grinning drunkenly. Red Adair. His grin slipped a bit, but he shook his head again. I gave it some more thought. Has to be Bob Paisley then. Who's that? No look at you. I heard that you're the top man in the running. I shrugged, but in my mind I was screaming in jubilation. My ugly mug might be on the cover of Time magazine. That was immortality in its own way. Yeah continued excitedly. I mean, once you get the formal invite to visit the White House, I think you'll be a shoe in Wait, what? Oh, crap. I wasn't supposed to tell you that. Will you keep that to yourself, old friend? A few days later, we received a missive with a formal invite to visit America on a diplomatic mission as the guest of the president and a request to address Congress. This was the biggest way that America could diplomatically honor a foreign leader. Was I excited? Yes. Was I scared? Yes. Scared because this visit would put me firmly in America's camp, eight years ahead of the collapse of the Soviet Union. The chief prosecutor presented himself before me in July 1980 and insisted rather sweatily that I go through the mountain of evidence against the monster Uday. The prosecutor and his team had taken a good six months to compile as much evidence as they possibly could. I objected that I wasn't a legal mind and I just wanted him to do his job properly not run everything by me. Please, sir, please. I have a family, the man said, sobbing lightly. Please just go through it. This was the downside of being Saddam. People were more terrified of disappointing me than of failing to do their job effectively. I gave in to his demands, and he went away looking like he'd been injected with morphine. But that's when the crap hit the fan. The evidence was compelling and sickening. I was surprised by how many young women, and some young men had agreed to be interviewed and to testify to Uday's brutality. It wasn't just victims, but witnesses as well. From my layperson point of view, it was a done deal. And then, the actual case appeared in front of court and the media got a hold of it. Just a few months previously, I had been the darling of the world media, the swashbuckling meritocrat transforming the ancient land of Mesopotamia into a new cradle of civilization. Now all the headlines proclaimed me, as the old Arab despot, one who brutalized his minor son and who encouraged criminal proceedings against minors. Right-leaning news outlets rallied behind me, something I wasn't necessarily keen on, but all the big guns trained their cannons on me. The outcome was depressingly obvious. I got a call from Dickman one fine morning. Your Excellency, I have some bad news from Washington. Oh. 
I was His Excellency again. No more first name basis. Unfortunately, this being an election year, Washington felt that it would be too risky to the president's re-election campaign to host you in America given the current climate. You mean that Iraq is prosecuting a heinous psychopath who happens to be my son? I asked sarcastically. It's more about the age, Your Excellency. Mr. Dickman, all nations around the world, including yours, prosecute minors in extreme cases where the crime is unconscionable and the minor depicts a level of understanding akin to an adult. I replied, I, eh. So would you not call this rank hypocrisy and cowardice? Dickman was silent. Well, in a sense, I was being incredibly hypocritical as well. I had mutilated the boy extrajudicially, but he wasn't about to point that out. It's all right, Mr. Dickman, I said finally allowing him to unclench. I don't wish to be a problem. Thank you for understanding, Your Excellency. But Mr. Dickman conveyed to Washington that I regard this as a diplomatic faux pas and frankly poor manners. I let the poor, sincere man go after that. I knew he'd be too embarrassed to pop around the palace for a while. I won't lie, I entered into a funk after the invitation to America was cancelled. I was really looking forward to getting out of Iraq for a while. If I had a choice to transmigrate anywhere based on geography, it wouldn't have been anywhere even remotely arid. Probably would have chosen Scotland or Bolivia or something like that. The East Coast in the beginning of fall would have been lovely. And I had read in my previous timeline that state guest dinners at the White House were culinary masterpieces. Damn it. September 1980. I moped around the palace for quite some time. I am not ashamed to say. Kamal dealt with me as best he could. One evening, though, Ahmed came to my office looking breathless. Sir, we've had contact from within the Kurdish camp. I immediately stopped what I was doing. Berzani. He shook his head. Not Berzani. I don't know who it is. They refuse to speak to anyone but you. It could be a fake call, I said, narrowing my eyes, leading us down a rabbit hole. He shrugged and looked helpless. It was my call, after all. No, I said after a while. This person needs to offer us some proof that he's a person of power. He doesn't just get to pick up the phone and talk to Saddam. On it, sir. We got word back a few days later. Whoever the John Doe was said that our troops stationed at what we called Hill 21 near Makmur, the border of the territory we held within Kurdistan, would have an encounter with a squad of Kurdish fighters. Instead of engaging with our troops, they would lay down their weapons and surrender. We were told to look at their arm for the green and white patriotic union of Kurdistan patch rather than the yellow sun of the Kurdish Democratic Party. There's dissension in Kurdish ranks as well. I remarked, Sir, I think humans are humans. There's dissent everywhere, replied Ahmed. A few days later, just like Deep Throat suggested, we got a report that a squad of three Kurdish fighters had surrendered at Hill 21 and bore the green PUK patches. This is Saddam, I said into the receiver one balmy Friday evening. My first conversation with Deep Throat. My name is Jalal Talabani, came the deep voice speaking impeccable Baghdadi Arabic. I head the PUK. I wish to discuss the possibility of bringing this war to an end. Jalal Talabani was an enigma. As an educated young man, he had joined Iraqi army and served alongside Sunnis and Shias with distinction. After the Baidh party came into power and began to suppress the Kurds, he drifted out of the mainstream and started the PUK as a separatist political party. Honestly, I was surprised to learn that there were multiple power centers amongst the Kurds. I shouldn't have been. I should have done my homework. But there you have it. The reason for dissent became clear early into our first conversation. We didn't want this war, he said, frustrated. But Barzani has this old tribal machismo mindset, like some kind of gangster. His cadres attacked Hirkuk. So why wait till now to reach out? You could have reached out immediately after the attack. It doesn't sound very good that you're reaching out when the Iraqi army is clearly in control of the situation. He scoffed. Sir, I think you're counting your chickens before they hatch. Also, we have been hostile with the Baathists for decades. In the beginning, there was huge popular support in Erbil for this war of independence as Barzani portrayed it. But now, I prompted. He hissed again in frustration. Do I need say it out loud? No, you don't, I replied. 
You're cut off from your main allies, the Iranians. We rule the skies. We're making strategic inroads hill to hill so that you can't even make use of your superior terrain knowledge. The writing is on the wall. He didn't say anything. And neither did I. Whatever the case may be, I know there is enough ground support to break ranks and negotiate with you for ceasefire. Why should I negotiate? I said in an impertinent, but it was the truth. I had them by the balls. I was six months to a year away from complete victory, with minimal loss of life, a buoyant and blooded military, and no war crimes that I could be hung on internationally. He said nothing. Call me when you think of something you can offer. I'm not going anywhere, I said before hanging up. Talibani called back a few days later. We can ensure lasting peace in Kurdistan. Oh ho, and how will you do that exactly? You don't even control all the Kurds now. And to be honest, once I win the war, I can simply lock up you and your fellow leaders up, disarm all cadres, and completely defong the region. I replied sarcastically. Talibani was quiet. Try again, I told him. He called again, a few days later, sounding defeated. I, I don't have anything to offer. That is the correct answer, Mr. Talibani. And now we are both in the right frame of mind to work together on agreement. I replied. I'm sorry, he asked, sounding confused. Don't be. I needed to speed up the process of cutting through all the bullcrap posturing. I like to negotiate from a position of honesty and frank assessment of the status. And the status is that the ball, both goals and the referee are in my possession. All you have a chutzpah, and that is also fast depleting. So you'll make me beg, is that it? He asked bitterly. Not at all, sir. I do want lasting peace. But I want you to understand that anything that goes in the agreement which makes you happy is a concession from my side, not something you have won. Otherwise, this whole exercise is pointless. Approach this as a petitioner and not an adversary, and you'll walk away very happy. There was silence on the other end for some time, followed by, So shall we begin? Let's. So tell me, Mr. Talibani, what would make the Kurds stop being so aggressive all the time? I asked. Independence. He replied instantly. I think you know that can't happen. And why not? He asked testily. Well, firstly, giving you independence would set a precedent for other communities to demand independence. Secondly, you've shown yourselves to be too close to Iran for my comfort. There is now a way for me to prevent an independent Kurdistan becoming an Iranian puppet. And lastly, I genuinely believe that the political end goal for humanity should be unity, not disintegration. Well, you asked me what would make us happy, and I gave you my answer. Okay, let's take another approach. Why do the Kurds want independence? He laughed. Are you joking? Where do I start? Start wherever you want. He sounded surprised, but then he cleared his throat and then said, Okay, well, Kurds should govern Kurds. Well, the herbal governorate is, and for a long time has been headed by Kurds. I replied, Yes, but they have no real power. Power to do what? Let's see. The revenues from the oil in our land. Most of it was taken by the Baathists and used to improve Sunni areas. You did it yourself, in fact. I couldn't deny that. Premi, Saddam had in fact done that, but in most countries around the world, the rich regions fund the poorer regions. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Well, we're hardly richer, are we? You took from the poor and gave to the less poor. Well, there's no way a natural resource like oil can be given solely to the region it was taken from. That doesn't happen anywhere. It makes no sense. Even if you became independent, you would use the oil from the oil field regions to develop the regions with no oil fields. This argument would continue to add infinitum. Well, he said after a while, at least the people who work in the Kurdish oil fields should be Kurds. I can agree to that, I replied. I mean, that's what's happening anyway. Except for the spine of a rock project, all other major resources-based companies in the country have been instructed to give first preference to locals. It would be needed to be written in the agreement. Sure, I replied. A region including Kirkuk, he said quickly. Absolutely not, I replied with a hint of anger. I advise you again, Mr. Talibani, don't test my patience. I can simply end this call and continue to defeat you on the ground. The discussion after herbal is rubble would be very different, 
I assure you. Okay. Then just within the herbal governory. Hmm. Sir, we would also need some assurance of the oil revenue being used for curds, he continued, sounding meager. Hmm. I suppose what I can agree to is that whatever share of the national budget is set aside for the governorates will be allocated based on proportion of population rather than based on discretion. That would put all Iraqi citizens on an equal footing. That sounds fair, he said, sounding surprised, although it would need to be in writing. Okay, what else? Policing. Governance also means that the policing should be done by Kurds. I can't agree to that, Mr. Talibani. I am introducing a meritocracy in this country, and that means no reserved spots based on identity. The state will only be represented by the best of the best. Sir, with respect, this will almost certainly become a potential time bomb for the next insurrection. There's too much bad blood. No, it doesn't serve the overall agenda, I replied. Sir, what I can do, however, I continued, interrupting him in the process, is ensuring that the chief of police for the governorate is a Kurd. That would mean that any junior policeman who steps out of line would have his career in the hands of a Kurd. I don't agree that that is the best option, sir, but it's workable, he said. And we went on and on. We went through each of his points. We talked about defense. A Kurdish militia would not be given command of the border with Iran and education, a governorate subject, but schools running on the national curriculum would be made available to students, but the curriculum would also offer Kurdish as a language of instruction. Furthermore, we had spent three hours on the phone when he finally said he had nothing more to add. I must say, Your Excellency, I had preconceived notions of how this call would go. I was hopeful of a surprise. But this has been extraordinary, he told me sounding chipper yet tired. Well, Mr. Talibani, until now it's been the sops I've been giving you. Now, we come to what I want. He was quiet. Clearly he had forgotten that this wasn't a negotiation. All Kurdish soldiers' fighters, militia will surrender their arms to the Iraqi army within a month of the date that this agreement is signed. Any Kurd found possessing arms after that period without authorization from the Iraqi government will be arrested and tried under terrorism laws with the death penalty on the table. Sir, I, I would advise you to shut up, Mr. Talibani, I said firmly. These are non-negotiable, and you do not want to piss me off. Kurdish fighters who surrender will be granted immunity for all previous attacks on the sovereign state of Iraq, except for those involved in the planning and execution of the attack on Kirkuk. He was quiet then until he spoke in a near whisper. Sir, the ones who planned that attack were on Berzani's side. You've been very frank and approachable during this discussion, so I'll be honest with you. Even if I manage to build consensus around this agreement, which is by no means assured, Barzani will simply proffer up some patsies for the crime. I'm aware of that, Mr. Talibani, I replied. And that is why we won't simply accept whoever you give us. No, sir. The agreement will be contingent on the Kurds conducting a thorough investigation into that act of terrorism, identifying all perpetrators, including the planners, gathering the evidence, and finally prosecuting the case successfully before the Supreme Court. Sir, I... I... Sir, how? I don't think. He floundered. Mr. Talibani, nothing worth doing is easy. This peace and reconciliation needs to work both ways. It was an unprovoked attack that killed civilians and threatened the heath and well-being of an entire city. Justice demands action, so mull it over. If you think you have any other options, you're welcome to try them. But I'm telling you, it's either this agreement or we come down very, very hard on all of you. Coming to an agreement with Talibani was the easy part. The tough part was convincing all Kurdish leaders to come on board. Unfortunately, across most of the world ideals of fighting till the last breath are vaunted and looking out for human lives is seen as cowardice. Just look at what happened to poor old Napoleon III, an incredibly brave and compassionate ruler derided for being a coward when he allowed countless families to get their fathers, husbands, and sons back. Within a few days of the Taliban and I are verbally agreeing on the terms of a ceasefire, we got reports that fighting had broken out inside herbal between the PUK and the KDP. I didn't hear from Talibani during this period, and after some waffling, I gave into the advice of my war council and ordered our army to advance rapidly. The aim was to use the infighting to make rapid inroads and tighten the circle around herbal further. It was a whitewash, 
We took hill after hill. Our squads even encountered firefights between the different Kurdish factions at times and engaged the Yellow Patch KDP while ordering the Green Patch PUK to surrender their arms as per the agreement. On September 25th, Talibani called when I happened to be sitting with my war council. Mr. Talibani, I worried that you had been killed. He sounded exhausted. Sir, I nearly was. So many times. Well, I'm glad to hear that you've lived to fight another day. Please tell me what the status is. Sir, we need your help. We, the PUK, control most of the city, but the KDP fighters have managed to encircle us. We're hemmed in, and they have the only supply line remaining into Iran. My war council began furiously discussing this before I held up a hand to silence them. Mr. Talibani, how can we help? Sir, air support would be most welcome. Air support? I'm not sure how you mean, Mr. Talibani. We haven't bombarded civilian centers throughout this insurrection. I don't intend to start now. He hissed in frustration. The only other thing I can think of is if the Iraqi army could break the siege or at least create an opening for the PUK fighters to break out of the encirclement. Hmm. That could work, I said, thinking fast. Foud was nodding furiously and giving me the thumbs up sign. But our troops are still far away from Herbal. And I don't want them to rush forward in case our own supply lines get stretched. I can give you the locations where our fighters had set up around the region, he said finally in a defeated tone. But please come urgently. The KDP is becoming desperate. They could hurt civilians wantonly to beat us. You give us a clean path to Herbal, and we'll be there before first light on the fifth day, I replied firmly. In the end, we reached Herbal in two days flat. We had most of the city surrounded, and were in control of most of the Kurdistan region, except for a sliver that extended east into Iran. Breaking the outer circle of KDP line was extremely easy. Our troops literally picked the fighters off from a distance. The panicking KDP ran helter-skelter into Herbal proper, where they were overwhelmed by the much more numerous PUK fighters. And so my army camped outside Herbal as we waited for the next step. Talibani's call came two days after we had reached Herbal. Sir, thank you so much for your assistance. Is the army not going to enter Herbal? Mr. Talibani, I said, the time has come to implement the first stages of the agreement. All PUK fighters will need to leave the city from the West Gate only and surrender all arms to the Iraqi army. Once you have personally confirmed that all armed Kurds in the city have surrendered, only then will the army enter Herbal and conduct a thorough comb through of the city. If we discover any armed fighters or unemptied weapons caches, we will take it as a repudiation of the agreement. Do you understand? Yes, sir, he replied in an exhausted voice. Why don't you take a few days to ensure that you have the city in hand? My army can continue to camp outside until then. A few days later, I was standing within the Herbal Citadel, the oldest part of the city, on a hastily constructed parapet next to Jalal Talibani, the interim governor of the region. My danger sense was higher than it had been in a year, and I was crapping myself internally. In the presence of a packed civilian crowd and some media, we announced the signing of the September Agreement, bringing an end to the hostilities. There was scattered applause in the crowd, which heartened me. I had been expecting to have shoes chucked at me. In a sign of how fickle the world media is, I went from being a demon to the poster child of progress. Media outlets, including the brand new cable news network, hailed a new era of peace in Iraq and the actions of the Iraqi army, which had avoided any direct civilian casualties during the hostilities and very few military losses as well. It was rather a bloodless coup. What I was very pleased about was that the whole escapade left Iran frothing as their proxy war in Iraq came to an abrupt end. Not everything went to plan, however. My grandiose idea of having the Kurds prosecute their own people who had formulated and executed the attack in Kirkuk failed on arrival. We all knew that Masood Barzani was behind it, but the man and his entire tribal family escaped to Iran long before the final battle of Erbil. Nonetheless, I insisted the trial go ahead even though the accused were not present in person. To their credit, the Kurds investigated and prosecuted the affair thoroughly. There were reams of evidence based on which not only did the Supreme Court convict the missing accused, but we also forwarded the information 
and evidence to Interpol, who issued red corner notices for the Barzani network. Oh, and in the meantime, Uday was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. No one gave a shit except a few catty news outlets and his mother, who took to wearing black, as Le Parisian reported. June 1981. In my original timeline, Jimmy Carter, incumbent U.S. president, went up against Ronald Reagan, a B-movie star prone to gaffes, for re-election to the American presidency. Due to multiple foreign policy debacles and a country mired in memories of stagflation and possibly because of a disastrous televised debate, Jimmy Carter ended being a footnote in American history. In this new timeline, he had just secured America an extremely beneficial economic deal that was already bearing fruit as domestic inflation plummeted and the private sector went into investment overdrive. Iran had still taken American civilians hostage, but instead of the empty posturing of the previous timeline, in this one American warships had already flooded the Gulf of Hormuz and American troops were at the border of Iran thanks to America's new friend in the region. Me. So, there was no October 1980 debate debacle, and Jimmy Carter won by re-election, by a landslide. That fact gave me nightmares. When it was just Iraq's future that I was affecting, it felt small, almost like a game. But the course of the world was going to change drastically, and I was going to lose my advantage of foresight. With the Kurdish affair settled and the eastern border silent as Iran grappled with international condemnation and economic sanctions, it felt like I'd taken several bottles of Valium. My stress levels came down to normal after years. In March 198.1, I got a surprise as the Americans rekindled their interest in inviting me to Washington as President Carter's first state guest after re-election. I was churlishly thinking of declining, but Kamal reminded me to keep my objectives in mind. So I ultimately accepted. Being honored in the White House is a whole thing, and it kind of requires a female companion to have any kind of impact. I did not have a wife, nor had I had a chance to find any new romantic partners because of statecraft. So I decided to co-opt Saddam's daughters as my official guests, as they would be in their summer holidays. They had also complained that they didn't want to spend their holidays in France with their mother, who had grown to become sullen and vindictive after Uday's sentencing. They loved the whole guest of honor thing. They had never been to America before and were astounded by the vastness of the place. We received the full shebang in terms of military welcome and all after we stepped off our plane onto DC's tarmac. They were enthralled. I'll be honest, I had always found the White House to be extremely tacky. The whole DC government area was modeled on ancient Rome. Imagine your neighbor coming into money and deciding to do up his house like what he imagined a thousand-year-old monarch lived like on another continent. Yuck. But the girls loved it. The Carters were extremely affable. Jimmy was a gem. He had some pretty poor advisors in my opinion, but the man himself was like a stereotype of a humble, small-town, good, O.L. American farmer. His wife Rosalind took to Saddam's daughters immediately and extended genuine motherly affection to them within minutes of meeting them. I was thankful to her for that. They had begun to get on my nerves as we flew over Syria. We did the whole thing dinner thing in tuxedos with the rich and famous of the East Coast toasting me and my daughters. It was lavish and entertaining. But what was more fun was the mingling session before dinner, where Jimmy introduced me to the who's who of American industry. What I learned from that session was that there was a tremendous demand to invest in Iraq. After all the shenanigans were completed, Jimmy led me to the private lawns behind the main building, where a table and some comfortable chairs had been set up. This was going to be the meat of the whole trip, at least from his perspective. It would give him a chance to assess me. Your Excellency, I believe that you are partial to a certain beer belonging to our neighbors up north, he said, calling for a waiting server who brought me an ice-cold Molson. I nodded and smiled genuinely. It was a balmy evening, and I'd refrained from eating much. A Molson sounded perfect. This is delightful, Mr. President, but I insist that you call me Saddam. If we waste time and words calling each other excellencies and Mr. Presidents, we will not be able to speak frankly like two men. Jimmy chuckled and nodded appreciatively. A man after my own heart. I hate all the formality myself. If you can't call a man by his name, how will you ever get to know him? We sat in companionable silence for a while. I sipped on my Molson and him on a lemonade. I have a good feeling about the coming few years, he said finally, looking off into the distance. 
A new era of engagement with the Middle East and Central Asia, especially with Iraq, as a key partner. Hmm. He looked at me. You don't agree? I shrugged. Who am I to disagree, Jimmy? Your country is the most powerful nation on the planet. Jimmy chuckled. I think the Soviet Union would dispute that. You know better than me that internally they're in trouble. People always think that what has been will continue, as is ad infinitum. And then when things change suddenly, they become catatonic from shock. The Soviet Union won't survive this decade. Wow, he said, taking a sip. That's quite a prediction. I shrugged again, but I am keen on hearing your thoughts. I truly value this new partnership, he prompted. I turned to look at him, stare him in the eyes, and saw the earnestness. Then I got up, twisted my chair to face him, and sat down looking at him intently. You and yours see the world as blue versus red, communism versus democracy. But the West and the Soviet Union make up a minority of humanity put together. You're missing the forest for the trees. He also awkwardly shifted his chair to talk to me better. I'm sorry, I truly don't follow. Afghanistan, I said simply. It was his turn to shrug. What about it? This is sincere advice from a nominally Muslim Arab ruler. Do not get involved with the Mujahideen. Who says we're involved with them? I click my tongue. Jimmy, you said we could speak frankly. Now you're insulting me. He held his hands up in apology. You're right, you're right. I'm sorry. But why shouldn't we get involved with the Mujahideen? Because you don't understand them. You don't understand Islam. You've convinced yourself that you're halting communism by supporting freedom fighters. But they don't see you as friends. What do they see us as? The great Satan. His hands in every pocket. Disrupting every life. Taking things that don't belong to him. Jimmy laughed, but without humor. Come on. That's just the ramblings of a madman. I shook my head. The Ayatollah was just putting into words what many Muslims already believe. They see a fundamental difference in Western culture and their culture. Jimmy looked perplexed, but why? We offer freedom and progress and individual liberties. We don't push our faith on anyone. We're secular. I shook my head again. I know that. But the man on the street hears differently from his imam or mullah. They tell him that your women are sluts and your men are corrupt animals. That you have no morals and that you don't follow any god, let alone Allah. That you are driven by greed. Jimmy looked furious. That is outrageous and slanderous. I nodded, but that is what they believe, and the Mujahideen are the worst of them. They will commit any crime and tell themselves it's in the name of Islam and in the name of Allah. They'll bring chaos and destruction to your doorstep. Well, I hate to say it, but if they do, we'll rain hellfire down on them, he said resolutely. Ow, what? I shifted slightly in my seat. If a sharply dressed man in a suit leaves a briefcase full of explosives in Grand Central Station, how will you find him, let alone rain hellfire down on him? Now he looked perturbed. Asymmetric warfare. It's not guerrilla warfare. It's worse. It's something that will utterly terrify your population. And you'll be able to do nothing about it. We sat in silence for another 15 minutes as I finished my drink. And he sat there stunned. But we're helping them, he said weakly. And they're just using you, I replied. It doesn't make sense. Why would they hate us? Are you serious? I asked. Israel, Iran, the al sads But we're intermediators in Israel, he protested. It was my turn to chuckle. Are you serious? You're seen as the reason Israel continues to exist. You aren't seen as a neutral party. You're seen as a big bully who supported the country that caused the biggest disaster of Arab history. He sat stunned. As I left that night, I knew nothing would change. America would not believe me. February 1980, four Fazal Hamdani was sweating buckets as he sat at his desk in his plush office in downtown Baghdad. He had been the governor of Iraq's central bank for just over a year, during which time he had faced many nerve-wracking situations as he tried to do the impossible, combat wayward inflation while also reforming the most important monetary policy institution of the country. But today, today, he would learn the outcome of the Ombudsman General's investigation into a whistleblower's accusation of financial mismanagement at the central bank. 
the Ombudsman General, Ahmed Habib, commonly known as al Muparadi. He had been Saddam's right-hand man until 1981 as one of the leaders of the dreaded secret police. But in 1981, he was promoted to the now mythical role of Ombudsman General of Iraq, famous worldwide for being the highest paid civil servant of any country. In his role as OG, Ahmed Habib's sole task was to root out corruption in any public office in any part of the country. His compensation was in line with the enormity of his role and the need for complete transparency. Habib was perfect at it. He went about his job with surgical precision. One thing was clear about the new Iraq. It did not tolerate either corruption or incompetence in its government employees. Fazal Hamdani was an Iraqi Kurd. His family had fled Iraq when he was just a young man and settled in America, where he studied economics and eventually became a professor at the University of Illinois. His specialization had been monetary policy, and he had worked with the Fed and the Bank of England. But like all other Iraqi expatriates, he had not expected the Iraqi miracle that began in 1979 especially since nothing had changed regime wise to spur on. It was as if one fine day, Saddam woke up and just decided to become a human. But despite his wife's hatred of Saddam and Iraq because of her past experiences, he couldn't stop watching what was happening. He had been furious when the dictator signed over 10 years worth of oil to America at dirt cheap rates, sure that Saddam would funnel that money into Swiss bank accounts. But remarkably, the dictator used that money to expand infrastructure through the spine of Iraq project that Siemens completed in two years flat. The spine of Iraq was something that economists gushed over. It connected Mosul in the north to Basra in the south. The freight corridor conveyed oil to the ports and food and imported goods to all cities along its path. The opportunities were endless. And Saddam had demonstrated that when his government announced the opening up of special economic zones in and around Tikrit, surrounding the freight corridor. But what Fazal had found more astounding was the deliberate and relatively bloodless way in which the Iraqi army ended hostilities with the Kurds. A colleague of Fazal's had taken a trip to Iraq to study the impact of Saddam's up or out policy for government offices and came back excitedly sharing news that the policy could possibly change the way governments align their operations. That colleague had estimated that the policy unlocked a couple percentage points of real GDP just by increasing efficiency, and who knew what the long-term knock-on effects would be. When Jalal Talabani, former rebel and former governor of Erbil, took up the role of Minister of Finance for Iraq, Fazal had not paid much attention. And then one fine day Talabani called him and suggested that he come and take up the role of central bank governor. The massive government spending of the previous few years had spiked inflation in Iraq to an annual rate of 10%, putting a damper on the new miracle. Talibani had told Fazal that when the government insisted that the central bank take appropriate steps to combat the inflation, they found the personnel at the bank woefully incompetent. So the job was twofold, to combat inflation and to set up a new central bank that would play the role that such banks were meant to play in the economy of a developed nation. Fazal's wife had been extremely unhappy when he told her that he was seriously considering the job. There were far more economists in the world than central banks, and especially the idea of contributing to modernizing Iraq and leaving his impact excited Fazal like nothing else. But Fazal's wife, also an Iraqi Kurd by origin, hated the country for what it had done to her family. Nightly rows affected their home life. Ultimately, his wife had only given way when she realized how much the job would pay and when he promised her that he would head to Iraq alone and would make it clear to Talibani that he would only work as the governor for three years. He was paid a hell of a, a lot of money. There were no perks in the new Iraq, just straight cash. But Baghdad was a different Baghdad from what he had been told. Crime was down to negligible numbers, the streets were clean, and everything worked like clockwork. But he was expected to work hard and competently. And he did. His first act as the new governor was to hike interest rates significantly. It dampened the economic mood somewhat, but not for too long. There was just too much foreign investment in the SEZs to stop the foreign funds from flowing in. He worked day and night with little respite. It was hard, engaging stuff. Beating inflation hadn't been as difficult as restructuring the central bank. There simply wasn't enough good talent to fill all roles. So he had made calls to fellow Iraqi refugees and expats to entice them to return. In the hour or so of free time he got every day, 
he managed to marvel over some of the policies that Kamal Hanajijio, Saddam's chief of staff, had implemented. The SEZ policy was a work of art. There were very few outright restrictions or negative covenants. Instead, the whole thing was an intricate web of positive incentives driving interested parties toward the outcomes that the government clearly wanted. Fully local employment, higher proportion of women employed, skills training and transfer of technology, focus on the electronics, pharmaceuticals, heavy machinery sectors. But all the bonhomie had come to a screeching halt when he had received a call from Ahmed Habib that a whistleblower complaint had been received about corruption in the central bank. His wife had wept and cursed on the phone as he told her that al Mukbarati himself would be conducting the investigation. The whistleblower system was also an impressive design, despite how it could now hurt him. Whistleblower complaints were investigated, and if found to be true, the whistleblowers stood to earn millions of dollars as a reward. But if they were found to be false, the whistleblower would be investigated in turn, with a harsh jail sentence guaranteed if the complaint had been filed maliciously. In Saddam's words, murder destroys families, corruption destroys nations. If Fazal was implicated in corruption, he knew he would never see the light of day again. He had thought about fleeing, but he was just an academic, he didn't know how to arrange an escape. And he had done nothing wrong. Fleeing would shame him and his family forever. So he girded his loins and hoped for the best. After a month of interviewing the new and old central bank employees, Ahmed Habib was due to give his final decision today. And Fazal had not been able to work the entire day. He was sweating despite the pleasant winter weather. At 5 p.m., Ahmed Habib walked into Fazal's office. Fazal almost soiled himself. Al Mukbarati was a tall man with a ramrod posture. He was notorious for never smiling. He was carrying a blue file folder. Ahmed Habib walked up to Fazal's desk and stood there staring down at the central bank governor for a few moments. Fazal couldn't help but gulp audibly. Then Ahmed Habib chucked the file folder onto the desk and said, You run a tight ship. The investigation is complete. I found no evidence of truth to the whistleblower complaint. Relief, sheer relief, flooded through Fazal's body. He was going to go home and drink a bottle of whiskey to celebrate. That or sleep early. Ahmed Habib turned to leave, but Fazal just had to ask, Now what? Ahmed Habib paused. Now I investigate the so-called whistleblower. Fazal prayed for the man. March 1984 things were going relatively well for the first time in years. The country was at peace. Things were working like clockwork. The only sore point now was the rate at which my 140 billion in UST bonds was being burned. It's simple maths. The average government salary increased 250% over previous years due to up or out, but the overall manpower in government offices had only reduced by 25% so far. So the net effect was that my annual budget expenditure had increased just under 2x. That was quite a lot, and the shortfall had to be funded from the American deal money. The expenditure on construction projects was an altogether different matter. Once Siemens had finished the commercial part of the spine of Iraq, we had put out a tender for the passenger corridor. Siemens won again. Their bid for the passenger line was a lot less, but what took the cake was they proposed to set up train engine and bogey manufacturing hubs in one of the newer SEZs west of Baghdad, which was essentially an empty desert. In any case, Kamal had not so subtly suggested that I put the brakes on my grand plans, else we risked going bankrupt before the fruits of my earlier plans could be harvested. I begrudgingly agreed with him, but not before I got him to sign off on a slightly cheaper plan that had been on my wish list for a while. In my original timeline, the media had already become the most powerful tool on the planet. If you could control the message, you could control people's thinking. I had always been fascinated by the way the tech superstars of my time operated, the so-called Fong. If you looked at Google, for example, they offered a very powerful platform with a lot of additional services completely free of cost, such as the search engine, Android OS, Gmail, etc. At one point, Google had even planned to provide free Wi-Fi in underserved parts of the world using balloons. Philanthropic? Hardly. They had essentially tapped into the idea of network externalities. By bringing a huge number of people onto a common and free platform run by you, you skipped all the myriad rules of somebody else's game and basically became the rule setter yourself. 
the cost of providing that free platform was negligible compared to the profits to be earned in upselling to that huge captive audience. And the biggest benefit, once the audience had become used to and embedded with your platform, it would be very hard for anyone else to dislodge them. And that's how I came up with Operation Teletubbies, a free TV for every household in Iraq playing Saddam's chosen content all day, every day. 30 million people, so roughly 6 to 7 million TVs. Exorbitant? Hardly. A drop in the water, really. The bigger cost would be extending the existing cable network up and down the spine and to cities off the spine, like Herbal. Did I plan to play patriotic Saddam messages all day to brainwash the population like some crackpot East Asian despot? Hardly. But I would show what I wanted the people to get used to seeing. TV and movies have a great way of normalizing certain behaviors, not always for the good, but definitely something I plan to use. Part 2 involved using one of my favorite pastimes and something that kept a former empire culturally relevant, football. In my original timeline, I had seen the sheer soft power of the English Premier League and the goodwill it engendered worldwide. This was almost a decade before the formation of that league, and I planned to beat the Brits to it. Earlier in the year, I had roped an Iraqi legend Falah Hassan to become the new head of the Iraqi FA. As one of the few Iraqis who had played in a top team in Europe, he had a wealth of experience that we planned to exploit. In a meeting with the Council of Ministers, Fala and the McKinsey consultant who had been aiding him presented their plan for a new era of Iraqi football. Gentlemen and lady, Fala began by unveiling an exaggerated map of Iraq, highlighting the spine with dots along it representing the various existing football clubs of the country. Thank you for your time. I present to you the Iraqi Premier League for football. Nobody clapped. There was smoke and silence in the air. He cleared his throat and looked at me. I smiled encouragingly. He seemed to gain his confidence back and soldiered on. We have many divisions in our nation, but one thing we all love is football. Layla Al-Najafi snorted loudly and said, Speak for the men. Utter waste of time, like most of the things you'll do. All the men in the room shifted uncomfortably and avoided meeting her gaze. She was a chain-smoking 55-year-old native of Nejaf who had risen through a poor and patriarchal background to earn a degree in urban planning and architecture. I had placed her as my Minister of Urban Planning to plan ahead for the impending massive urbanization across the spine. I was incredibly impressed with the lioness. Kamal had suggested I was scared of her. I threatened to disappear his family. Right, yes, of course, Benabshin, Fala said, chuckling weakly. It still is the national pastime and well followed, although I can attest that the standard of football infrastructure in Iraq is quite a ways off that in Europe. Everyone around the room nodded. Fala looked sad, and rightly so. It was widely thought in Iraq that in his prime, he could have been amongst the best in the world. But the talent was wasted in Iraq. But we need not wait to catch up to Europe, he said, warming to his topic. We can leapfrog them. Imagine an Iraqi league with a quality better than anywhere else in the world. Even if no one else follows us, the Arab world itself has a similar population to Europe. Imagine all of them following Iraqi football closely. It starts with football, and then we become leaders of hearts and minds. He was laying it on thick, but he was getting nods and murmurs of approval from around the room. I wasn't sure how many agreed with the plan, and how many were in a state of awe to meet a footballing hero. Get to the plan already. I have actual work to do today, Layla said snappily. Fala coughed uncomfortably again and said, Yes, yes. So the plan is simple. An 18-team top league with the government graciously funding the total prize pool of $10 million every year. The participating teams would also get to keep whatever they make in actual ticket sales. This announcement set off a round of excited chatter around the room. $10 million as a prize pool wasn't that great, considering English Premier League teams shared about $2 billion a year in 2021. But for the time, and for the country, it was a huge amount. Even the bottom-ranked team would become suddenly very profitable. Hold on, hold on, said Jalal Talibani, wagging his cigarette in Fala's direction. Who decides the 18 teams of the league? Of course, he would be the one to bring that up probably worried that Herbal Sports Club would get gypped. The fact that the spine was only now being extended to Herbal was a sore point for him. He always convenient, forgot the war. That's a great question, replied Fala enthusiastically, 
probably thankful that someone other than Layla had spoken. In the first season, the top 18 clubs by revenue will automatically get to play. That sent a round of angry chatter. Please, gentlemen, please allow me to finish, Fala pleased, folding his hands together. The issue we have is that, unlike in Europe, we don't have an existing multi-level pyramid of teams across the country. Things are quite haphazard. It also doesn't make sense for a country of our size to make a new pyramid. So what we're proposing is that every year there will be a two-month period wherein a cup competition will be held on an open invitation basis for any team that wishes to join the league in the following season. The cup winner will automatically be included in the league, while the second to fourth place teams will have playoff games to determine the second side promoted. That smoothed some ruffled feathers in the room, including Talibani's. That sounds fair, he said. But tell me something. This 10 million prize pool is fine, but how will this tournament grow without additional sources of income? Another great question, sir. Fowler replied happily. I noticed that Talibani seemed pleased in spite of himself. Currently, with the president's incredible program to provide each household with a free TV, as well as the consumer transport corridor, we expect that domestic viewership and game attendance will ramp up exponentially. Later, when there is interest across the world to watch the league, the government will sell TV rights in interest to countries and has agreed to split the broadcasting revenues on a 50 colon 50 basis with the clubs. Another minister chirped up now. What about the national team? How does this plan affect our national team? I'm getting old, and I want to see us in the World Cup before I die. Fall a place to hand over his heart. That is my greatest wish as well, Minister. This program won't directly affect the Rocky national team in the short run. But in the next few years, because of the money in the sport, we can expect to see better youth players emerging and better training facilities. My personal hope is that by World Cup 90, if not 86, we'll see an Iraqi team on the biggest stage. If not, Mr. Hassan, I expect you to come out of retirement and start playing again, the same minister said loudly, setting off cringeworthy laughter in the room. Layla gave me the stink eye across the table, and I shrank into my seat involuntarily. April 1984, Dr. Ayan Ayub, nay Sebastian, stepped into the Baghdad heat and immediately dropped her sunglasses over her eyes. She was still getting used to the generally hotter and drier climate of the city. The locale, however, had been an unexpected surprise. She had managed to land a flat in a new construction near the Tigris and walking distance from the brand new outpatient center of Baghdad General Hospital. She loved walking to and from work every day, despite the heat. The hospital, overjoyed to have her service, had offered to provide her with a chauffeur-driven car, but she had refused. Baghdad was a city in flux, for the better, and walking through its streets made her feel like she was witnessing something bigger than herself. It felt like there was something new to see every day. A month after she took up the job, a brand new promenade had been opened up along the embankment of the Tigris. Licensed hawkers try to sell snacks and drinks to the exercise enthusiasts, couples and families that spent their free time relaxing in the wide expanse of the promenade. There was an energy in the city that she hadn't experienced in Turin. Turin had been fashionable and powerful and old. Baghdad was even older, less fashionable, but bursting with youthful excitement about building new things and doing things better. New towers and buildings were popping up around the city. But unlike the gleaming steel and glass building of the West, Layla al-Najafi the minister in charge of urban planning had laid down strict rules on building heights, construction materials, manner of construction. Local developers had whined and complained, but thanks to the Iron Woman's efforts Ion could see that the unique look of the city of Caliphs would be maintained for posterity. Ion stopped by a new corner cafe that had opened up a block away from the hospital. The young waitress Basma grinned when she saw the doctor. Good morning, Madam Doctor, the usual. I've told you so many times. Just Ion. Ion Mock scolded the young woman. Basma just chuckled at their oft-repeated conversation and went off in search of the Italian-style cappuccino that Ayan favored every morning. Basma didn't know it, but Ayan felt truly grateful towards her for helping her settle into her new life. When she had jumped head first into the new opportunity, she had only belatedly begun to worry about things like her accented and poor Arabic. But people like Basma had welcomed her with open arms. Some time ago, an unofficial call, 
had gone out into the world inviting expat Iraqis and their children to return to the country and contribute their skills. That was a romantic layman's way of putting what was effectively a desperate call for help to bridge the supply, demand gap in the labor market. But surprisingly, a lot of people of Iraqi descent had tentatively returned to plush jobs in the country. Common Iraqis called them the lost children of Iraq. Ayan had been surprised by the fondness that the locals had for the returnees. Basma had once explained that the Iraqi people had hope for a great future, but they needed help from outside to achieve it. They didn't trust foreigners, so they loved those of Iraqi descent who answered the call of the people. Very romantic and cliched stuff. But Ayan had been moved by it nonetheless. Coffee in hand, Ayan entered the modern new OPD center only to be greeted by a great hullabaloo. She paused for a minute to get her bearings, but she wasn't able to understand what had happened. Ayan, thank God you're here, a portly bearded man in a suit said as he rushed to greet her. This was Abdullah Rashid, the hospital administrator. It was a weird relationship. He was technically the CEO of the hospital, but she was a senior consultant doctor. She was more useful to the hospital than he was. But there had been no friction between them. He was a chubby, lovable man prone to anxiety and stress. What's going on, Abdullah? She asked in alarm. He looked to be almost in tears. The president. The president showed up in an unmarked car half an hour ago for a checkup. But there was no senior doctor available. Please, please go and do the checkup. President of what? She asked him in consternation. Of the country, dear lady. Of the country. There were security guards in black shades outside the examination room door. They stopped her by holding up a hand and then spoke into their walkie-talkies. Soon, another guard emerged from another corridor. This time, it was a female who led her to an used room and frisked her. All of this happened without any words exchanged. Ayan was becoming more and more nervous. How had she found herself in this position? Her mother and father had begged her not to take up this job. She should have listened. The male guards held the exam room door open for her and gestured for her to enter. Inside, she saw Saddam Hussein, president of Iraq, up close for the first time. Instead of the hairy, olives-wearing slob that she had seen on TV and newspapers, here was a Finnish, middle-aged, clean-shaven man with curly locks of hair, hunched in his chair and reading Mad Magazine. She cleared her throat to announce herself, but her voice still came out weird. A Mr. President, I am Dr. Ayyub. I'll be your doctor for today. She thought she sounded like a flight attendant. But Saddam looked up sharply and then quickly got rid of the magazine. He seemed embarrassed that she'd caught him reading a naughty comic. I'm sorry for the wait, she continued politely. He waves his hand. I showed up unannounced. You weren't to know. Well, shall we get started, she said, taking a seat behind the desk. He nodded and straightened up. I'm just here for my biannual checkup. He pointed to a file on the desk. My blood test results. She nodded and opened up the file, feeling herself relax. Doctoring was something she could do. After a few minutes, she said, Well, the results look quite promising given, Air, eh? that I'm a middle-aged man, he prompted with smile. She felt her face flush, and anxiety filled her. Would she be carried away by the moop brat for pointing out Ayel Duce's age? Ah, uh, I was going to say, given your lifestyle, she said lamely. Oh, he asked quirking an eyebrow. And what do you know about my lifestyle, doctor? She felt completely scared and flustered. I'm sorry. I, ah. Uh. He snorted. Saddam snorted. Relax, doctor. Contrary to popular belief, I have a sense of humor. And doctors don't get carted off to the torture chamber for pointing out my age. She gaped at him. What was happening? Was Saddam Hussein teasing her? Yes, well, Erm, the only concern is the elevated blood pressure, any particular stresses you're experiencing? He snorted again and looked incredulous. Um, I'm the leader of the nation. Where do I begin? Inflation, foreign ambassadors, electricity brownouts. I'm also terrified of my Minister of Urban Planning, Layla Al-Najafi. Ayan exclaimed, forgetting herself for a minute and gushing, I would love to meet her once. Don't tempt fate, doctor, Saddam replied with a surly tone. Right. Um, well, I'll prescribe some medicine for that. 
You'll need to take it daily for a few months, but it will help with the blood pressure. I can have beer with it though, right? He asked. No, I'm afraid. No alcohol with the medicine. What? He exclaimed. No beer for a few months. Lady, you're killing me. She stared in surprise. This was the dreaded Saddam. He was like an overgrown child. Let's move to the physical exam. Can you please take a seat on the examination table and remove your shirt? He did so. And she was surprised that instead of a protruding tummy, like many middle-aged Arab men tended to have, he had a lean, if somewhat loose torso. <sighs> he exclaimed when she put the stethoscope near his heart. He glared at her. That's really cold, you know. It was her turn to snort. What? He asked curiously. You're not what I was expecting, Mr. President, she replied. Saddam. What? Call me Saddam. If anyone has the right to call me by my name, it's my doctor. Okay. And what were you expecting? A fat, crazy old Arab dictator? He asked with a grin. She laughed in spite of herself. Don't know what I expected, but certainly not an overgrown baby. His eyes widened, and his mouth opened and closed like a fish's. God, was she flirting with Saddam? How absolutely bizarre. She asked him to put his shirt back on, and then they sat back on either side of the desk as she began writing down her observations and prescription. It's weird that I'm writing down a prescription, she murmured. Why is that? You're the leader of the country. You don't exactly need to show a prescription to order whatever medicine you need, she replied. Lex Imperium, Saddam replied softly. She looked up. What's that? The law is king, he replied. The hardest thing for me is to not put myself above the law. Every time I do that, it dilutes the rule of law. She was surprised by his candor. Why do you speak Arabic with an Italian accent? He asked her as she was making the final illegible scribbles on her notepad. She felt her face flush in embarrassment at the question. But when she looked up, he was looking curious, not teasing. I grew up in Italy, she said. But you're of Iraqi descent. She nodded. Yes, my mother and father were both Iraqis. They left for Italy when I was a baby. Oh, so you're a Ritterni, he said. I think it were called the Lost Children, she replied cheekily. But he looked confused. That's what the people on the street call us. You should get out more, Mr. President. He made a face. Lost children, how cringe. She laughed again. You're really not what I expected. He smiled. She handed him the notepad and explained how and when to take the medicine. He thanked her genuinely and made to leave. She felt a small twinge of disappointment. This had been the first time she'd had such an easy conversation in a long time. Would people believe her when she told them? She would never tell anyone. Some memories were to be treasured alone. He had stopped at the door. If you're available on Sunday, I would love to host you at the presidential palace for brunch. Not getting an immediate response from her, he fidgeted. I enjoyed our conversation. It's not very often I get to joke around. I'd love to just talk with someone. She nodded. I hope you'll send me a chauffeur-driven limo, being a dictator and all. He laughed uproariously as he left. Kamal Hanajijio was a happy man. He had become steadily happier over the previous few years. Once upon a time, he had begrudgingly taken up a role as the bodyguard and assistant of a violent Sunni Arab dictator as a form of self-sacrifice on behalf of his community. After all, in the Middle East if you were a minority, especially a religious one, you needed a strong patron within the establishment to survive the inevitable aggression that would be directed at you. But Kamal's boss had changed, and it hadn't been a process. He had seemingly changed overnight. From an overconfident jingoistic, violent bastard, he had transformed into a calculating, sharp visionary with anxiety levels that sometimes skyrocketed. Kamal had noted the change, but had never raised the issue with anyone out of a sense of self-preservation. Now he didn't care to. He prayed that whatever screw had gotten loose in Saddam's head never got tight again. Actually, subconsciously, Kamal considered Saddam to be two separate people pre-1979 and New Saddam. Kamal thought of New Saddam with a lot of affection, though it was never spoken. What truly made him happy, however, was the work of administration. As the president's chief of staff, his role was large and varied. He effectively served as the arm of Saddam, but over the last year and a half, he had increasingly become Saddam's brain as well. 
he was utterly grateful that Saddam trusted him with some of the biggest decisions that impacted Iraq. And for the first time in many, many years, he was proud to be Iraqi. There was an undercurrent of patriotic feeling in the country. The entire land was buzzing about what they were accomplishing together. Only when Saddam had started to trust Kamal with handling entire projects by himself, did Kamal realize just how many things it was possible for a human to think about at one time. One minute, he could be interceding with Layla al-Najafi on behalf of the tearful curator of the newly instituted UR Archaeological Park, while elsewhere, he was overseeing the ambitious deployment of five million footballs across the length and breadth of the country to get children more passionately acquainted with the sport. Sometimes there would be unanticipated land holdings obstructing the planned path of the passenger rail corridor, while other times an oil well in the Ramela field could have collapsed. He loved it. He was also happy for Saddam. He felt proud that he could take some of the load off of the president's shoulders. Saddam looked like a man reborn. He had even made a friend, a lost child doctor working at Baghdad General. Kamal was happy for Saddam and his new friend. He personally didn't find Dr. Ayan Ayyub attractive. She was too hard-faced and angular, but knew Saddam clearly enjoyed her company immensely. It was all above board. The president would invite his friend over for brunch on Sundays, and they would simply lounge around near the pool or on the first floor veranda overlooking the Tigris. Kamal thought their play dates were very cute and invited his friend Ahmed to surreptitiously spy on the budding couple. That's her. Kamal whispered, peeking out from between the curtains. What have you found out about her? Ayan Ayub, previously Ayan Saviastom, born outside Baghdad but brought up mainly in Milan. Speaks Italian, English, and accented Arabic, Ahmed replied gruffly, but he also looked curious and excited. They watched as Saddam dropped a dollop of gravy onto his pants and then wiped furiously at the stain with a tablecloth, while Ayan laughed uproariously at him. That stain will bother him for the rest of the day, Kamal noted, clicking his tongue. Should I go and offer a change of clothes? H-N-N-N-N. Just let them be. He looks happy. Ahmed replied. Hmm. Replied Kamal non-committally. By the way, are her parents Sunni or Shia? Mother is Shia. Father is Sunni. Oh my word. It's like she's purpose-built for him. Kamal said wondrously. Maktoub. A few days later, Kamal met with Saddam in the president's office. Kamal had been working long hours to make sure that a gas pipeline deal with the tiny nation of Qatar had been signed. Over the previous few months, the power ministry had warned that personal and industrial consumption of power in the country was shooting up and that, as per the extant generation capacity, most places in Iraq would see brownouts by the year end and large-scale blackouts the following year. They had all scrambled to solve this massive issue. The power ministry had suggested oil-based power plants as the most feasible solution, but Saddam had refused saying that oil was meant to be an export commodity only and that using it domestically for power was a waste. Instead, he had demanded that Iraq purchase natural gas from the relatively oil-poor Qataris. The waters were muddied by the fact that an underwater pipeline that the Qataris had agreed to share the cost of would fall within the territorial waters of Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, who both had to be encouraged by Big Brother America to agree to the construction of the pipeline. It had been a tough negotiation, but Kamal was very pleased that it was over. The pipeline would be finished by the end of the year, laid by an American company as recompense for getting involved with Bahrain and the Saudis. The new massive capacity power plant in southern Iraq would also be completed by then, ensuring that for at least the next decade of economic expansion, Iraq's energy needs were secured. The entire time Kamal had been summarizing the update for Saddam, he had felt that something was wrong. Saddam looked grim, and didn't seem to be listening, just nodding from time to time. Sir, Kamal began. What's the matter? You seem troubled. Saddam didn't speak for a moment, and then looked seriously at Kamal. Something is wrong, Kamal. I have a feeling that something is going to happen. Kamal simply nodded. Over the past few years, he had gotten used to new Saddam's instincts. These instincts only showed up from time to time, but they generally turned out to be right. What should we do? Saddam sighed. The issue is who we can trust and how much of an alarm to raise. Is there some Iraqi suspect of acting against you? Kamal asked incredulously. There was nary an Iraqi who had a bad thing to say nowadays about the regime. Saddam looked at him. I don't know. 
But yes, some internal action is where we're weakest. They sat in silence until Saddam's posture changed. Let's take this thing head on. I want you to get in touch with Mr. Shaw. Request American help in monitoring Iran, Lebanon, and Syria. See if there are signs of their military mobilizing or their air force doing more frequent sorties. And put the Baghdad chief of police on alert to keep an eye out for suspicious actors. I also want concrete blocks in the widest thoroughfares, ready to be deployed a moment's notice. And lastly, I want fortifications around the palace. Surely, sir, no one would be foolish to attack us here directly. Kamal said in alarm. Saddam shook his head. This is exactly where they would attack. For all intents and purposes, I am the Iraqi state for now. If they take me out, they take Iraq. Kamal's tiredness had disappeared as he made to leave the office. Adrenaline was coursing through his veins. He would oil his firearm today and make sure it was functioning. Saddam called out as he reached the door. Kamal, when you make an escape plan for your family, make one for Ayan as well. I don't know when exactly it started. It was like white noise. In normal times, you wouldn't even notice it. Maybe in one particular moment of hyper-awareness, you might be lucky enough to notice that the white noise of that moment didn't sound like it used to. But even if you did notice, you'd dismiss it and go about more important things. Slowly, slowly the tone of the white noise would keep changing until one moment of one day you would realize that there was something seriously wrong. That's what my danger sense had become. I don't know when it started to grow, but it grew so imperceptibly that only when I started to be antsy, paranoid and irritable all the time, did I stop to think that perhaps there was something wrong. The infinitesimal growth in my danger sense and the way it had suddenly become so prominent like a headache scared me more than a sudden spike, like when I had been shot would have. It was insidious and spoke of something much more dangerous. When I realized the problem, my mind immediately went to Iraq's neighbors. Iran was my prime suspect. I had semi-ignored them given their problems with the U.S. and sanctions and the fact that a U.S. military base sat near my southern border with them. But now the hostage crisis had been resolved through back channels, and the U.S. had reduced its manpower at the base and in the Gulf of Hormuz. Iran could have been secretly preparing for war, and I would have completely missed it while getting involved in my grand plans for the improvement of Iraq. But Lebanon was also a possibility, as was Syria. The whole mess with Israel had become murky and entered the modern era with Hamas and Hezbollah i.e. non-state actors becoming more pressing concerns than their host states themselves. Sometimes the reasoning behind these groups lashing out was obscure and known only to the groups themselves. Hezbollah was also closely tied to Iran's Republican Guard, so a double threat. My danger sense indicated a threat specifically targeted at me. I almost completely dismissed an internal threat. After all, if the internal threat was to grow, it would have done so many years ago. Now the country was in the middle of an economic miracle that was not leaving behind any particular community. It could have been Ion. I'll admit that I was a little ashamed that I thought of it, but in this murky era, it would have been foolish of me not to consider it. Old Saddam or his bi EDH party allies could have brutalized her family, and I would not even know it. Maybe she was here to get me, but I suppose that was unlikely. I had made contact with her, not the other way around. It would have to be the mother of all coincidences that the target initiated contact with the assassin unknowingly. The vagueness of my soul's superpower frustrated and scared me. Imagine having a voice in your head like a klaxon constantly shouting, You're effed. You're effed in a monotone, but offering no further clue. My days and nights were filled with paranoia. Escape was not an option. The Iraq project had become my baby. I was doing good work, fighting the good fight against entropy and chaos. I instructed Kamal to heighten the security and alertness within Baghdad and within the presidential compound specifically. I also decided that the biggest land-based threat would be heavy armor, so I had concrete blocks placed strategically around the city just in case. Kamal was my greatest ally in this. I was glad that he took my fears seriously. He oversaw the modification of the presidential palace for a possible assault. Luckily, Old Saddam had always been a paranoid bastard and had built hidey holes and bunkers throughout the compound. But I didn't want to hide, like Old Saddam. It would serve no purpose. If I had to be attacked, I had to fight back, otherwise I might as well flee. This was no country for weak men. 
I was terrified. My hands shook all the time, and I had a big balloon in my chest which prevented my words from coming out loudly enough. We had sandbags propped up at various points across the palace, as well as barbed wire fencing. The palace guard commander was pleasingly tactically minded and close-lipped. He didn't question Kamal or me, but he added valuable insight, like creating a maze of choke points throughout the compound. The feeling grew day by day. It was picking up steam, I could tell. Things were coming to a head. I practiced my shooting in the basement shooting range every night when most of the palace staff was asleep. I didn't want to alarm anyone, and I was ashamed of how much my arms shook as I held the rifle or pistol. I could let Saddam's instincts take over, but although it stopped the shaking in my arms, his instincts were too macho and suicidal. The man wasn't an able tactician, as his constant losses in war proved. If I were to be attacked, I would need my wits about me. I had become a decent shot by myself, but no plan, as they say, survives enemy contact. I tried to carry on my day-to-day -day work. It was actually possible to do so. There was just so much to do that the anxiety would inevitably fade into the background, only to return full force in the liminal moments. And then one day the feelings reached a crescendo as Kamal rushed into my office, consternation writ on his face. Lieutenant Call Suller reported in from near Kirkuk. He began. Lieutenant General Faud Karim took command of a division of 5,000, including an armored division, and peeled away from Jalila two days ago. Yesterday the division became unreachable. He thought to report the anomaly today, just in case. I felt like all the strands of worry in my mind resolved themselves instantaneously. Coup d'état. It was a body blow that hit my heart and left me despondent. How could I have gotten things so incredibly wrong? I had mistrusted the army for a while, but never Foud. Foud who gladly accepted the command of Saad Hashmi, an obviously less competent army man. Foud, who was so strategically brilliant. Foud, who was forward-thinking and who I intended to be the next army chief. A cold sweat washed over me as I stared past Kamal blankly. Sir, sir. I came to, as Kamal was shouting at me, looking alarmed. Sorry. I said weakly, without offering an explanation for disappearing in front of his eyes. What's wrong, sir? I rubbed my face and slapped my cheeks hard. The time for self-flagellation was later. I had to act now. I had a short window. Jalila was less than two days away, especially on the brand spanking new highways that I had had constructed. Foud was probably already nearing Baghdad. I stood up violently. All my actions were harsh. I had to forcibly dispel my depressed ennui. It's an attempted coup, I told Kamal shortly, opening my drawer and retrieving my Desert Eagle pistol. I bought it because of my favorite movie, Snatch, but it turned out to be a powerful weapon in its own right. What? What? Why? Kamal spluttered. I went up to him and grabbed both his shoulders. Kamal, my friend, we've been preparing for this. Nothing changes. We need to act now and think later. He nodded firmly. He looked terrified as well. Get in touch with the police chief. Tell him what's happening and instruct him to arm his men. Martial law is in place and he needs to put those barricades up ASAP. Kamal nodded. Also get in touch with Ahmed. We need to know which parts of the armed forces are still with us. I was standing on the terrace of the tallest wing of the palace. It was early evening but the usual sounds of the city had vanished. At least the police was now competent. I didn't know if they would stand with me or with Foud when the time came, but at least they got civilians into cover. I heard the first shots ring out from the east across the Tigris. The light was low enough that I could see the path of the tracer bullets. My thoughts went eye on. I hoped Kamal had gotten her evacuated. I suspected not. She was a hard woman. She wouldn't leave her patience to the mercy of God knows what. Kamal and the palace guard's commander, a Turkmen named Osman, joined me on the parapet. Osman handed me my AK-47 rifle. As I shouldered the rugged but average Soviet assault rifle, I briefly regretted not purchasing the M-16 from the U.S. I had spent the last couple of years trying to spur indigenous arms and ammunition production so that we didn't fall into a spiral of exorbitant defense imports. At least Foud's soldiers wouldn't have an equipment advantage. 
small mercies. There wasn't much to be said. The three of us knew that things were in a mess. I didn't know how long the barricades would hold back the armor division. Once the tanks were through, they would just stroll through town. This was an herbal where each citizen was ready and armed. Even if the tanks were stalled, Foud had 6,000 men, and despite our defensive installations, the sprawling palace grounds weren't meant to withstand siege. In fact, we were hemmed in because of the Tigris on our back. It would be a slaughter once the division broke through the barriers. I lit a cigarette and took a deep puff. Then I passed it to Kamal, who huffed and passed it to Osman. Bullets continued to bite through the dusk sky. Osman was scared. It had been years since he had seen active combat. He felt on edge, but scared as well. He didn't recall feeling scared when he had been a younger man serving in the army. He wasn't scared for his own safety, but rather for his young family. His wife and two girls would be left all alone if he perished today. If he was sure that Saddam would survive the night, then the fear would have lessened. He knew that his boss would take care of his widow and children. But none of that was certain now. Random rounds of gunfire still echoed out in a staccato in the Baghdad night. The nights were starting to get warmer, but not uncomfortably so. The palace guard numbered 30, all arrayed around the most likely point of entry, the southeast gate of the compound that was closest to the Republic Bridge which traversed the Tigris and led to East Baghdad. Osman had taken a punt that the invading force would take the shortest path to the compound, which also happened to be one of the few thoroughfares and bridges wide enough to allow tanks to cross unimpeded. Saddam and Kamal Gigio had joined them at the gate, much to Osman's protests. Sir, you are not safe here. We can't protect you while also pushing back the invader. Commander, nowhere is safe if we don't manage to keep the traitors out. And I don't want you to focus on protecting me. Focus on fighting back. The only way I survive is if we win. Saddam said all of that in an even and calm tone, and Osman was thankful for it. Many of his subordinates were young men who would be seeing action for the first time. In his past army life, Osman had seen what a jittery participant could do to the morale of a squad before a firefight. So he reluctantly acquiesced to Saddam's presence. Not that he had a choice. There was silence amongst the gathered men as they peered into the deserted Yaffa street for signs of the assailants. Five minutes passed, and then ten, and then twenty. Do you think the police might have been able to hold them off? Kamal whispered. With handguns, scoffed Saddam. I think not. Another five minutes passed, the tension not giving way in the slightest. Then Osman fell a tap on his shoulder. Commander, I've had a thought, began Saddam. This was no time for niceties. So Osman just grunted. Those building lining Yaffa. Saddam pointed to the four, five-story residential buildings that lined leafy Yaffa Street. They would have terraces, no. Osman grunted. Yes, most definitely. The traitors will be expecting us to hunker down in the compound, a static enemy to be faced in a full frontal attack. Saddam continued. What they won't be expecting is a funnel in which a retaliatory attack comes from higher ground. Osman processed what Saddam was saying quickly, a consequence of heightened senses and adrenaline. Whatever window of opportunity we have is running out fast. What say, Commander? Saddam urged. Osman made the call. You, you, and you retrieve metal ladders and planks. Squad A move to set up position in the buildings to the left. Squad B set up position in the buildings to the right. I want complete coverage of the length of available terrace. Take cover behind the terrace, walls facing the street. They moved out quickly, as soon as the smaller detachment had retrieved the ladders and planks. The apartment building were empty on the inside, the residents barricaded within their homes. Saddam and Kamal followed Osman and Squad A into the first building on the left. They ascended the creaky wooden stairs rapidly and as quietly as they could manage and burst out into the terrace. The sounds of gunfire had started drawing closer to their position. Due to their low numbers, they could only afford to have two men per terrace. The rest laid down the metal ladders in the gaps between terraces over which they laid the planks and then shuffled forward. Men, Osman whispered into the walkie-talkie he was carrying. Hold fire until the vanguard reaches the barricade of the palace. Eyes only until then. Lights out. 
His breaths came in short huffs. Saddam was on a second cigarette, crouching behind the wall so that only his eyes were above the parapet and the burning light of the cigarette was hidden. And then they came. Five army jeeps carrying about 30 soldiers rolled right up Yaffa Street. Get ready, Osman whispered, more to himself than anything. They watched as the first two jeeps turned so that they presented their sides to the palace gates, and all the soldiers scrambled out of their vehicles and took cover behind them. They waited there, probably confused that they hadn't faced any gunfire yet. Osman was thrilled internally. The plan had been a good one. The soldiers were armed with high-quality assault rifles while Osman, his squads, the President and Kamal had aging AK-47S or carbines. Two of the jeeps had mounted machine guns, and the gunners were facing the gate, ready to fire. Osman took deep breaths and counted to three. On my mark in three, he whispered into the walkie-talkie. He willed himself to rise, and then, with a shout, he rose and opened fire on the arrayed soldiers below. To his side, he felt Saddam rise with a great shout and begin pummeling the sitting ducks below. Their accuracy was for crap. The darkness of night was broken up, by the bright flashes of the guns in their arms. For what felt like an eternity, but was only really a minute, they fired without receiving any reply. Then, the machine gunners pivoted their weapons and got into the act. It was thunder and lightning, a spectacle worthy of the heavens. To his right, Saddam screamed and fell, clutching his face. The cement of the outer facade of the terrace wall was chewed up, and flecks of cement flew like sawdust. The bullets whizzed part his head, and Osman instinctively fell to the ground, cupping his hands over his ears. The sound was awesome and frightening. The machine gun fire felt like it went on for eternity. Osman began screaming at some point. He wanted it to stop. He knew that his men had stopped returning fire. It was a nightmare. On and on. Cement and paint chips splattering him. Bullets narrowly missing popping his head. And then someone tugged his arm and yanked his hand away from his ear. Up. Get up. Get up. Damn you. Fight back. Let him have it. Osman could scarcely believe his eyes. The president, blood pouring down the side of his face, ear mangled beyond recognition, was standing tall despite the hail of bullets. He had a manic look in his eyes. One arm propped up his AK-47, and he fired down at the traitors below them. The other threw the walkie-talkie to him. Give it back to them, Mother Schmuckers. Get up. And then Osman was ashamed. And then he got angry. His blood boiled. Fire back, boys. Fire back on these freaking traitors. He stood up and leaned over the parapet and chose his target, ignoring the bullets whizzing past his head. He lined up his carbine and unloaded two shots at the nearest machine gunner. The first missed, but the second one seemed to hit him because the traitor slumped over his gun clutching his neck. Osman sprinted across the makeshift bridge onto the next terrace and yanked the cowering palace guards by the collar and slapped them hard on the face. Fire back. Let him have it. Send a bullet up their asshole. He stood to the side of his now upright man and again began firing into the street. The man next to him went down. There was spray of red mist hanging in the air. But Osman didn't stop. He kept shouting and firing. Then he went to the next terrace, and the next. The entire fight lasted no more than ten minutes, but it felt like an hour. The firing petered down, and Osman was still standing, leaning over the parapet. The jeeps were shot to crap, smoke emerging out of their engines. One of them that was close to the palace gate was on fire, and would probably explode. Saddam crossed the terrace, and walked up to Osman. He had lit another cigarette. Osman didn't say anything just grabbed the president's face and turned it left and right, examining it. A bullet seemed to have carved a path across his face from the end of his lips across his cheek, under his eye, and then taken out the entire top half of his left ear, cutting open a blood vessel along the way. It was a mangled mess, but Osman had seen worse. So had Saddam, probably. You got a bullet through and through, said Saddam, pointing at Osman's shoulder nonchalantly. He was right. A bullet had left a hole through his shoulder, and only now was the pain emerging. Squads converge on the street. Check for wounded. Kill any survivors, Osman said into the walkie-talkie. 
They assembled five minutes later at the head of Yaffa after executing about ten soldiers and taking their weapons, ammo, provisions, and a few walkie-talkies to try and catch what the rest of the traders were saying. Nice little fight. Kamal grinned lopsidedly when they converged. His eyes were wide. Shell shock. Osman thought to himself. A problem for another day. He heard a clicking sound next to him. Saddam was busy lighting yet another cigarette. Can I have one, sir? Osman asked. I had nearly crapped my pants when the shooting first began. My mind had gone completely to pieces. Lying on the terrace floor, with my face shot to crap, I retreated into my subconscious and let Saddam's instincts take over. I watched in stunned amusement from the recesses of Saddam's mind as he stood up despite the hail of bullets and insisted that Osman get up and fight back. Then he proceeded to stand near the terrace wall and fire below like Rambo. I allowed myself to take back some control of Saddam's subconscious once the firing had stopped. I was reluctant to take back full control, as I suspected I would shriek from the pain of having half my ear torn off or alternately puke at the sight of the bodies of the rebel soldiers, which in some cases had simply been eviscerated. On our side, we had lost three men in the firefight, but Osman insisted there was no time to mourn and we needed to carry on. He led us towards the end of Yaffa Street, which then hooked on to the Republic Bridge. We all crouched behind cover as we tried to scout the bridge in the non-existent light. I can't see anything, Kamal complained. He had gotten away without any injuries, but he looked rattled. TCH the streetlights are too dim to see till the end of the bridge. If we try and cross, and they're waiting for us, we'll be sitting ducks, Osman added. The Republic Bridge was a beam bridge with a two-lane road. It sat on pylons built into the Tigris River. There was absolutely no cover anywhere on the bridge. It was meant to traverse the east and west sides of the city rapidly, and most likely in an automobile. We could hunker down here, I pondered aloud. If we take the terraces again, we would have a strong strategic vantage point. We could, but for how long, sir? We're just twenty-odd men now. Battered. Victorious. Yes, but battered. If the rebels come across the bridge with a tank, our strategic position won't matter much. Well be effed. Osman replied, Let's swim across. Kamal interjected. We all looked at him. What? He asked self-consciously. It must be what 200 meters across Max. His Excellency, and I swim much more than that daily. And the rest of you are younger than us. It made sense to me, but I looked at Osman, who seemed to be considering the idea. I say it makes a lot of sense, I prodded. They won't be expecting the palace guard and the president to swim across the river at night to ambush them. It sounds mad when I say it aloud. We'd be useless if they spot us in the water, Osman countered. I shook my head. You said it yourself. The streetlights are worth crap. In the water, what will anyone see? Well, swim across in a line. Osman didn't waste much more time. He simply nodded, and then started laying out his orders to the men. In groupings of three, we sprinted to where the embankment turned into the bridge and slid down to the water's edge. I'm terrified of snakes. Always have been. I wasn't sure if there were venomous snakes in Iraq, but my stress levels rose sharply as we entered the warm, soupish tigress water. It didn't smell fresh at all. If I made it out of this alive and still in power, I would make sure that we cleaned up the tigress and Euphrates. To our credit, we made it across without incident. The only sound that we made was the occasional clip-clop of lapping water. We arrayed on the eastern bank of the river. I was pleased to note that my lungs were not burning. I had come a long way fitness-wise since my transmigration. Osman sent a live guard to scope Abu Nawaz road that lay above us. He scrambled back in a few minutes. Squad of seven soldiers holding surrendered policemen. Some of the policemen looked badly injured. As he reported back to us, I thought I heard the sounds of distant shouting, like hearing the crowd in a football stadium from far away, but angry and buzzing, not excited. If we go in shooting, the policemen could get caught in the crossfire. Kamal said with some concern, There's no option, Osman replied. It's us or them. Let's try and surround them first. We outnumber this squad. Maybe we surround them and then demand that they surrender. I suggested, 
Do we really want to take that risk, sir? Osman asked. I believe that if we come out shooting, then the soldiers will react to the greater threat than kill the policemen first. I'm not worried about them executing their prisoners, Captain. I'm worried about stray bullets killing unarmed men. It's your call, sir, Osman replied. We have to try and save our countrymen. They're held prisoner, clearly, because they stood up to the rebels. It would be a poor show to not try and save them. I replied firmly, hoping that what I was saying wouldn't come back and bite me. Osman simply nodded and relayed the instructions. Some of our men went back into the river and swam around the base of the bridge to head to the other side of it. We scrambled up to the Abu Nawaz Road, some ways away from the bridge. Carefully, we emerged from the embankment. My heart was beating a mile a minute as I checked left and right before sprinting across the road while keeping low. The rebels were holding the policeman prisoner near where the bridge emerged onto Abu Nawaz Road. We would approach them from four sides and demand that they surrender. We sneaked in closer and closer. I could still hear the distant shouting, but my active mind was focused on the rebel soldiers ahead. They seemed to be on half alert. Their hands were on their rifles, but not tightly held. They were pacing about their prisoners, sometimes glancing in the eastern direction of Tahrir Square. We came to a halt, and I saw Osman ahead of me grab the walkie-talkie. On three, rush in weapons live. Do not fire first. Demand their surrender. Three, two, one, go, go, go. We rushed in, weapons pointed at their soldier. I let Army Saddam's subconscious take over a bit. Put your weapons down. Put your weapons down. Down on the ground. We'll freaking shoot. Weapons down. Twenty-odd voices shouting the same instructions aggressively filters through even the most bone-headed soldier's brain. There was a tense moment as we rushed in where I felt that the moment was on a knife's edge. Either an outright crap show or a bloodless success. I held my breath as the rebels looked bewildered and wavered between raising their weapons and dropping them. The moment paused and paused. But finally, one of the rebels dropped his rifle and put his hands up in surrender. And just like that, the spell broke and the rest of the rebels surrendered as well. We rounded the surrendered soldiers up and had them on their knees, facing the river. We tied their hands with their own ropes. Some of the palace guards were a bit brutal in bringing the rebels under control. One of the rebels may have been brained by the butt of a rifle. I couldn't care less. We helped the policemen up and looked over their injuries. Mr. President, came an incredulous voice behind me. I turned around to spot Tullet Aziz, the chief of police of Baghdad, staring at me incredulously. What are you doing here, sir? He stuttered. You're injured. I lit another cigarette. Must have been my sixth. I didn't care. I'm dealing with this rebel scum, is what I'm doing, chief. What are you doing? We, he said, indicating the other policemen around, heard that some of our men had gotten into a firefight with the rebels near Tahrir Square. We were coming to aid them, but caught unawares. The bastard shot Marwan in the head. He pointed at one of the supine and unconscious policemen, who had an ugly-looking wood in the side of his head. He's still breathing somehow, Tullet said sadly. I patted him on the shoulder. First we take back the city, and then we get our people patched up. He nodded firmly. We're with you till the end, Mr. President. Osman wandered over later, as we had tallied our guns and ammo, and co-opted the uninjured policeman into our posse. Can you tell us what's the situation in the Tahrir Square direction? He asked Tullet. Tullet's eyes widened. You don't know. Osman shook his head. No what? I heard the rebels talking about it. Tullet continued. When they fired on my men, the civilians came out in droves and formed a human blockade in front of the tanks. What? I exclaimed in shock. He nodded. That's the sound you're hearing. Apparently they've crowded to rear square and are burning cars and couches in front of the soldiers to stop them. We all looked in the direction of Tahrir Square, from where a rhythmic shouting and a dull orange glow was emanating. It all started that day with a call from the chief, Tull of Disease, who informed Thomas, the captain of the Rizafa District Police Force, that they needed to be watchful for any untoward activities, and that the curfew that had been imposed earlier that week had to be seriously enforced. 
Thomas Salomon had been on edge ever since he was ordered to oversee the placement of the heavy concrete barricades strategically along the main thoroughfares of the Rizafa district, including the wide, open, and usually unmanageable Tahrir Square, where the youth of the eastern side of Baghdad congregated. He hadn't known what was happening or why the security measures were needed, but it scared him. It reminded him of a time that he thought Iraqis had put behind them, of constant fear of armed violence. The country was on the road to unity and prosperity. Only a foreign enemy would want to disrupt that he had concluded. At 7 p.m., as the sun started to fade, he had jumped into the back of a patrolling police jeep to make sure that his men were enforcing the curfew. Loud whistles, and in some cases angry, aggressive shouts were enough to shepherd even the most recalcitrant of his civilian flock. The streets emptied rapidly, and the going became much easier for the jeep when a message came across the radio. This is the Thora District Police Dispatch. All receiving units, be advised that unknown armed assailants have entered the city from the main highway off Thora. Repeat armed assailants who appear to be soldiers have entered the city and are headed westward to the center. Be ready to engage. The other police officers in the jeep, Salamoon's men, turned and stared at him in wide-eyed fear. Many of these men were boots straight out of training. Police Chief Tullet Aziz had forcefully retired most of the city's police veterans to sweep away the culture of corruption and incompetence in one fell swoop. The effect had been profound, with a sharp uptick in police efficiency and relationship with civilians. But now, in this unforeseen catastrophe, these were not the men Salamoon wanted to babysit. What do we do, Captain? Mahmoud, the young driver, asked him shakily. What to do, indeed. Salamun's heart was racing. He was experienced, but was any experience adequate for the situation? Did he go to Thora to aid the policemen there? Or did he stay within his district? He took a punt. Loop over to Tahrir. For anyone entering from east, if they plan to head to the palace or parliament, it's a straight shot from Burr said Street. Mahmoud nodded and lurched into a sharp turn, which pointed them in the direction of the square. Sir, are we going to engage them? Hamid asked in a small voice from his right. He needed to get a handle on his men. He couldn't have them fall apart in a firefight. Listen, men, we do what we do every day. Protect the city. This is our city, and we are the only ones authorized to carry firearms within it. These assailants, whomever they may be, breaking the law. We will impose the law. Am I clear? He managed to say it without stuttering, and for that he was grateful. He didn't believe a word of what he just said. He was terrified. He hadn't signed up to be a soldier. They folded into Tahrir Square only to see the telltale headlights of an approaching vehicle from the eastern Burr said street. Mahmoud quickly, quickly blocked that vehicle off. Mahmoud, to his credit, didn't waste a moment and spun the jeep around, headed straight for the oncoming vehicle. They came to a screeching halt in front of a dark jeep that bore the insignia of the Iraqi army. Adrenaline rushing. Salomon jumped out of the car and whipped his pistol out, pointing it at the unsups. This is the Baghdad police. You are in violation of statutory curfew. Step out of the vehicle with your hands behind your heads. The offending jeep's headlights were still on, and the beam of light was all-encompassing. Salomon couldn't make out anything but dark shapes in front of him. There were more lights behind the assailant's jeep. God, how many of these bastards were there? I said, step out with your hands behind your heads. Comply this instant. Working in the police had taught Salomon that false bravado worked wonders eight times out of ten. This wasn't one of those times. One of the dark figures in the jeep rose, and then moments later shouted back. This is Captain Rashid Abedin of the 14th Infantry Division. By order of Lieutenant General Faud Karim, we are here to enforce martial law in the city for an orderly transition of power. Lay down your arms and submit to our authority. What the fuck? Salomon couldn't recall who Faud Karim was, but he knew that the head of the army was Saad Hashmi. Why hadn't any orders of martial law come from the palace? And why was this Rashid here on the orders of a lieutenant general rather than the general? We have received no such orders of martial law, either from civilian authority or military high command. Until such time those orders come through, you and your men will need to submit to the Baghdad police captain. There was silence from Rashid. Salomon couldn't see anything, 
but he sensed that the tension had risen. His instincts told him that Rashid's men had their weapons trained on him. In the silence, Salamun felt that his uniform was drenched in a cold sweat. What's your name, officer? Rashid inquired in a softer voice. Captain Tomas Salamun of the Rizafa District, Baghdad Police. Again, step out with your hands behind your head. Salamun thought he saw Rashid make some hand gesture, and then the jeep's headlights dimmed. Salamun almost sighed in relief. He could see more clearly now. Rashid was a tall, thin man standing up within the jeep. There were three other men in the jeep with him, and all seemed to be armed with rifles. Salamun also saw at least two more sets of headlights behind Rashid's vehicle. Captain Salamun, Rashid began in that same placating tone. We are here to effect a change in government, to see the old tyrant who consorts with the Americans thrown out, to usher in democracy. Don't stand in the way of progress. There it was, an admission of intent. Kudita. Salamun's blood ran cold, but his heart firmed up. They talked about progress. Could they not see what had happened to the country? The hope imbuing all corners of it. Mr. Rashid, Salamun replied, Matters of state are above my pay grade. Maybe you succeed in changing the government. Maybe you don't. Maybe the laws and rules change. Maybe they don't. But today, right now, my men, and I know the law we serve and the orders we have, and I intend to see our duty done. Lay down your weapons and exit the vehicle with your hands behind your heads. Rashid clicked his tongue in irritation and shouted now, Don't be a fool, Captain. We are heavily armed soldiers, and we outnumber you and your men. We have tanks on the way. Don't be a fool. We don't want to hurt our countrymen. Step out of the way. Salamun had enough. He walked forward with purpose. Guns still held aloft. He walked straight up to the driver's side door of Rashid's jeep, reached inside and opened the door. Out, out, out. You are in violation of the Baghdad curfew and are under arrest. He grabbed the arm of the driver strongly and yanked him bodily out of the jeep. The other inhabitants of the jeep seemed to wake up finally and started reacting, hollering and raising their own weapons. Out, out. Salamun screamed, still tugging at the driver, whose torso was out of the car, but his legs were being yanked by the soldier in the front passenger seat. A sudden clap of thunder cut off the impromptu tug of war, and Salamun felt a punch to his shoulder, and then he was falling backward in a daze. Captain, he heard young Hamid scream, and then there were several loud bangs and smoke and sulfur. He felt himself being dragged by the upper arms towards a police jeep, towards safety. Cease fire. Cease fire, damn it. Rashid was screaming in the background. Was that Hamid laying there on the ground, face down? No, it couldn't be. He had been behind cover. Salomon lost sight of the soldiers as he was dragged behind the police jeep. Mahmoud was weeping from somewhere above him. Oh God, oh God, Captain, what do we do? Captain, stay with me, oh God. They shot Hamid in the head, oh hell, Captain. They shot Hamid, what? That didn't make any sense. What? Mahmoud shook him. Captain, what do we do? Please, Captain, stay with me. The fog lifted momentarily as the pain started catching up. Say, call, Salamun said weakly. Mahmoud leaned in close. What? What? Call for backup. Salamun managed to squeeze out before fading out. The captain was unconscious or dead. There was so much blood all over Mahmoud's uniform. The captain had been shot in the shoulder, but there was so much blood. And Hamid. Oh. God Hamid. The foolish boy had jumped out after he saw the captain being shot, and the damn soldiers had shot him to crap. Mahmoud had seen a part of Hamid's head blow away. It was all absolutely messed up. He could hear the soldier's leader still berating his men. But in the confusion, Mahmoud had clambered into the police jeep and radioed for backup. He was patched through to the chief himself. Chief Aziz promised to send backup and told him to hang in there. Help would be coming soon. Mahmoud sat listlessly with the captain's body in his lap. He dared not look down. His only remaining colleague, Bassam, was crouched to his right, also hyperventilating. They were dead. Mahmoud knew it. 
It was just a matter of time. Captain, Captain, came a voice from the enemy's side. Are you all right? Mahmoud didn't reply. Captain, that bastard voice again. He's dead, you mother schmucker. You killed him, you mother schmucking traitor. Mahmoud screamed. There was a few moments, silence, before the bastard spoke again. I am truly sorry to hear that, officer. It is not our intention to hurt honest, hard-working Iraqis, but the captain forced our hand. Go peddle that bullshit somewhere else, you treacherous murderer. What's your name, officer? The bastard asked. I'm not telling you shit, you goat schmucker. The bastard piped down. The minutes ticked by, but no help ever came. Mahmoud could hear the bastard having a heated discussion over the radio. Officer, I'm afraid I've run out of time to be cordial with you. There are two of you left, and a whole lot of us. I suggest you and your colleagues surrender so that we can be on our way. And you can look after your fell comrades. What do you say? The Psalm and Mahmoud looked at each other. This mother schmucker. Mahmoud grumbled under his breath as he pushed the captain off his lap and unhooked his service weapon. He cocked the gun and then peered from behind the side of the jeep and shot twice in the bastard's direction. There were shouts of alarm from the criminals, and Mahmoud cracked a grin at the psalm. Got your answer, you go schmucker? Mahmoud screamed back, you bastard Timpa toy soldier. The bastard yelled, I've had it. We're coming through in one minute. If you haven't surrendered by then, we're going to freaking blow your heads off. The psalm and Mahmoud looked at each other. Can't believe my ticket to the FA Cup is going to get wasted, Bassam said. Mahmoud chuckled. It's been an honor, brother. They clasped hands and readied their weapons for their last stand. As they were priming themselves to go over the top, they heard a rumbling, rolling sound from behind them. Mahmoud spared an incredulous glance back and saw a mass of torch-bearing, slogan, shouting humanity emerge from all corners of Tahrir Square. The Baghdadis had come to defend their city and they were pissed. Long live Baghdad. Long live Iraq. We filed into Tahrir Square, weapons held out in front of us. Our mixed bag of palace guards and police officers wasn't sure what to expect, but we forged ahead, driven by a need to punish the insurgents. What we found however shocked us. Tahrir Square was jam-packed with civilians shouting slogans and carrying makeshift torches of burning wood. In the middle of the crowd, Items of furniture had been set alight, and the crowd faced a battery of jeeps and soldiers whose faces were lit up in the orange glow of a burning vehicle. A soldier stood on the bonnet of a jeep with a loudspeaker in hand. Please, please, brothers and sisters, calm down. We're here to protect all Iraqis' futures, he pleaded. Long live Iraq. Long live Baghdad. Death to traitors. Long live Saddam. Brothers and sisters, why do you chant for a tyrant who shares a bed with the great Satan? He sells our most precious resource to them for pennies and hoards the wealth of our nation. Death to traitors. Long live Saddam. A wall of humanity separates us from the view of the treacherous soldiers, so we stopped crouching and stood straight. What now? Kamal asked loudly, trying to be heard over the volume of the crowd. I was in shock at the display of solidarity and patriotism. The night had started with despair, but the fact that ordinary Baghdadis were willing to stand in the way of armed soldiers in defense of their city gave me heart. I don't know, replied Osman frustrated. We can't start shooting, otherwise civilians will get caught in the crossfire. Damn it, they've already managed to bring the tanks up till here. I shook my head and replied slowly, doesn't matter, Foud's already lost. What do you mean, sir? Kamal asked, bewildered. There's no coup without civilian support. Not in this country. Too many vested interests. If he shoots a civilian, then he's lost. If he doesn't shoot, his men are asking to be picked off. So basically he's already in a mess. It's just a matter of time before this all comes to an end. So, should we retreat to the palace? Osman asked. I didn't blame him. It had been a hell of a night, and we'd suffered casualties. I was pretty sure Kamal was shell-shocked. No, we can't do that, I said regretfully. If the worst happens and he does attack the civilians, we have to try and prevent a massacre. But what can we do against tanks, sir? It was a difficult situation. If we took to the terraces again, we could probably kill a few soldiers seated in the jeeps, 
but a tank would just blast us out of the sky. If we stayed on the ground and were noticed, the traitors might fire at us with civilians at our back and amongst us. We take the flanks, I said, relying on Saddam's military instincts and noticing the shaded and columned walkways around the periphery of the square. These public footpaths used for window shopping during the day were unlit and covered in shadows at night. Stay in the shadows and line up parallel to where the joker with the loudspeaker is standing. If and when we get the chance, we advance quickly and either capture the forward guard or incapacitate them. They're in a bottleneck, so hopefully the tanks and soldiers behind them won't be able to make out what's going on. We moved gingerly, but in relative lockstep. I was hoping upon hope that the traders were too occupied with the angry civilians to notice us slinking around them. I breathed a sigh of relief as our team reached our position on the left flank and the other team radioed in a few moments later confirming that they were in position as well. Now it was a waiting game. The soldier with the megaphone kept demonstrating, with the crowd sounding more and more frustrated as time went on. The crowd was getting frenzied. Do you think the crowd will attack first? Kamal whispered. I freaking hope not. They'll get chewed up. I replied. Please, please, brothers and sisters, I beg you. Megaphone urged. We're only here to help you and our countrymen. Please let us through. I promise on my honor that we have the best intentions. We've already got Squit. He's good enough. We've already got Schmuck. He's good enough. The crowd chanted. Are they talking about me? I asked. I think they mean it as an endearment, sir. Kamal replied sympathetically, patting my shoulder. Megaphone was handed a radio receiver which he put to his ear, and a frantic exchange followed. He threw away the receiver and squeezed his eyes. Then he grabbed the megaphone again. All civilians must vacate to rear square within two minutes, or we will open fire, he screamed. The crowd became louder and louder, yelling defiance in the face of a coward. Damn, hell, fuck, get the teams ready, Captain, I told Osman. We need to take them now before they open fire. Everything became tense again. Battle was upon all of us again. My breathing sped up, and my heart pounded in my chest. I let Saddam's subconscious fill the recesses of my brain. My breath evened, and a strange yearning happiness filled me. Get ready, on my mark, Osman whispered curtly. We all readied our weapons. In three, two, he was cut off by a screeching sound that filled the air and shook the buildings and the ground. Everyone in the square, whether friend or enemy, paused and looked to the skies in confusion. And then two jets whooshed by over our heads. I regained my head first. Go, go, go. Take them now. I screamed and pushed and jostled to get my team back down to earth. Whether friend or foe the jets had given us an in. It was a scrambled, clumsy affair but we managed to rush forward while everyone was still staring in the direction of the jets. So it was that megaphone, and the traitor vanguard didn't notice us until our guns were inches from their faces, and we were screaming at them to drop their weapons. We continued to scream at them, as we saw, and then heard two massive explosions from the direction of the traitor's rear guard. Everyone ducked momentarily, but Osman was the quickest to recover this time. He jumped into megaphone's jeep, and clocked the traitor on his head with the butt of his rifle. The megaphone went down in a spray of blood. You, man the turret. Osman ordered one of the palace guards. Everyone, get ready to fire. Osman ordered us as our machine gunner swiveled the turret to face the traitor's clogged up forces. There were more explosions from the same direction as more jets flew overhead. The enemy soldiers broke ranks and began to run in our direction in blind panic to try and escape whatever was happening at their rear. Open fire, Osman ordered. Give it to these bastards. It was a massacre. Saddam reveled in it. I felt no sympathy for these men who'd blown up half my ear, but I felt sick looking at what a large caliber machine gun bullet can do to a human body. When the firing stopped and the smoke settled, all we could see and hear were the death throes of traitors. Cable News Network broadcast, and now, we return to our top story this week. New details are emerging about the attempted coup in the Middle Eastern country of Iraq. Newspapers around the world today feature this image, showing the country's President Saddam Hussein standing atop a jeep, wounded and bloodied, with a rifle in hand. It may seem like a Hollywood script, 
but we can confirm that the president along with his palace guard fought back street to street and halted the advance of the rebels before the Iraqi army and air force encircled and defeated the rebels. Today we learn that ordinary civilians of the capital city Baghdad faced down armed soldiers and tanks to stop the attempted overthrow and to protect their city. The actions of the Baghdadi civilians has sparked jubilation and wild celebrations through the historically disunited country. Iraq has been undergoing an economic miracle over the last five years as the country has embarked on an ambitious plan to connect the country with best-in-class infrastructure and diversify the economy into services and manufacturing. And now we head to our special correspondent Alia Farazi in Baghdad. Alia, an incredible story. Thanks, Jim. 193 minutes. That's how long this attempted coup lasted. People here don't know what to celebrate more, a swashbuckling action hero president, defiant civilians, the highest ranking general of the Iraqi army racing from Kirkuk to Baghdad overnight to relieve the city, or more generally, just the unity and progress of the country. Everyone I talk to has the same thing to say. We may be a small country, but we're a proud country and we're more than just our oil. After all that, the cause of the failed coup turned out to be extremely petty. Lieutenant General Faud Karim had been indulging in graft for the past three years, and Ahmed the Ombudsman General had picked up a few threads that would have ultimately uncovered Faud's malfeasance. Fearing what would happen, Faud had concocted a plan to take over the administration of the country, believing that his own hold over the army was strong enough to force a coup. Our information had been woefully inadequate. Faud had not been able to wrangle a force of 5,000, but just a regiment of 100 soldiers and a solitary tank squadron. Faud had taken the co-opted and confused soldiers on an ostensible training exercise, only alerting them to his plans once they were in sight of Baghdad. Even then, only about 50 soldiers decided to go along with Faud. The rest resisted. We found a site of a massacre outside the city the day after the coup. The 50 traitors had turned on their comrades and executed them. For all his tactical brilliance, Faud's plan had been utterly shambolic. It was doomed to failure. As soon as Saad Hashmi heard what was happening, he mobilized the rest of the army and air force and raced to Baghdad personally. Faud's whole plan had been to blitzkrieg through Baghdad and eliminate me before anyone could blink. To say that Iraq was jubilant and ecstatic with me was an understatement. We could hear chants of Saddam Saddam, from outside the palace gates for days. The only person who really berated me was Ion, who insisted on overseeing my recovery from my injuries personally. She was also the one who forced Kamal to take leave and take up therapy to deal with what she immediately identified as PTSD. I got calls and visitors from across the globe. Jimmy Carter joked that I was the only action hero president in the world. The image of me bloodied and holding a rifle atop an army jeep was splashed across newspapers and TV for weeks. I felt disassociated from those memories. Two palace guards and five policemen lost their lives during the coup attempt. On the other side, my ragtag group of guerrillas and the Air Force killed almost all the traitors. Foud surrendered himself, bullet wounds all over his body and his left leg hanging by a thread. The doctors managed to save his life. He would stand court-martial, as would the traitor Rashid. I was certain that they would face a shooting squad, but I made it known that I wanted a fair trial to take place. Despite all the congratulations I received from all corners, I was aggrieved. The absolute mess that was the communication with the armed forces and the lack of control I felt over the military during the coup alarmed me. It was also really bad for business. No one wants to invest in a country which might be subject to a midnight coup at any time. In fact, in the week after the coup, two Japanese firms and a Dutch one pulled out of their plans to invest in factories in the SEZ near Tigrid. In those weeks following the coup, unbeknownst to the rest of the country, Ahmed and I worked on a master plan to ensure that something like that night would never happen again. We charted out a contingency plan in the event of any such eventuality arrange for hidden turrets, and supply caches around the city. The defenses and layout of the palace would be modified to make the area a dangerous proposition for an attacker. The biggest part of the plan was to deal with possible treachery in the armed forces. Ahmed was tasked with assembling a team that would vet each and every commissioned and non-commissioned officer of the army. 
Their financial transactions, histories, psych evals, and family backgrounds would be poured over to identify the high-risk individuals who we could phase out. Lastly, we designed a framework to ensure that the war center in Baghdad always knew what each and every component of the military was up to at any given time. A task that would, of course, become simpler once computers were a thing. March 1985. How is it, Han? Martha's crackling voice filtered across the phone line. Oh, babe, it's incredible. The city's like something out of Arabian Nights. Walter Monkfish, head of IBM's government business, replied. Really? Yeah, I'd know. But they've designed the place so well. There's like archways everywhere and souks and bazaars and cafes tucked into hidden nooks and crannies. It sounds magical, Han, Martha said. Yeah, I mean, it's so well thought out. Like all, the streets are covered by this thick curtain-like fabric that's stretched across opposite buildings. So you can walk through the street in the middle of the day, and it's just a tad on the warm side, not blazing hot like you'd expect. And are you eating fine? Do they have proper food? I can't stop eating, babe. The food choices are incredible. The guys at the president's office took us out to this soccer game. Crazy atmosphere, by the way. Apparently people from all over the Arab world follow Iraqi soccer. Anyway, afterward they took us out for a meal at this new fine dining place. Babe, the lamb chomps melted in my mouth. I couldn't speak. All I did was eat. You should have brought the kids and me along, Walter. Martha complained mildly. Walter chuckled. You know, I couldn't do that, babe. It's a really important work trip. But I think the project is in the bag, so I guess there'll be more trips. We'll make a vacation out of it. Hmm. How'd they take the proposal? Oh, fantastic, babe. Walter said enthusiastically. They want the PCs fully loaded with Windows and Excel and word across all government offices in the country. It's going to be the biggest deal for Microsoft and us by country miles. Oh, Walter, that's great news. I'm so happy. This is going to make your career, Han. Oh, well, I don't know about that, he replied demurely. They chatted a bit more about the trip, and Walter dutifully asked after the children. Oh, by the way, Walter, Martha asked, did you meet the president? Yeah, we met him really briefly. Just shook hands and exchanged pleasantries. Oh, wow, she squealed. Was he really dashing? Was he like an action hero? Walter chuckled. No, honey, he just seems like a normal guy. He's about my height, slim. He was wearing a nice linen suit when he met us. Just looked normal, I guess. Except, except, well, when you're talking to him, it feels like he's analyzing every word you're saying. It's pretty weird. Like in a creepy way? No, no, not creepy at all. Just really, really intense. Well, he's got to be intense, right? I mean, whoever heard of a president battling it out on the streets with rebels? Yeah, there is that. You wouldn't think he was a fighter if you meet him, though. Was, did you see, you know? See what? Walter asked. You know his ear. Martha whispered the last part. Oh, yeah. It's hard to tell, though. They've done a really great job with the prosthetic part of it. Looks lifelike. Silicone, or something like that. Same stuff they put in boobs. Oh, Walter, shush. His wife admonished as he laughed. They chatted for another 15 minutes before Walter started feeling the day's exertions creeping up on him. All right, babe, I better call it a night. It's getting pretty late here. Okay, Han, you sleep well. Long day tomorrow. Yeah, we're catching the morning train up north to the president's home city. Place called Tigrid. They've got this massive microchip manufacturing plant, just started operations up there. State of the art. Bob was pretty excited about it. Says that ITLL supply the chips for half of the PCs and electronics of the next decade. All right, Han, good night. Talk soon. Thanks and see you later for the narco trafficker with a system. At this point, due to a lot of negative reviews, the author decided not to continue writing the story. So he gave a general timeline on how the story would end. Here it is. 1985. Walter Mondale, Jimmy Carter's VP, becomes American president instead of Ronald Reagan. The bonhomie of the J.C. era reduces. Iraqi-American relations remain pleasant, but Iraq is no more seen as critical. Walter Mondale is domestically focused and enjoys the fruits of America's economic resurgence, just the way Reagan did IRL. Without Reagan and his wife, there is no war on drugs. Although the inner-city crack epidemic still happens, 
the incarceration of black people in America doesn't reach the heights of the original timeline. Iraq narrowly misses out on qualifying for the 1986 FIFA World Cup. The nation is heartbroken but focuses on mission 1990. 1986. Shia Arabs in the Dasht e Azadegan region of southern Iran protest against discrimination, likely with an eye on the rapid economic growth of their Iraqi neighbors. The protests are quelled brutally, leading to a mass influx of refugees into the Iraqi marshlands. The Iraqi government mobilizes aid for the refugees and arranges massive tent cities. Microsoft goes the IPO route. The Iraqi sovereign wealth fund's assets almost double overnight. Iraq's GDP grows at 15% PA, sparking fears of another bout of inflation. 1987. In response to growing calls from refugee Iranian Arabs, the Iraqi government implements a unique immigration policy that provides a route to citizenship that is women-led. For families seeking citizenship or asylum, the women of the household are allowed to seek jobs for a full one year before the males of the household are allowed to join the workforce. The Iraqi Premier League signs huge TV rights deals with broadcasters in Egypt, the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, Syria and Turkey, becoming the wealthiest football league in the world. Iraq begins a massive operation to digitize official records. Baghdad University becomes the first Asian university to launch a degree in computer science. Controversy, as Saddam Hussein's only remaining son Kusai takes up New Zealand citizenship. He is said to be a documentary filmmaker. 1988. Saddam Hussein marries Ayan Ayyub in a private ceremony that sparks celebration across Iraq. The Soviet Union leaves Afghanistan. Mikhail Gorbachev's policies mark the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. Iraq strikes a deal with China and begins stockpiling rare earth materials in an undisclosed location. Manufacturing overtakes oil as Iraq's biggest export. Iran's supreme leader Khomeini is taken seriously ill. Ayatollah Montazeri becomes the de facto leader of Iran and opens back-channel talks with Iraq. 1989. Iraq qualifies for FIFA 1990. Iraqis celebrate for a week. Ayatollah Khamenei dies, and his successor Montazeri becomes the leader of Iran. Relations between Iraq and Iran improve rapidly. Refugees of southern Iraq's tent cities begin to return home. The oil deal with America comes to an end. American troops depart Iraq. Iraq declines to renew the deal for another decade. In a stunning speech at the UN General Assembly, Saddam Hussein calls the environmental disaster the biggest challenge in human history and promises to cease Iraqi oil production by 2010. He announces a special economic zone with economic incentives for clean tech ventures in western Iraq. Microsoft outsources part of its software backend operations to Iraq. Three new Iraqi microchip manufacturers begin exports from the country. Iraq reaches the quarterfinals of the FIFA World Cup, losing to Italy on penalties. Hundreds of thousands of Baghdadis line the streets as the returning team does an open-top parade through the capital to meet the president. 1991. Iraq and Iran sign peace accords as a rumored precursor to an FTA, zone spanning from Iran to the Gulf nations. Work begins on a natural gas pipeline from Iran to Iraq to support Iraq's rapidly escalating energy needs. Canadian venture firm Desert Solar sets up shop in western Iraq as the first firm to take advantage of Iraq's economic incentives for clean tech. The Democrats lose the American elections due to an anti-incumbency effect. Billionaire Ross Perot is unexpectedly elected president. 1992. The Soviet Union collapses. On Moharram Day, a suicide bomber linked to new terrorist group Al-Qaeda blows himself up at a Shia shrine in southern Iraq. The country shuts down in a national day of mourning. Protesters take to the streets to decry the terrorists. Iran, Iraq, Turkey and the Gulf Emirates announce a free trade agreement that is widely seen as benefiting new economy behemoth Iraq. The port of Basra becomes the largest port in the world by notional value of goods passing through it. Protests erupt in Erbil at the lack of connectivity of the region with the spine of Iraq railway system. President Hussein promises to rectify the situation. The English Premier League begins its inaugural tournament. The league is based on the incredibly successful Iraqi Premier League, the second richest sports league in the world in any sport. 1996. 
Iraq's GDP growth slows to 9% PA after the longest run of double-digit growth in history. A record 155,000 people are given permanent residency or asylum status in Iraq. Most of the incoming immigrants are from Iran, Syria, and Yemen. Kamal Hanajijio retires from his post as chief of staff, citing health reasons. He retires to the Kurdistan region. Iraq introduces internet to all government offices. A secretive consultative group of senior Iraqi leaders is rumored to begin working on a new constitution. National ID cards are rolled out across Iraq. The cards with RFID are proposed to be used for a range of services such as transportation. 1997. On New Year's Day, women revelers are harassed by groups of men who are later found to be recent immigrants. Some regional leaders express discontent at the government's open immigration policy. Over 400 families are deported from the country for violating the terms of their stay in relation to the attacks. 1998. Iraq begins production of domestically designed arms and ammunition. A white list of countries designated for exports is created. Iraq's national team reaches the semifinals of the FIFA World Cup and eventually finishes third. A one gigawatt solar plant comes online in western Iraq, the largest such project in the world. Iraq is lauded for its focus on environmentalism. 1999. An attempted suicide bombing in Baghdad is foiled. Iraq pressures Afghanistan to turn in the Al-Qaeda leaders hiding in its territory. 2000. Democratic nominee Al Gore becomes the new president of the United States. Iraqi President Saddam Hussein stuns the country by announcing a new constitution will come into force in 2010, turning the country into a parliamentary democracy. Legal experts laud the proposed constitution as the first modern constitution. The constitution is short and fluid, with only its essential character and constitutional remedies inviolable. Iraq introduces the concept of distributed ledgers to underpin their judicial system. All case law would be uploaded to the digital ledger, allowing the public to see the evolution of the particular case law. Mobile networks are set up in Iraq 2001. On September 11th, terrorists bring down the Twin Towers. Unconfirmed reports claim that Iraq had warned the U.S. ahead of the attacks. President Al Gore announces sanctions on Afghanistan until it produces the culprits of the attack, including Osama bin Laden. Al Gore refuses to direct a war against the Asian country. Iraq suffers a mini-recession as the dot-com bust filters through to the country's economy. The Iraqi Wealth Fund invests massively in little-known companies Amazon and Google. 2004. Al Gore is unseated as U.S. President in response to his highly unpopular stance against a war in Afghanistan. New President George W. Bush declares war within hours of his inauguration. Iraqi President Saddam Hussein begins to take a backseat in the administration of the country. Iraq finishes upgrades to its spine of a rock railway system. 15% of Iraq's energy needs are supplied by solar power, the highest in the world. Iraq sets up the al Hadika Hydroponics Facility in western Iraq, the largest of its kind in the world. 2005. George Bush condemns the axis of evil that includes Libya, North Korea, and controversially Iran. Iraqi president comes out in support of Iran at the UN General Assembly and slams America for unilateral actions. 2006. Iraq reaches the final of the FIFA World Cup, the first team from Asia to do so. They lose to Italy 1-0. 2007. The collapse of Lehman Brothers sparks a recession in Iraq. The wealth fund steps in to stimulate the economy as its U.S. T-bond assets rise manifold. 2010. The new constitution of Iraq comes into force. Saddam Hussein steps down as president. His final speech to his country draws a crowd of over a million. Prime Minister Talibani is sworn in. A statue of Saddam is erected in Baghdad's Tahrir Square alongside a larger statue commemorating the heroes of the 1980 four coup attempt. 2011. Saddam Hussein and his wife Ayan Ayub fly to Chilean Patagonia to retire from the public eye. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much and it keeps me going. Plus, it takes only one second. That said, 
Have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.